Yes, um, so for our first presentation, it is really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carl Blyce, who is, as he said, the director of the Center of Open Educational Resources and Language Learning, CORL, and you can see here in the agenda the nice logo. Uh, and he is also associate professor of French linguistics at Texas uh, 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 UT Austin. Uh, his main research interests include applied linguistics, French sociolinguistics, discourse studies, and of course, all his work with uh, OER um, through the last, I would say, decades. Mm -hmm. So his presentation today is going to focus on opening up foreign language education, the affordances OER on OEP for language learning. So please, all of you, welcome Dr. Bliss to our, to our workshop. Okay, thank you very th so much, both Joseli and Flavia. I think you've uh, gotten everybody now oriented. Um, I just gonna remind you that um, everything that we're showing you today, there is a copy of. Uh, Joseli showed you the copy of that Google Doc that, that has embedded links to everything. In addition, we are recording this Zoom. So literally everything, you uh, all the documents, videos, PowerPoint slides, Google Docs, all of that is available for you, okay? And let me remind you then, um, since it's hard to have a, d a discussion with 100 people or 85 people, however many people we have joining us at the moment, make sure that your, your microphone is off because sometimes even a little bit of noise can be distracting. There will be times uh, at, at the end of our talk that I will open it up to the floor and people can, can talk. But um, just kind of good Zoom etiquette is make sure that your, your microphone is muted. Um, okay, so let's get, let's get started. <clears throat> I need to share my screen and uh, let's see. Is that, is that sharing for you? Yes, clear. Okay. Great. Here we go. <clears throat> Center view. Play from start. Here we go. Now, um, this is a PowerPoint, but I'm going to give you, uh, a, we're going to break this up a little bit. And I'm going to run this. The first session goes until 1030. I'm not going to be talking that whole time. So you'll be have a chance to do something. Um, and then we'll take a break from 1030 to 11. And as Flavia said, you can then make sure you've downloaded everything. You can go get a, another cup of coffee, but let's just hunker down. We're going to have it a little bit more than an hour here for the, for the opening session. And I've changed the title just slightly because opening up foreign languages didn't seem to make a lot of sense to me since we're really talking about heritage Spanish in this context, in this workshop. And as you know, <clears throat> Heritage Spanish is not a foreign language, especially not here in Texas. And that makes all the difference, the shift from foreign to heritage. And one of the problems, of course, is that commercial materials, um, uh, since they're mass marketed, they're really for a foreign language student. And that may sometimes be inappropriate for a heritage Spanish student. I know I'm here, I'm preaching to the converted. You all understand the, the, the implications of that. Sometimes commercial materials actually reinforce negative stereotypes that we want to avoid with heritage Spanish students. Uh, it can reinforce um, even feelings of linguistic insecurity. If I, oh, my Spanish isn't good enough or I don't speak the right kind of Spanish. So because we can't always depend on commercial products, we have to do it ourselves. And that comes back to OER, that comes back to open education. Essentially, Open education, which is really what we're all about here at Coral, is educators helping educators to create our own, to create our own materials, to create our own methods. We're helping each other learn how to do what we do better. So I'm gonna to talk to you then more specifically today about the affordances of OER. Uh, I'll be explaining what those acronyms mean and OEP for language learning in your classrooms. <clears throat> let's, get, let's get started here. Um, so as I said, uh, our logo, I love our logo. Natalie created it years ago and I'm st I still really like it. It's focused on OER. It's in the heart of our acronym. We're the center for OER and of course language learning is what brings us all together. 
So O is open, and that means the whole point is that education is a social system, but it tends to shut down. It tends to close people out. We want to keep open. We want to keep education as open to as many people as possible. That means that we want them to have access. And there are various barriers to access, namely money, finances. <clears throat> at the <clears throat> excuse me, at the college level, tuition is going up, and it's shutting people out of access. They don't have access to uh, educational opportunities. So um, more, more specifically, Open Educational Resource, or OER, refers to, as I say here, educational material offered freely for anyone to use involving uh, the following permissions through an open license. That last two words, that open license is important. If it doesn't have, if it's free stuff on the internet, that is not necessarily an OER. It must carry an open license. And we'll be talking about those in just a minute. Um, I will draw your attention, if you look at this slide, at the bottom of the screen, there's something that says CC BY. That is an open license. In fact, everything that we're sharing with you today, and open education is really just about sharing, must have an open license that will allow you to do all of these, the, what we call the five R's. Retain, reuse, redistribute, remix, and revise. So retain, now <clears throat> let me explain what those rights are. Retain, when you, um, in, in, the, in the digital era, you can now, um, you can rent a textbook from a publishing company that's entirely digital, and at the end of the semester, it disappears. It literally goes away from, from your desktop, from your computer. But in, in uh, the world of open education, we believe that it's important for the students, once they've taken a course, to retain those materials because they may want to go back and use those. Uh, reuse simply means copy. Uh, you know, when you have a textbook, you're not supposed to make a copy uh, of that textbook. Uh, of course, uh, language teachers violate that, that, that copyright law all the time because we take we make copies of all kinds of things uh, to use in our classrooms. Redistribute just means that you make multiple copies and you pass them out. That's why it looks like a copy machine here. So you don't want to make one copy because you have multiple students. You want to make copies for all of your students. Remix, of course, means to take a little bit from this textbook and put it together with a little bit from that textbook. That's the notion of remixing are also called mashups. And finally, um, even to the granular level of revising, we're allowing some, some of these licenses will allow you to go into the, 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 the textbook. I keep using the word textbook, but it could be anything. It can be a, a lesson plan and actually change the words. So imagine if I have a photograph of my students and you want to take my lesson plan or my activity and you want to replace my photograph with your photograph, that's fine. That's called a revision. So these are called the five R's, retain, reuse, redistribute, remix, and revise. And together they form the, the, the world of copyright permissions that we're gonna negotiate in open education. So why OER? Well, I'll give you two quick questions. I've already mentioned the financial uh, problems. Uh, finances tend to close down uh, educational opportunities for people. And it has really become, I know that everybody's heard about the problem of um, the rising cost of tuition, but if you look at this first graph here, textbook prices have become a really big deal now on college campuses. Um, in the average um, four or five years to get a college degree, it's a, roughly about $5,000 that, that the, average, the average American student pays for uh, pedagogical materials. And that's especially important when we're dealing with, with people from lower income families, people who don't necessarily, who may be the first in their family to go to college, they're not expecting the high price of textbooks. And so this can be a real deal breaker. We are finding now, surveys are showing that people are not going to college because of the high price of tuition and now textbooks. Okay, the, um, and, and I might add in, in secondary level, it's even worse because uh, 10 years ago, when the Great Recession hit in 2008, uh, uh, Texas Education Agency and many of the state agencies, the educational agencies, 
they slashed budgets for textbooks. And guess what? That budget has not come back in the intervening 10 years. So what we have now are, uh, we, have, we have Spanish teachers across the country calling us uh, up at, here at, at Coral and saying, I don't have textbooks. What am I supposed to do? So it truly is a, a crisis. The pedagogical reasons I already alluded to at the very beginning, textbooks are old and they're out of date. Everybody loves to complain about their old fashioned textbooks um, that have a president from 10 years ago, or they're citing a, a television show that no longer exists, those kinds of things. Um, but more importantly for the context of heritage Spanish, it's a particular context. And since uh, commercial publishers have to go after the mass market, they create, um, they create generic materials. Now, I don't wanna bash publishers. They do a good job at what they can do. Um, but what we're trying to do is, is adapt materials to our, the specific needs of our classroom. So I'm sure that you, you know more than I do about the pedagogical reasons why you need to have particular materials for the particular setting of Heritage Spanish. So let me try to play this really short um, kind of public service announcement that we created at Coral that explains the concept of OER. Traditional language textbooks are limiting. With no way to customize them, teachers can feel stuck. We're here to tell you about open educational resources. An OER is any material shared by its creator that has a Creative Commons or other open license and is available at low to no cost. While traditional textbooks have a copyright, preventing you from making copies or modifications, OERs allow you to remix, revise, and reuse materials, creatively adapting your resources and sharing them with language teachers and classrooms all over the world. Come explore this new pedagogical landscape and open up your resources and your classroom. Okay, so I think that you now kind of understand the concept of OER. It's anything that you can use for learning or teaching, but that it must have a Creative Commons license. It must have an open license. Because if it has a copyright, the, the C in the circle, that shuts it down. It does not allow sharing. So what we're trying to do today is promote sharing between, amongst ourselves. So copyright is actually a plural term, copyrights, because it gives rights to publishers and authors, and a couple rights, maybe one right to the user. It's, as I mentioned, the right to copy, the right to distribute the copies, the right to make changes, or what we call derivatives in copyright law, and of course, even the right to sell those derivatives. Those are all rights that are usually belong to the publisher or the author. So the user, well, all you can do is simply use your, your textbook and that's it, all right? You're not allowed to do any of the other things that would be a violation of copyright. But we're gonna change that. And we're gonna, uh, this, is, this slide introduces you to the wonderful world of open licenses. And I want you to become a little bit more familiar with that. Um, and it's really uh, the notion of creative commons refers to then basically culture. We create things to be shared in a culture in a, in a free way. Language belongs to all of us. The Spanish language is not copyrighted. It is part of the creative commons. We can create new words and new expressions, new text, and we can share it with other members of the commons. Uh, but also Creative Commons is an actual organization that exists. Um, they are copyright lawyers and they are trying to, to come up with a, an alternative to the uh, exi existing copyright laws. And they've come up with this easy system. If we look at the, the right side of the slide, you see the icons. Attribution, non-commercial, share alike, and no derivatives. Let me explain these four icons and so after that, you'll be able to interpret any open license and you're gonna come across some real quickly. Okay, so attribution means simply saying thank you. It says somebody has created this and I'm gonna point back to, if I use their materials, I'm gonna say, I, I'm going to acknowledge, uh, for example, Joseli and Delia uh, will be talking to you later about the materials that they've developed here at the University of Texas at Austin well, it's fine, go ahead and use their materials, but please 
point back to them and say, I attribute the original to Joseli and Delia. That's only good practice, right? That's just being a good educator. We are sharing our materials, but we also expect then people to say, thank you. That's attribution. Non-commercial, that's pretty obvious. Um, sometimes a license will say, you can only use this in for nonprofit uh, reasons. And so um, we, I don't want you to make any kind of uh, commercial transaction from it. No derivatives, the equal sign will say, you can't change it. It's how you start with it. It's got to be how you end with it. It's got to be the same. So no derivatives are allowed. Remember some, like uh, in, the, in that little video, you were able to see people switching things out and moving text around and editing. No, 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 no. That's, that means making a derivative or change. And finally, sharing alike, um, the, the, the recycling kind of image here. I prefer to, I think it's a bit of a misnomer. It really just means uh, license alike. You have to adopt the same license. So if, I'm, if I find a piece of uh, media and it has this license, I have to adopt their license. Okay, so let, let me, let's take a look at, at, at how these icons are put together here on this graph. So you see on the right, the C in the circle is, is um, what we understand as traditional copyright, which is not very open because it says all rights reserved for the author or the publisher. We want to share as teachers, we want to share the rights with other teachers and with students. So over here in the far left, the most open kind of content of all is called public domain. Um, in fact, we don't even know necessarily who created it. It's in the public domain. We can use this any way we want to. There may not be any attribution because, again, we don't know who to say thank you to. Um, the next most open license is CC BY, and that simply says, you can use this any way you want to, just give attribution to the originators. The next one, CC by SA, is you. I have to adopt this particular license. I say thank you to, let's say, Joseli and Delia. I'm using their materials. I may, I may be using their syllabus for my, my Spanish heritage course, um, but I need to say, I need to, to put their names on the syllabus that I'm using. Uh, CC by NC, I must give attribution and I can't, I can't sell this. I can't make any money from it. No non-commercial. Uh, CC by NCSA, I've got to sh adopt this license on my materials, can't make a profit and I have to give attribution. CC by ND, I can't change it. Okay, I'm not, so if I have this license, if I come across this license, I can only use the content as is. I'm not allowed to, to, to make any kind of derivation. And finally, the most closed open license is I have to give attribution. By the way, attribution is on all of these because that's kind of the sine qua non. We are not here to plagiarize. No, 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 no. We are here to give attribution to everybody to say thank you. So that's found on every single license not non-commercial, non-derivatives. Okay, that's it. You can now read licenses. Okay, you'll get more practice at that. So C in the circle means all rights reserved. Basically the whole point of open educational resources is, is to negotiate those rights with end users. So remember that open in this context means that you're free to use them according to their the permissions. That's why you need to pay attention to the copyrights to know what kind of permission you're being given. So what kind of, what are OER? Basically anything you use for teaching and learning, which covers a huge variety of materials. Here's an activity created for heritage learners that's in our database for our, our Heritage Spanish uh, project. And remember, I said at the beginning, please go and take a look at our website. We've got lots of content that people are sharing for you to use. But this is simply a, a Google Doc, and it's only one page. It, get, it outlines an activity to do with a link, and then it has a CC license on it, which is a CC BY license. So it can be very small, one activity that two teachers create. Um, this was, Maybell was a graduate student at, at Texas A&M and she attended one of our workshops at Coral. She created this really cool activity that was actually about 10 pages long and had lots of different media. So it was much more involved. It was part of a project that we call the foreign languages and the literary in the everyday. 
Um, and so she created that and she put a CC license on it. It's available in this archive, the flight.org project. So uh, a, a, a lesson, let's say. A syllabus, I've already alluded to that. Here is a, a syllabus shared to you by the, our own Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Um, and it carries this license. So you have to pay attention to that and you, it gives you permission to use the license according to these restrictions here. Um, linguization, okay, this is a, this is a, a, a Portuguese podcast. Uh, Orlando Kelm is a very prolific uh, OER producer and in both in Spanish and in, um, in, in Portuguese. So it can be a, a, an audio file, it can be a podcast. It can be much larger. Here is an example of a textbook that we've published. Um, these two instructors are uh, uh, Betsy Arnold and Rose Potter, taught for many years in uh, public schools and in, um, in the AP Spanish course. And so these are materials that we've developed in a, a full textbook. Videos, if you don't know about the Spin Text Project, please go and visit that. We have hundreds of videos from Spanish speakers here in Texas uh, with, with the ARC, with uh, transcripts. You can download all of this content and use it. Uh, so you can download all of these videos to your laptop, so forth. Okay, so anything, it can be basically anything you use, including, as I mentioned, a PowerPoint. So notice every single one of these slides, I'm giving you permission to use it as you wish, just give us attribution. Okay, that's that little icon. All right. So let's take a look at some of this content. Let's find some of this content. And by the way, there is a ton of open content on the internet. Photos, videos, images, text. It is quite amazing. The problem is that people don't know how to find it. They don't know how to find the good stuff. There's a lot of stuff on the internet. So let me just show you two search engines. Um, the first one, of course, is Google. Most people use Google. But Google has a, a button, uh, um, you can do an advanced search with Google. Instead of just typing in uh, uh, a keyword and then searching the internet, you might want to do, you might want to filter your results for only open content, right? Only, only pieces of content that carry an open license, an OER. And so you'll notice at that when you click on <clears throat> the advanced search button, you get something that looks like this. And it works uh, very much like at all search engines you're familiar with. You want to type in a, an exact word or phrase here. You can sort it by the language. But in, importantly, at the very bottom, you want to sort by usage rights. And it will give you all of those separate CC licenses. Okay, so here I've selected free to use or share even commercially. So I'm looking up the word graffiti. I want perhaps texts or images that deal with graffiti, and I want them to be completely open for me to use. Okay, and here's what we're gonna do. <clears throat> um, I want you, th this is something, this is worth the price of admission for this workshop, that you learn this one page, it's called CC Search. CC, of course, for Creative Commons. And you'll notice that it has a lot of these different fields. These are all, these are different search engines that search the internet for, for specific kinds of content. So here Flickr is a huge repository of images, primarily photographs. Jamindo is for music, so different audio files. YouTube, as you know, is the largest repository for video content. But what we've done is we're, we've selected, to, um, under here we're filtering it according to the CC license, according to, so we want to use only, we, we want to search these repositories for open content, okay? So let me um, give you a task to do. I'm gonna take a break here. And this is, everybody has their laptops open. And what I want you to do then is go to the CC search engine. Here is the URL. So let me show you how this works. <clears throat> I'll go back to it. So here I, I'm now on the internet. And I want you to conduct your own CC search. I want you to do, uh, I'll give you about six or seven minutes to play with this. So let's do, um, you are going to do a unit and the whole point of using content is to make it as absolutely as timely and relevant as possible. So you wanna talk about uh, race relations in 
countries all over the world because, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement has gone international. Um, and so there's my keyword. And if I want to look for images, click on this. And now it's going to search for open content on Flickr. Hi, Carl. It looks like you might have to change uh, your sharing because now we still see the slide. Okay. Okay. I think maybe if you stop sharing and then start sharing again. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, let me try this. So thank you for that. You couldn't see what I was. Okay, there we go. Is that good? Yes. That, good. Yeah, okay. So as I, I was just showing you, let me back up. So I typed in Black Matters in the CC search. I chose Flickr and I'm gonna conduct then an open search. And I have all of these images, and they're gonna be thousands of them, are all open for you to use as educators any way you want to, okay? So let me give you, um, remember that what I'd like you to do is go here, type in oldsearch.creativecommons.org, and play with a couple of these different search engines. You're probably all familiar with Google, but there are more search engines here. Um, and it's your one-stop shopping. I will give you, it's, let's see, we are at 942. So let me give you about five minutes to take a look around. All right, on your mark, get set, search. Okay, so we've talked about the CC licenses <clears throat> and the different kinds of, of OER. And I just introduced you to one very powerful search uh, webpage it's called CC Search. And let's keep on going. Now, um, you may be thinking, well, I don't want to just search for media. I want to search for a ready-made OER, some, so, like um, a textbook. You, you talked about that, or lesson plans, something along those lines that have been created by other teachers for me. And so you're right. The, the place to start, I, I would, um, before you start to create your own materials, you need to kind of consume some other materials. And there are these things called repositories that are probably better for, uh, for, the, for somebody who's new to o OER or open education. So um, a place like Merlot or OER Commons, or even as I mentioned, Coral is one of 16 language resource centers. And I'm looking at the time, so I'm only going to show you one OER uh, repository and that's Merlot. You can even visit Coral. Coral, you can consider then a repository because we simply have lots of ready-made OER and you can search that according to language. So uh, you can choose to look at only Spanish materials on the OER website. But Merlot is a large repository and I think it, it shows you, um, I think, well, what you can do with it. So now you should be able to see the Merlot. I clicked on the link here, which is embedded in my PowerPoint. And if you want to browse this site, and by the way, this stands for kind of a multimedia educational resources. So it's in all different kinds of fields. So you want to browse, uh, let's see, uh, goodness, where is this? Learning exercises, bookmark, peer review. Let's go, let's start with materials. Uh, and you want to filter it then according to your discipline. Carl, again, I mean, we can see your uh, actual screen. We're seeing the PowerPoint. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Thank you. All right. Let me go back. Sorry for these technical difficulties, folks. All right. Now, can you see? Yes, yes, it's there. Okay, so thank you, Flavia. Um, so what I did was, I'll just back up here. I went to Merlot and I, you're gonna have to dig down, some of these repositories are huge. So I'm browsing it according to, let's say materials. And then it loads for me and I need to look at by discipline and of course, uh, language learning will be in the humanities. 
And then American studies, Chicana, Latina studies, Jewish studies, what am I looking for? Ah, world languages. Notice that there are over, there are over 3,000 OER here. So there's a lot of content. Click on the, and now we're gonna filter according to the language. And we finally see that Spanish has 485. Uh, and it's always updated. The great thing about, about this, ah, look at this. The first thing that pops up, Spanish proficiency exercises by our own Orlando Kelm. Um, the great thing about this is that uh, it has an editorial staff that curates the OER so that you can um, have some kind of assurance of the quality. One of the problems about just going to search engines is you find all kinds of stuff, but it's not the good stuff. Uh, so the great thing about this is that you can go through and it will find um, materials that are, have been vetted by an editorial staff and they even have then different reviews, okay? So let me give you then just a minute to go back. I'm gonna do the same thing. We're, we're gonna stay with, with Merlot. Um, and let me take you to the top OE. Uh, the, the URL here is merlot.org. Type that in and take a look at their Spanish materials. Remember, I went to, the, to browse and I clicked on materials and then I loaded and then it went to humanities. I clicked on humanities and then it took a minute to load. I chose world languages. I kept drilling down and then finally I chose Spanish. And then it's gonna give you lots of various, so I have 400 uh, OER to look at. Again, we're just familiarizing you with a repository. So take five minutes and look around to find um, to find a, a, an OER there. Okay, go. Okay, I think uh, I know that just, <clears throat> that's not enough time to look through all 485 or whatever uh, OER here, but again, it's just to get you a little bit acquainted with the interface of one repository, which represents then many different kinds of repositories. So <clears throat> when you wanna, <clears throat> excuse me, when you wanna find more OER and find more OER repositories, Simply go to Google and type in OER repositories and you'll be surprised by how many different kinds of repositories there are out there. Um, some of them are better for STEM, right, for science and technology than they are for world languages or humanities. You will be able to find that. I'm, I'm showing you Merlot because that's a really good one. Um, NFLRC.org is also a really good one. Let me go through some of these. Uh, I mentioned uh, Coral, of course, as our website can be considered a repository. We have lots of different Spanish materials or, or Spanish OER um, and they're highly modular so you can mix and match them. Um, the Heritage Spanish site of course is growing as people are contributing to it. We have something called Spa uh, Espanol Abierto which has multiple OERs. I wanna bring to people's attention a new first year program called Trajectos. Um, by Gabriela Zapata from Texas A&M. It's entirely online and now in our beta form. So you can start, you can use it right away. Um, and again, because it carries an OER license, you are free to go in and change it in any way you want to. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting site. She even has uh, examples of how you can adapt the materials to your own uh, classroom. There is a section called El Mundo Tejano because of course she's teaching Spanish here in Texas. But of course she tells people, well, look, if you're teaching in, in Spanish in California, here's how you can adapt this section to the Californian context and so forth. So, okay, um, that is then the wonderful world of, that's called Trajectos by Gabriela. That's our latest uh, OER in Spanish. Um, a really great uh, repository is called Open Textbook Library. And again, you don't have to remember the URL, just type in OER textbook uh, library, Open Textbook Library, excuse me. Uh, and this is out of the University of Minnesota, and these are entire textbooks. There are several textbooks uh, that are available in Spanish. Trajectos is not yet reviewed because it's just brand new and it still is, is going through uh, final kind of editorial changes. So, but that will, hopefully that will be reviewed and available through this repository soon. 
we have many of our other textbooks that are available here. Um, okay, so let's say we're, we're gonna move on. We've already done the task of looking at Merlot and I'm gonna wrap things up here so we can get to your questions. So the benefits for OER uh, through the words of our own open educators. And um, this is Megan who is a curriculum designer at a public school system outside of St. Louis called Parkway School District. And they contacted us a couple years ago. This is happening all over the United States because as I mentioned in the beginning, um, textbooks are a real problem because people simply don't have them anymore. They're not available or they're not enough to go around. So this was a crisis in the Parkway School District and Megan got in touch with us and said, I'd like to go open. I'd like to adopt OER, but where are they and how do I do it? And so they started creating their own. Um, they created a, a, a multi-year project with a, a team of uh, their own teachers from the district. And of course, this is a huge undertaking, but I told them, you don't have to do it all by yourself. That's the whole point of sharing. That's the whole point of OER is that we help each other out. And um, yeah, so uh, she says here that we've coupled OER with 90% target language use. And that was really the driving force there. They, they wanted to create materials that would keep the students in the target language. Um, Ignacio was a graduate student in, in a program in, in anthropology, and now he's finished and he's a professor at the University of Kansas. And he works, uh, works on the Quiche language, so an indigenous language in, uh, in spoken in Guatemala. And um, what he was amazed by was that, um, was how once you create materials or create something and then give it to the world, so many people start to find out about it and it creates word of mouth. And he wrote this, this is actually a little blurb he wrote that, that they were amazed when they finished the Quiche course. Again, this is a, a less commonly taught language. It's an indigenous language spoken by about a million people in, in Guatemala. Um, and within a year, they had over 75,000 view, uh, uh, views. So it has been adopted now by Mexican universities that are using it as their primary text to teach Quiche. Um, this is from a, a, a Chinese uh, instructor uh, teaching, I believe in, in kindergarten or elementary school level. And she created a lesson um, but for her, it was really about being a member of a community of other teachers who were sharing their ideas. So by creating the materials and sharing the process with other people, she got new ideas uh, as being a member of, of a kind of a collaborative team. And finally, I say this again and again and again, it really has reduced the cost for students. Um, at the University of Texas, I'm in the French department, we've saved our students now more than $3 million. Uh, and that's a lot of money. If we think about it in our first year program, we've, we've created our own materials. And if you think about um, how a textbook can be about $200 per person, that's a, over time, that's a huge savings. Uh, this is a really cool idea. I wanted to add this slide here, this notion of you can create materials with your students. In other words, involve the students in the creation of the materials themselves, because sometimes if we're trying to create student-centered materials, why not have them be co-authors with us? This was a project by a professor at uh, University of Oklahoma. Of course, it's an upper level uh, li a Spanish literature class, but she was teaching them about anthologies uh, as a genre, and she gave them various texts uh, she taught them how to write then um, interpretations of the text and to create their own uh, anthology. And then they published it. They went through the, the actual steps of, of editing it with native speakers and then finally publishing it. So yeah, the idea here is to create materials with your students. So going open, this is the whole point, if focusing now on you. I want you to, to think about open education. It's not just as these objects out there, but as practices. So OER now, you understand, means any object. It's an open educational resource for you to use in your teaching. But it's also about open educational practices. So please, share what you produce. Think about sharing what you produce. 
Think about adapting these OERs to your classroom. And that brings in the whole notion of collaborating and mentoring. You may know something that somebody else doesn't know. Share that information with them because it's about sharing knowledge. Innovating, experimenting, researching, empowering, all of these are open educational practices. Showing gratitude, I said. Um, when somebody creates a syllabus and they share it with you, that's a act of intellectual, uh, I mean, I'm so excited when I get something from somebody who has done so much of the work for me. So make sure that you uh, point back to them and give them attribution. Use repositories. And I might even say that um, we can talk about OER as a value system, being open to other people, being more open-minded, listening to others, and always thinking about ways to include people who are shutting or who are being shut out of a system. Okay. So um, I've been uh, thinking a lot about the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, thinking about uh, when we had discussions at, at Coral about how we can change our own practices as an institution and include then the voices of people who have been shut out. So in particular, African-American students who may not be taking our courses and the, who should be taking our courses, but maybe our materials don't speak to them. So I think that there is a lot of resonance to what I'm trying to say about the notion of openness and the current events today. So let's all kind of think about how we, I mean, first of all, as heritage uh, Spanish speakers, you're thinking, or teachers, you're thinking about how to include people who have been shut out of the Spanish speaking world in various ways. But let's keep then expanding that notion of inclusivity through open educational practices. So what's next? I want you to share ideas throughout this workshop with your colleagues, join some kind of communities. There are various communities out there that are gonna help you become open educators. Put a CC license on, on something that you create. It's easy, go to creativecommons.org and they, will, they, they show you how to do it. Use repositories and then include your students in creation of materials or some ideas. And finally, this, oh, this has been a, a, an infomercial for an OER course that we've developed at Coral. Click on, uh, all of this is available to you if you wanna find out more. It, it is an entire course which goes much more in depth than I'm able to do in an hour here. Okay, thank you so much. And now um, I'm gonna ask Flavia to help me out. I know she's been looking at, um, at the, the chat room. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a little bit of then about uh, your your questions and the sure. things that you posted. So, Carl, thank you for your presentation. It was great as always, and I think that I mean the course that is available will be really useful for everybody here. Some of us are more familiar with uh, OER and the use of the licenses. Some people are new to it, but I think that is a good reminder for for all of us. So, Gabrielle was saying that in the Merlot site. Uh, Mi Vida Loca, which is a, a program, a video program, is not available. What happens when you're interested in a material that it seems to be OER or it seems to be available, then when you try to get it, it's not. Carl, you should stop sharing your screen before you keep going. Okay, thank you. Got it, yes. As I'm cleaning up my desktop here, yeah. Um, okay, so that's a great question. And I think the way I'd like to, first of all, these repositories, even though I said that they have an editorial staff, you're going to have to get used to, you're going to have to become flexible. When I say be open, that means also be flexible because everything that's digital, the, the, the wonderful thing about being digital is that it's dynamic, but the terrible thing about it being digital is that it's dynamic because things change and um, sometimes you have an OER and the links sometimes don't necessarily work. That is just a mind shift that you're gonna to have to get used to. So even though many of the materials then will be the, the, the operating perfectly or functioning perfectly, they'll, they'll, there will be some bumpiness. Uh, there will be some materials that are a little bit outdated, or you might even find that some of the materials that, are, that say that they are actually open are not particularly open. So you still need to pay attention to the copyright license. So I don't know, maybe the local, I mean, there's so many different OER coming out, I can't keep track of all of them. So the main point is buyer beware, do your homework, mm -hmm. look at the, um, go through and take from the repository what you can. 
um, for like other people, the reviews, for example, but please pay attention to the copyright. Fantastic. And then April asked two different questions. The first one, I think that I can answer it, it regards our own presentation in this workshop. Uh, part of our, I mean, belonging to the CORAL uh, model of work involves that everything that we produce and share with you through these, these days is going to be uh, CC. It will be uh, community comments, it will be shared, and you are able to use it with different licenses. You have to check in each particular presentation. But yes, we're sharing all the content, all the materials, and the video recordings that we're doing now will be edited and posted later on. And then the other question, I think that this is an exciting one because it feels like, I mean, people are starting to feel, I want to do this. I want to start sharing and using uh, Creative Commons. Is um, how do you really, I mean, start? What will be best practice if you are interested in, okay, I want to participate, I want to collaborate, requisites, I mean, some kind of training. How do yeah. you Okay, what a great question. Uh, because that's really the focus of this workshop is that people start to say, ah, this is a collaborative effort, so how can I join in? As I said at the beginning, if commercial publishing companies can't do everything for the Spanish, uh, for the heritage Spanish speaking world, that's okay. We can fill the gap. And that's exactly what it's about. Uh, first of all, I would say you're doing it already. Many people are, look, everybody creates. That's the notion of the creative commons. It's just that not everybody shares it back with, the, with everybody. And that's the step that I think that's the missing link here. So people already create syllabi, they create activities, they create lesson plans, you're doing it all, right? And I can assure you that um, that content that you're creating, that creative content that you are, are, are creating is valuable to other people. One of the problems is that number one, people don't necessarily see this as worthy of sharing to other people. I can assure you it is. I, when I, I taught a course last semester um, and I, it was a, a new area, it was a, it was a, the notion was on multimodalities. I contacted my colleagues and said, has anybody ever taught this course? Do you have a syllabus you can share? It was incredibly helpful because then they sent me reading lists and syllabi and I was so much farther ahead than if I had done everything on my own. I created a syllabus and a syllabus, everybody can do that. And I had then uh, a credits in my syllabus and I pointed back to the people that had shared their syllabi. So then what did I do? I created a syllabus with a CC license on it. Mm -hmm. So essentially what we're trying to do is create an infrastructure for sharing. That's really it. Um, so what I would say is, you're already creating content right now. Think about how you can then take a CC license and remember you to go to creativecommons.org. There, there is an entire webpage that shows you how to find the license and put that license on your document. And then since we've created this archive, which is called now TEX, the Texas Coalition for Heritage Spanish, there's a place for you to upload that and you can share it with everybody now, all the, all the participants of this workshop. So that's the place where you should start. Start with what you're already doing. You don't have to get grandiose, I'm gonna write a textbook. No, 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 start small and go through the steps of learning about the, the license, how to put a license on your, your, your syllabus or your activity and share it with the group, okay? I, I want to say one other thing too. Once you put the license and once you share it, you put it in a place, an archive like this, a repository where other people can have access to it. Make sure you put your, um, your address, your, your e email, because people will contact you. And that's the other thing. It's not just the object, it's the interactions that you have with your colleagues around the object, because they're going to want to ask you questions. And then they will then be in contact with you and say, Here's what I did with your, your materials. I adapted it in this way. And then ideas just keep on going and going and going. Uh, and Joseli just shared our link 
So you can start thinking about sharing. You have the rest of the summer to maybe revise a lesson plan, an activity, uh, a collaboration that you did with your students. And by the end of summer, you can come back and upload it and we can all uh, share it. Yeah, I, oh, I want to challenge everybody as you're thinking, uh, listening to all these presentations, have in the back of your mind, what could I actually share with the rest of these people? Right. So I'm glad I kind of started that off. So that's now that that's in your mindset as you're listening to everybody. Uh, well, I have another question. I think we have a couple of minutes to, to complete um, the Q&A. Um, basically, a page is asking what happened when it just find a website or a repository that says it was last modified in 2020 or 2019, but the actual material says, for instance, it was created in 2003. It yeah. means that, I mean, the material is just old or how do you measure that? Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, that's no different than what you might find in commercial materials. What they often do, well, they have multiple editions but sometimes they don't change everything. <laughs> they all they'll, they'll change 10% of it to make it look like they changed it profoundly, but actually it's a superficial change. But um, that's a good point. Uh, you will, when you adopt like a large OER, like a textbook, you don't necessarily find out those issues until after teaching it. Everybody knows that when you go, you adopt a textbook that looks pretty good because you looked at the first three or four chapters but the last couple chapters don't look so great. So that's really hard um, to, to, to figure out on the first pass. Um, what I would say is to contact other people. The great, uh, the open textbook library, for example, because the stakes are high when you're adopting a textbook, you need to do, uh, you need to vet that. And they have, one, one of the great things about this is um, in our profession, we have uh, we have journals where you can read about if you're gonna if you're a, a a language program director and you want to adopt a textbook for your what do you do well you might go to like Hispania and you might read a review of that textbook um, but the Open Textbook Library they have many people who have used that one OER and they will get and they're incredibly lengthy the reviews are really lengthy. Um, so, you know, imagine all these people who've gone to that restaurant and those, those Yelp reviews. People can really tell you an awful lot about uh, the, the intricacies of the, of the textbook. And the, the reason I like some of these repositories, and you're going to have to find the ones that you like, sometimes they have templates where they have um, criteria that they have to meet. So the idea that, oh, you know, OER is anything goes, no, that's not true. Actually, some of them are very rigorously vetted, but it depends entirely on the, uh, on the repository. That's why I, I'm thinking that the open textbook library is really setting a standard. Uh, if you find a textbook, you might have 20 professors or instructors around the country that write lengthy reviews of, of those materials. So as always, it's buyer beware you have to do your own homework. Okay, it makes sense. And finally, I have, I think, the last question from Gabriela. Um, thinking about what happens when you had your license as a Creative Commons, but that license is not respected. And I'm thinking that maybe you uh, selected no for sale, no for, I mean, commercial purposes, and then you find out that somebody is selling that material. Yeah. So I said, I alluded to open education as a value system. Well, guess what? Not everybody shares your values. And it is troubling to people that, um, that this is a possibility. Um, let me say that this is a probability. This is likely to happen. So that's the downside. And I don't want people to be so afraid of the downside that they don't see the upside because they're incredible advantages. So I will only talk about it from my own personal perspective. What I find is that for me, I started out being somewhat open and over time I've become more and more and more open. And in fact, early on when we created a French textbook, an entire textbook, within a year we came across a site that was using all of our content, charging people for it, 
and not giving us any attribution at all. In fact, what they were doing was just plagiarism, but they were even going further than that, then they were actually profiting off of our materials and never telling anybody that these materials existed for free at the University of Texas. So what did we do? We contacted them, we found out how to contact them, and we, we sent them a threatening email, <laughs> basically, uh, which threatened kind of legal action and by the way, uh, Creative Commons, you can go to their website and they, because they're lawyers, right? They have templates for this because this is part of the game. Um, so that's a pretty worst case scenario, but the upside of that, so I wanna say, yes, this happens. I recognize that, but it's an infinitesimal kind of, it's so small that I, and I, I, I don't want that to color my opinion about most of my colleagues because most people really wanna play the game of sharing with me. Um, and once we, sh we show them how to do it with this infrastructure, they're happy to point back to us and give us credit for it. So yes, it has happened, but it has not been a huge problem. And when the problems do arise, we have, we have to told people, uh-uh-uh, that's not allowed, that's not right. And I will also say that some people aren't quite aware of how to play the game yet. So they're not aware that they've taken something and they, they should actually, they're not respecting our CC license. So, um, you know, I, I think what we need to do is just keep on educating people. And through this, I have become, and, and I, it's not just myself, I've watched other people who've become open educators in this way. And they realize that, if you open up, it comes back to you in a way that you just can't anticipate. It's the kind of all the unintended consequences of, of idea creation. Your ideas will spark ideas that you had never thought about. So the more open, I think, the better. Carl, thank you so much. Tantas gracias. Ah, Everybody, I mean, we can unmute ourselves and maybe clap. <laughs> so uh, our next session we have today, we're going to hear from Alana Kubeska, who is from the Klein Independent School District. And Alana started teaching about 22 years ago. She graduated from Texas A&M uh, with degrees in interdisciplinary studies and Spanish. And she spent the majority of her years in education teaching upper elementary bilingual students in California and in Texas. More recently, she's made the move to teach Spanish to English speakers, and she's continuing her work with heritage and native speakers in middle and high school. She started the Spanish for Spanish Speakers program in her school, and she's really enjoyed establishing and refining the program. So today, Alana is going to speak to us about small group literacy instruction in the native and heritage language classroom. So thank you, Alana. Thank you. Um, good morning. I want to make sure that I, first of all, um, you know, thank everyone at Coral for allowing me to participate this year. I'm, I'm really excited to get to share some things with you. Um, I may have kind of a different perspective than um, some of the other presenters as I am in the um, K-12 schools at this point as well. But I'm excited to do that. And um, I really have actually used some of the things that Coral has put out on their website and uh, really enjoyed them, which is how I kind of got involved with Coral to begin with, was using some of their things. But I want to talk kind of about um, two different situations that uh, we see a lot in K-12 education. And that's, um, you know, heritage, lingu heritage learners, I'm sorry, who are in the regular, um, classroom, the regular world language classroom, because we have uh, a lot of those, and then also um, heritage learner and native speaker classrooms. Not everybody has the, I guess, um, ability to have that in their school. So I'm going to share my screen and hope that I do this correctly. All right. So while you it is that looking okay everyone oh, you can see it we're going to try to get on this near pod awesome thank you so um if you'll get on to this near pod it shows you at the top how to get there you join at near join.nearpod.com or if you have a, a different device there is an app for it 
and you'll just type in this code to be able to join us. And I will be sharing it on my screen as well. Just to make sure I did this correctly, you're only seeing that one part, right? The, this one screen? Just thumbs up, yeah? Okay. Yes, you, you got it right. Okay, good. I never know for sure I'm getting the right, sharing the right part. Okay, so while, I'm, while you all are kind of getting onto that and joining, um, today I want to talk to you, um, you know, a little bit about small group literacy instruction and, um, you know, like I said, I'm going to be in a, a sort of a different context um, than some of the rest of you, but um, I have spent time in a dual language classroom, in a bilingual classroom, um, and in high school, I was also an, an adjunct for ESL, um, so kind of teaching the reverse, but still language acquisition, and um, now I'm in middle school. And um, you may find a lot of the things that I have are really colorful because I found that it really does kind of hold attention and um, I created some of those things in Canva and I will be giving you the access to those templates if it's something that you think you could use or modify for your um, purposes. All right, so hopefully everyone has been able to get in. There will also be in the top part of the screen, the top left, the code to get in. So if you're not exactly there with us, it is okay. Um, you'll be able to um, follow along up here, but it will allow you to be interactive with the presentation. All right, um, so first of all, I'd like to get to know a little bit about some of you. So if you can kind of let us know, I'll hide your names. And if you can let us know um, what level you're at, I can kind of gauge a little bit better where everyone is. Oh good, I see some fellow middle school teachers. All right, a lot of high school too. Almost everybody. All right, so um, if you're using Nearpod with your class, which is a, a great way to keep uh, students interactive during your online lessons, if you're going to be teaching that way, and um, then you can, uh, you know, share the results so that you all can see those on your end as well. So it looks like the most are high school and college or university. All right. So um, then my next question, just to kind of get to know everyone is, do you currently have a heritage or native curriculum in your school or district? like that they put out for you that you have to follow. So there are several options there. I know that every district um, or school is a little bit different. Sometimes you have the ability to, you know, do that yourself and sometimes you do not. In my school district in particular, we do not have a heritage or native curriculum. We do have a textbook that is um, kind of old and outdated that we are allowed to follow, but um, no, none of the rest of the classes, no other Spanish classes that I teach have, um, have those textbooks either. So it would be kind of weird to use it for some of the kids in class and not for others. I see most of us have to write all of those things for ourselves. So if you if you look at the graph, you can see most everybody has to write all of their own materials, which is why it's so great to have heard everything that Carl was saying, and you know that we can all share with each other and really you know, use this community that we're building to help our students because that's really what's at the center of. Um, everything that we do is just wanting to help them be successful and help them find a place in the system, right? All right. Um, so here's just some information. You'll have access to this uh, slide presentation afterwards if you'd like to 
um, talk with me or uh, anything else that you maybe I could help with, um, I'll be more than happy to help you there. All right, so today um, what I'm going to talk about is some ideas about some possible frameworks for daily literacy instruction. And um, this mostly comes from my work with Tina Hargaden and CI Liftoff. And uh, I really found that there are a couple of things that will help when you have those mixed classes where you have heritage learners sitting in your regular Spanish classes. And also when you have, um, you know, completely uh, heritage and native speaker classes, which obviously is the um, preferred way as well. So I'll give you some reading and writing ideas for small groups and um, some online options for teaching reading to while you have to engage in distance learning, either synchronous or asynchronous classes, which I think is something that we all are kind of struggling with right now to make sure that we're able to, um, uh, you know, attack that when the time comes. And I have included some um, reading options for you, some fillable PDF graphic organizers that you can use in your classroom with your students, and um, a Google Form template if that is something that you like. So towards the end, you'll kind of see what I mean by that. All right. So which of these topics interests you most? Because these are the things we'll be talking about. So I just kind of want to gauge how um, I should focus my time a little bit since we have such a limited amount of time today together. So which one of these helps you the most? And you can do this where you have to, um, on Nearpod, if you're just learning, you can uh, use this to be able to approve your, what your students are writing, but you do not have to, um, you don't have to approve each one. You can allow them to do it, but I have found, especially with my middle school students, that if I allow them an open license to just put anything uh, up there that they would like, that it becomes sort of um, iffy, a little bit dicey. All right, so uh, I think there's a, a pretty good mix, but I see a lot of online options, and so I'm glad that we will um, get to cover all of that and uh, hopefully um, we all find something that you can use today. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is talk about um, a framework and why to implement a framework. And I'm sure you've all heard this before because there's tons of research out there about why students need structure and predictability and how it fosters learning. Um, I will say that in my own personal experience in all levels of education, I've taught from the third grade all the way through college. And I have always found that when I have a really good framework or a really good predictable structure that I have a decrease in discipline issues, I am more relaxed as the teacher. And if I'm more relaxed, then my students are definitely more relaxed. Um, and when you have a relaxed environment, you have an increase in engagement, which I think is, you know, really key, especially to doing the next one, which is improving relationships. It's, it's much easier to build those relationships with students when you have a, a trusting environment as well. And it does provide more opportunities to implement personalized learning. And where I teach now in Klein ISD, we have a really big push for personalized learning, um, as I, I think is true in most schools. And when you have that relaxed environment, when you have that engagement of students, you really have the ability to do that. And it is super important, um, you know, in what I've seen to have those personalized learning options for my heritage language students as well. And I feel like when you, when you have that, you are able to see better gains in their learning objectives. So how do you implement our strong structure as specifically with heritage um, language classrooms? So you have to find something that works within your schedule. And I have a couple of options um, here that I'm going to talk to you about today as far as a framework goes. Um, and most of this came from the daily instructional framework that uh, was created by Tina Hargaden. And um, she does have a group of called CI Liftoff on, on Facebook if you want to join that. She's part of the World Language Proficiency Project. And it really has uh, helped me to be able to adapt her daily framework. So she has a daily framework that she 
um, uses for all uh, world language classes, regardless of the language, right? And that is really ideal for English speakers who are learning Spanish, but not necessarily for heritage language learners. So I've created a, a couple of framework options for that explicit purpose. So always, you know, starting with some sort of get started thing, I think it's really important to incorporate silent reading and for that to be free voluntary reading or FVR. And if you have not uh, heard of the work of Mike Pito, he uh, has My Generation of Polyglots. He's a really good resource um, as well. He wrote a book. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but he really emphasizes uh, the importance of silent reading. And I think any just good teaching um, would help you understand that students need to be engaged in their reading, that they need to want to read, and not something that we shove in their faces, but something that they've selected, some selected text. So that silent reading time um, for me, it, I always have my students as they come in, um, pick a book, uh, regardless of what uh, level they're at. I have a lot of things and I never tell them, oh, that's not your level, so you can't read that because I feel like literature is literature and as long as they're reading, that's awesome. So I have a, a pretty good library built up over a few years. I have some uh, articles, I have some student written texts from previous years and all of those things are in my FDR library. So I always start with some sort of silent reading. It kind of helps to calm the mood once we've come in and gotten started. And then um, I do allow for that mini lesson and oral input. And this is gonna depend on what kind of class you have. So I have a I have this year or last year, sorry, and will again this next year, one class devoted to heritage learners. And in that class, you know, those students are not literate yet in Spanish. They can understand it and they can speak it, but they, and some of them limited still, but um, aren't really reading and writing yet. So for them, I would have more of kind of the oral input, make sure that we were, you know, reinforcing that. And it also gives me a chance to kind of stick those mini lessons in there so that they can have time to um, get some teacher input. So this, the one on the left that you see, the daily framework, really is the, um, the, NSHL class is what I would use for those students um, and how it would kind of differentiate. Then we always do a write and discuss because of course we all know that that is one of the biggest struggles for a lot of heritage learners is the, um, is the writing piece. And so I'll, I'll show you that method of write and discuss a little later on. And then we always read back what we've wrote, written, sorry, and have a, a time to notice things about the language. And this is a great place for you to kind of slip in um, a, a quick grammar lesson or a quick grammar practice as well. And then I always make them accountable. That student um, accountability and assessment piece at the end of class is really imperative to making sure that we're all I'm staying on the same page. So in the beginning in that getting started time, I'm gonna tell them what the objective is. I'm gonna make sure that they're ready to go. And then by the end, I kind of bring it all full circle for them. So uh, the one on the right is a different kind of framework. And we'll talk about that in just a second. That is for when we are focusing on um, a specific book. And I know there are a lot of differing opinions about whether you should read um, novels as a class or whether you should read them in small groups or whether it should always be um, each student doing that for themselves. And in my experience, I have found that a mix of all of that um, tends to help and reach more learners. So when you're talking about trying to reach a, a larger population, um, that's why I have two of them, right? The one on the left and the one on the right, because the one on the right is something that I probably will only use once per grading um, quarter. And during that time, uh, we'll talk about those in just a minute, a little bit more specifically, some things that we can do in literature circles. And I really think that that could go um, all the way up through the highest levels of education, really. It kind of allows you to personalize their learning, to, to have them split into levels, because when you have students in a heritage language class, they are not all at the same level, and we all know that as well. So uh, how many of you currently teach, I'm just, uh, no shame or anything here, I'm just wondering how many people currently teach with like a consistent framework daily in your classes? If you just take the poll real quick and enter your answer. So 
still have a few more people. All right, so uh, I think you'll see here, I'm gonna share it with you. There's really a pretty great mix of um, all of the people there who are kind of sometimes doing it and, and sometimes not. So um, I think you would, you would be able to see that with a, a little bit of you know consistency. And also, I mean, obviously this depends on uh, how your classes are designed and all of that as well. If some of you are on block scheduling and you have longer class periods, I do have a framework for that as well. Um, and so if you want to um, text me, or, I'm sorry, message me later and let me know, I will be more than happy to share that with you as well. All right, so now we'll talk a little bit about reading, which was that first, uh, that second framework that I had showed you. So before uh, we get started here, I really want to. Uh, try the breakout session. I may need a little help with this. Um, so in the, in the group, and I'm going to put you into groups in just a second, uh, you're going to share some things that you do in your classroom to foster lifelong readers in Spanish. And then be ready to, you know, share a couple in the group chat when we get back. All right, and we're just going to allow about seven minutes or so. Oh, okay. All right, so I'm sorry, I didn't, I was trying to listen, but what I want everyone to do, and um, I know that Edna is manning the chat so that we can go on and still get through everything today is um, just type something in the group chat uh, so that we can share with everyone because you are all in different groups. Um, something that you do in your class, foster lifelong readers in Spanish. So if you'll just, I'll give you just about 30 seconds, if you'll just, type something and share it in the chat so that we can all, you know, learn from everyone else, which is what we want to do. Good, I see a few of them coming through. There are like a hundred people here and there's only nine. So type them in that chat. There we go. And hopefully you can kind of read through those as I'm moving on here and um, hopefully find some things. I hope to look through them myself uh, when we're done. All right. So uh, talking about reading, um, uh, I wanted to really talk about the importance of FBR and pleasure reading. Um, like I was telling you before, this book right here called Practical Advice for Teachers of Heritage Learners of Spanish is um, a book by Mike Pito that is not completely by him. It is a collaborative effort by a lot of heritage Spanish teachers. And they have some really great ideas about reading in the um, heritage language classroom. And I've given you a list of some other places to go with some live links and everything where you can find more things about that. But pleasure reading is, I feel, the best way to really help heritage language learners develop. Um, and I, I agree with Mike Pito that he said pleasure reading is among the very best ways to help HLLs develop their language and literacy skills. So the more they see it, the better they become at writing, the more they, um, you know, read and see different kinds of texts by different authors. Um, you know, and we always want to try to use a variety of those as well. So I use this daily framework within that. And here are a few things um, that I use for these station rotations. So I still keep the same getting started part at the beginning where I give them the objectives, where I uh, talk to them. I usually have some sort of fun activity like would you rather or what would you prefer and give them, you know, two awful choices if you've never heard of that game before or get them um, talking about something that's happening in the world um, at that time. So I give them something to think about when they come in and they know that when they come in, they, they do that in, in their journals and then they also choose an FBR book. Um, but for this time, when we're in literature circles, which like I said, I don't do all the time, I have found that kids get really bored of it if we do it all the time. So I do it about once every quarter, which is uh, the grading periods for us in Klein. And so uh, once a quarter, I, we go on this, this framework, which is a little bit different, but we still do that getting started. So they still have that. We still do the closing and student assessment. So they know what to expect how class is gonna start, how it's gonna end. And then I keep the same three stations. 
So uh, they're always going to read silently in one of them. Uh, sometimes uh, I do allow them to read with a partner if they're all reading the, the same book, um, but that's not always the case. I do uh, split them into groups so that I can work with them and that work with the teacher part of it. And the reason that I do that is because this allows me to really reach every student. And I feel like one of the biggest problems that we as heritage language teachers have in general is the fact that our classes are so varied. Their, their levels of language are so vast. Uh, you have some students who really aren't very literate. You have some students who, you know, had great schooling and education where they're coming from. And so it's because of the variety within one class. And oftentimes, you know, we don't have a chance to split them into too many classes, unfortunately. The reality is that, you know, for example, in language arts classes, you know, they have a, a pre-AP and an AP and an on-level and a resource, and we don't have that. So all of those native speakers or heritage learners are gonna get put into the same class, but they're not all at the same, they're not all at the same point and they're not all ready to move at the same pace. So some of them need really basic things like these story mountains over here. Some of them really need to start there. They really need to see, are they understanding, are they comprehending the very basic parts um, of a story? Uh, some of them, you know, need to work on a higher level thinking things like what do you think the moral is of this story? How did the character change within the story? And um, so I always have them working with me for part of the time. And this is my chance to do some small group instruction to uh, really focus them in. And believe me, especially with, with me teaching middle school and some of you who teach um, elementary, I understand this as well. You really have to train the troops at the beginning to stay in their stations. I know all of you who are in, in higher ed, sometimes that's a little bit easier, but I know even with my high school students, they were off task super easy unless I set some really good routines. So I just wanted to, to really talk about the framework because in order to make, you know, to increase the efficacy of a reading program and to really be able to meet each student at their level of reading, to personalize that learning, you really have to set those routines from the very beginning so that they know what's expected so that they're staying on task. And um, so when we, if they have finished the book that they're reading, then I allow them to work on this choice board and I've given this to you in the resources. This is such a, you know, generic example. Really, this is a great place for you to put whatever it is that you are working on at that point in the year whatever it is that you are, uh, you know, maybe it's just short, this one is from a short story unit that I did. So we don't always read books in literature circles. Sometimes they're um, articles from newspapers. Sometimes they are, um, sometimes we're reading an actual novel. Sometimes we're reading, you know, an opinion kind of uh, essay or something. So there are lots of different things. The example that I gave you is from when we were reading short stories. And so, these are, you know, different things that hit all of those different types of learners. And I know that um, if they are still reading, then they answer questions about what they're reading. And you change these up as they go, obviously. So I have given you access to the Canva templates for that. And I know some of you are like, there's so much color, but you know, there's so much brain research that shows that seeing things in color really does help you to understand and to remember them. And so I know that for some of you, it looks really, um, maybe elementary-ish, but I can say that teaching high school, I still used super colorful documents and the students were really more engaged um, in those kinds of things too, because they really like to look at them. All right, um, so let's make a list because I know that there are a lot of you who already know some great um, places to find some heritage literature or some Spanish literature, sorry. So I want you to enter a novel that you would suggest, or it doesn't have to be a novel, it could be a website, it could be um, any kind of thing that you think would be good for heritage or native speakers of Spanish and kind of the approximate level. Is it like a, a higher level? Is it more advanced? Is it kind of an intermediate uh, text? Good, I'm seeing a lot of those come in. I have a lot that I like to use and I have uh, left you a list and resources of those as well. So 
give you a second to read some of these. Oh, good. Some of these I haven't seen before. Yeah, there are some, um, I will say there are some, I, I've seen this a couple of times now, some in, in here, a couple of TPRS books that are really great. But I would say that I have noticed more often than not that those are not really authentic texts. I, for heritage learners, I'm not saying you have to do this, but I generally try to look for, um, especially for my like more native students too, I try to look for things that are originally written in Spanish. Not that it's always that way, but I have a lot of kids who maybe aren't, Spanish isn't their dominant language anymore. They speak it and they understand it, but as far as um, academics go, they uh, have kind of moved into English more and they'll try to find those in English instead of um, doing them in Spanish. And so I've tried to find texts that were, you know, are, are originally written in Spanish as well. But these are a lot of things and I, I'm glad to leave this here. Um, you'll have access to this as well later on. All right. So here are some uh, book lists that I like. Uh, so all of these, when you get this PowerPoint presentation on Google Slides, you'll be able to click on all of these. And they're just a lot of places that you can go to find good books of literature, sometimes by level. Um, and sometimes you, you may have to go through it yourself as well. But I really think that having a good variety of texts, especially since you're going to have a variety of students levels, that having all of those things are, are, are good. And some people shy away from getting, um, you know, like picture books. So I just want to also say picture books aren't always easy. They're not always easier text. Sometimes it's a little bit higher text and vocabulary. And also, even as an adult, I like reading children's books. I like reading children's picture books too. And it's not any less of a, you know, reading experience because it has pictures in it. So I don't want you to shy away from things that you think are you know, too young for them. I do read alouds in my class often and the kids always love it. So I have these 14 year old boys who will still, you know, come up and gather around and watch me read a book. So I don't want you to think that it's um, something that you can only do if you're an elementary school teacher. I mean, I, I did it in elementary, sure. But even teaching high school, I read things to them as well. And um, I do it under the document camera. It may be a look a little different. You might not have them sitting on the floor around you, but even, 14 year old boys, 13 year old boys that I teach in middle school get super excited when I pull out um, that kind of a text. So I don't want you to shy away from any kind of reading. All right, so let's talk just a little bit now about writing. And I am going to put you into smaller groups this time because we are kind of running short on time. And so I'm gonna just give you five minutes, but I'm gonna put you into much smaller groups um, when we get there in just a second. But first I want you to draw what you think your students look like when you ask them to write. You're like, okay, we're gonna have to write. It, this is not art class. I'm really bad at art as well. So please don't feel like you can't. And don't worry, your names aren't on it. So it's okay. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of the same. Oh, I love the meme. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. So I feel like writing is such an important part of literacy too, but man, do some of them get really scatterbrained um, whenever they start or just fearful that they're going to have to read their writing in front of someone. So I always make sure that I create a safe environment for them whenever we're writing. And uh, I do have them keep notebooks. And I make sure that they know that I'm going to be the one who's reading their writing and that it's not uh, one of their peers. Yes. Oh, no. I love some of these are great. I love the memes. Those are awesome. Yeah, what? Why, profe? Yes. <laughs> like, do we have to? And so, yes, of course, in order to prep for, you know, AP, and especially in those IB classes that they're going to go on to, they've got to be able to do it, right? So you have to 
you have to make sure that that's part of your literacy instruction as well. So what do you use for your writing program? Do you have like a specific program? Do you have a curriculum that you follow? Just throw a few answers in there. Don't worry, your names are not shown, so no one's gonna know that it was you. If you don't have a program, do you have like a curriculum that you follow or you just don't have anything? You just kind of make it up. Okay, good. There's a cuaderno de escritura. My heart, yes. So some people do have a curriculum. A lot of people do not, more than not, they do not. Oh yeah, Plotowski, I, I, I've seen those things as well. So some people have project-based learning and writing embedded, that's awesome. So I tend to go, um, yeah, okay. So, um, I want you to be able to talk about what you do to foster lifelong learners. And because we're kind of short on time, I'm just going to make this like five minutes, but I'm going to make it super, um, sorry, I'm going to make it in, oh yeah, it's out of room. Ooh. Okay, and someone said to make it five. Okay, so we're gonna make these smaller. And there are your room invites. So I'm gonna set it for five minutes, just five minutes. I know you'll wanna have a lot of time. Welcome back. If you could please drop in the chat your um, best takeaway from that breakout time. I know it was super short. I'm sorry, but we're running kind of short on time. And I have one more thing that is the online component that I really want to get through to you. So if you can just drop in the chat something that you learned or something that maybe you didn't get to say, but you wish you had and so that everyone can kind of look at those as we're going through. Give you just a couple seconds before I start. All right, I see a few of them. So keep dropping those in the chat so that everybody can benefit from hearing those things that you thought were really great. So we always get better ideas when there's more of us. All right, so um, as far as writing goes, uh, I wanted to emphasize that I, I am a teacher who uses uh, comprehensible input in my classroom, both with my regular students, my English speakers, and with my heritage learners as well. And um, I really think that Tina Hargaden, um, there's a quote from her here about that. And um, write and discuss mm -hmm. is a really important component of my daily framework. And it allows us to, like she says here, lead a quick discussion of syntactical, morphological, and lexical elements of the language, which is where a lot of our heritage speakers um, you know, struggle with those sorts of things. So how can we make writing useful? So through this daily framework, there are all of these things incorporate writing in them. First of all, I mean, that is great as well. Um, so they are writing about reading, which if you are um, someone who, who has been introduced to the world of Lucy Calkins or Teachers College, then you understand uh, those things and how important they are too to process what you're reading, but also gives you a chance to practice your writing um, skills as well. But within the daily framework, how does that work? Well, um, there's a, a process called write and discuss and really it's adapted from Tina Hargaden and Mike Pito. Um, Tina started it, Mike Pito has kind of evolved it a little bit and I, I've learned it from them and then also evolved it myself. So this is how I work, write and discuss. So at the end of class right here, after our oral input, um, we do a write and discuss, and I feel like it is the mo probably the second most, I think reading is the most important, but I feel like it's the second most important part of class, especially for heritage language learners. So that mini lesson or oral input could be um, a video, I mean, it could be 
that you're creating um, like a one word image together. And yes, even with heritage language classes, I do that and the kids really get into it and they really enjoy creating those stories. And so they create one word images, um, which is a pretty traditional uh, CI technique. And then they create a story about their images and then they have these um, narratives going on about these characters. And I always display them in their art gallery on our wall. And then they think about all the parts of a story. So it gives them like some creative writing outlets as well during that mini lesson oral input time. And uh, if you need some other ideas or whatever for that, I'd be more than happy to share some of those too. But after that happens, so after we've had either the mini lesson or the oral input for the day, whatever that might have been, then I make sure that we have a write and discuss time. And I always keep at least 10 to 15 minutes. Even if sometimes I run out of time for the reading and noticing, I always make sure that I keep that much time. So we co-create, if you can read there over on the how to write and discuss, we co-create a summary of text of what you learned, experienced, watched, read together during class. And then, um, I know this sounds weird, but we do choral read the text together to make sure we're all um, you know, on that right spot. Then we choral translate the text. Sometimes it helps for them to see the differences in languages when they are um, going back and forth. And this is mainly for, that part is mainly for my students who are heritage learners who are still maybe um, using some of their you know, rules in English grammar with their Spanish. So it kind of helps them to see the differences there and, and when, to, uh, when to use which one. And then uh, I always have them notice any features. I call it noticing. And so when we read back over it, I have them notice, what is it about it that you notice? A lot of times with heritage language um, classes, I get a lot of things about words. Um, interestingly enough, that they didn't really how, realize how it was spelled. So now, you know, we said, Asia uh, una vez, and they thought it was A S I A instead of H A C I A, right? So we get those kind of differences in um, spelling that they're hearing it and they know that's the word we were using, but then they also now have seen it. So maybe that's part of what they notice about the language. And then um, finally, I'll have them copy the text in the, that we co-created, which will only be about five to seven sentences, not a long text, not like a, a huge paragraph, because you don't have time for that in 10 minutes. So we would have them co-create a text um, of sentences and then I'm gonna have them copy it in their notebooks and then I'm gonna have them write at least two more sentences, add at least two more sentences of their own, either at the beginning or at the end, or if there was a sentence that when they were calling them out, they, you know, I didn't choose their sentence, but they really wanted it to be in there, then that's how that would work. So I would have a, um, normally I would have a camera if I was in person, but here is the other uh, version of that. So in Canva, I've shared this template with you. And so we don't ever decide on the title until we've created the text. So you would text here, to, uh, you would write here together, and this is just a place marker, so you can write whatever it is that you all are writing. And um, once they're done, you know, you get the input from them. Um, if you're doing uh, an online class that's synchronous, you can have them, you know, drop their sentence suggestions in the, in the chat but I also have a Google form that I'm gonna show you in just a minute, which is another way to do that as well. So here's a way to write and discuss virtually, although when you were in class, it would be either on the board or it would be under a document camera, and then you're gonna have them um, you know, copy that and then add two sentences to it. And then I'm gonna be the one who looks at those. Now the sentences we wrote together, they should be copying and they should be perfect. So really, when I, when I go to review student work, I'm only looking for those two extra sentences. Did they make it make sense in the context of the paragraph? Was, you know, did they do, you know, were they following the things that, and really I'm only looking for the things that we're learning about at that point, right? At the things that, the mini lesson that we have um, at the time. All right, so I'd love to be able to go through, write, and discuss, and, and, and practice it with you, but we're kind of out of time today, and we're going to skip that one too. So um, I want to have time for questions um, at the end, and so I want to make sure that I get to this because I feel like it's a super important part right now. So how do you do all this online? And um, some of you talked about that. So one way that I have found, which uh, really came from a couple of friends of mine who had this idea and they kind of hatched up a, a version of it. And, uh, you know, I've been writing curriculum as well with the World Language Proficiency Project, and we've been using some of 
this Google form kind of way as well. And I've given you a link here when you have it to get into the Google form yourself, but it's a way that to keep students accountable and engaged, um, even when you're not with them um, online. So here is uh, the Google form. So this is just a sample Google form and you can certainly change it however you would like. So it's just for um, online learning and accountability. So I don't know how many periods in the day you have. I have eight. And so um, I would have them choose which class period it was that they were in because when they submit this form, I as a teacher can see the responses here. So uh, I would have them put their period, first name and last name. And then um, when we're doing that, that getting started part of the day, I call it para empezar. And at that point, they have to um, answer whatever is there. Now, if I was completely online and it was a synchronous class, meaning that you were teaching it at the same time the students were there, then I would probably have them um, write it here, but also, um, you know, just keep it to keep class moving and stuff. I would probably project share my screen with that um, question or image or whatever it was that they had to. Um, sometimes it's a a picture that they have to respond to and give some feedback on. Sometimes, like I said, it's just a thought-provoking question. And so this would be a place for them to do that. Um, then whenever they're reading silently, they use this um, space to tell me what book that they were reading or what, whatever it is. So I know, especially when we're doing online learning, they don't always have access to reading um, actual books and things because, you know, um, here where I am, the libraries aren't open, so they couldn't even go there and get a book. So I do have a few uh, online texts that I share with my students that I did at the end of the year. I shared um, an entire Google folder and they could choose one of those to read. They also are allowed to read magazines if they have them at home. Um, whatever they have that they can read, uh, sometimes it's an article, but whatever they're doing here, if it was something online, they have to put the link here so I know what they were reading, all right? And then I'm gonna have them use uh, these questions, which you saw in an earlier one, right? And so they're going to um, go through here and choose one of the questions and answer it. Choose one of the questions and answer it. Choose another of the questions and answer it. So they're gonna do three of those. And um, I'm gonna give them some time to do that in class. If we're in a synchronous class, asynchronously, they could also do this as well. And it gives you some good uh, data and an ability to kind of evaluate. Um, and I always tell them that for the reading part, I'm not grading your writing. Although you may be a teacher who really wants to grade their writing and then as well, and that's fine. But usually when I'm grading like just straight up comprehension, I don't, um, I don't do that. Um, then I give them a place to take notes, whatever it was that we learned about that day. And then we have our shared writing. So like I was telling you that write and discuss time, we, uh, during that time, I may let, if it's a synchronous class, I'll give them the ability to just put it in the chat. But if there's a, something that didn't get used in the write and discuss, then they could do that. Also, they don't have notebooks at home that you can check, right? So I want them to be writing it in, on a piece of paper or something at home, but I also wanna be able to assess if we're completely online, I wanna be able to see what they're writing. So I asked them to do it here. And with synchronous classes, which is what I had at the end of last school year, um, if you could call it the, an actual school setting. But anyway, what I had them do was um, write it in here. And by the end of class, they had to have submitted this to me. So I couldn't go and like check somewhere else and, you know, write something else or whatever. So they had to, um, you know, stay in this and then they had to do that as well um, to submit it. And the great thing about Google Forms is it does have a timestamp of when they submitted that as well. And then when I talked to them about thinking about reading, right? So, I mean, thinking about writing. So what did you notice when we were writing? Then I would have them right here. What did you notice about the language? What did you have that you noticed? And normally I would get some feedback and we would do that in class. Um, and like I said, sometimes it's great. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but otherwise, I would have them write it in here because maybe I didn't get to them. Maybe they did try to write it in the chat, but maybe I wasn't able to get it from them um, in the time frame that we had. 
And then I always give them um, on the Google form a chance to, you know, just tell me something, maybe a note to me about something that they missed or something they didn't understand or something they feel like we need to go over again. And then they'll click submit and I'll be able to see all of their responses after class. I'll be able to go through. And that way I'll be able to also kind of know for next time, what did I need to hit on more? What did I not um, complete or whatever? But I think that this is a really great way for you to keep students accountable and engaged. And especially um, in these times where we're kind of uncertain if we'll have to be partially online or all online. And so I just wanted to offer this as a you know suggestion and option for you to be able to go online and i did use it with my classes that last month of last month and a half two months of school but and it re it went really well and it does allow them to it, it does keep them accountable and so i know that some people work on different lms um, within their school i know ours is um, our school works with schoology i know that canvas has some abilities to you know, ask them questions and have them respond there as well. And that's great. But there are some people who don't have those systems in place. And so this is just another way to do that or to add into your Google Classroom. And it, it went really well at the end of the year. And so I hope that maybe it's something useful for you as well. So um, I just want you to take a second and think about one thing that maybe you learned from me or your colleagues that you can use because I'd like to be able to look at this board later and kind of see what those are. And so if you'll just put it right here. Good. Awesome, I'm seeing lots of great things. Yay! All right, so while I'm putting these up, I know Edna has been watching the chat and we only have about like 13 or 14 minutes left. So I just wanna make sure that I, or not that much, sorry, about 10 minutes left. So I just wanna make sure that I can answer whatever questions you may have. So Edna. Yeah, there, there was a lot of activity in the chat room. Oh, no. People have been sharing all kinds of materials. Okay. So there is great conversation. Um, so I think people are concerned about how to get the list. The uh, all list these materials of... that we have the sharing or how do we get the list from Nearpod? There is one question about how to get the list from Nearpod. Oh, I'm gonna can... have it and I'm going to put it in this folder, sorry. Um, maybe I wasn't this folder that you all got from us, which has all of my graphics and fillable PDFs in it. I will add it to that once I make it from your chat. You mean so that I'm going to look at, yeah, I'm going to look at the Nearpod mm -hmm. and I'll make a list of it and I'll put a Google doc in this, um, in this folder, this Google folder. And, mm -hmm. um, hopefully that will help you to have that, but there also are some live links in my presentation that will hopefully help as well. And also just to let you know, I'm gonna have a presentation tomorrow about reading too. And I found this great site uh, called Wakelet. Uh, mm -hmm. So I yeah, am curating material uh, and all these resources, not well, not all of them that I can see in the chat, but I, I'm gonna start adding them. I'm gonna copy and, and, and paste uh, all these ideas and maybe try to incorporate them. But yeah, I am sharing also in my folder, uh, if you go to the materials, I downloaded the PDF with some of these materials that I can see here and they are already in my collection. So you can uh, even, if you don't want to open an account with Wakelet, because that would be a great idea to share for us to um, share collections. But if you don't want to do it, you can download the PDF that I have right, right now in my. Uh, awesome. So there will uh, be a couple places folder. for you to get those. So that would be a, a good way to, to collect and maybe, yeah, to help us and right. have all these resources. And Together. there is another question about uh, for you. Uh, oh, is there a translation for the house on Mango Street? Does anybody know? Do you know if there is a translation? Like into English or in Spanish? 
uh, into Spanish, I guess. Yeah, yes. I, I have yes, one. Both. Yeah, it's it's online. There are a lot of free versions online. Mm -hmm. Um, I can send the link. Do you? I, know? I'll put it. In, I'll put it in my book list that I'm going to make from your all's list here. Okay. And uh, do you know of websites that have books available online for free? What do you recommend? So uh, your public library has a lot of those and it's free for you to join the public library. And um, so especially here in Texas, I know we have a pretty great network of that. And so you can get on public libraries. Um, I'm sure that some other people have shared some in the chat as well. There are a lot of places to find. Uh, I knew, I know Newsy LA has a lot of great articles mm -hmm. um, there that are pretty relevant and also have questions already built into them. Um, and there are some free publications online as well that will give you. And also in my collection, I have two, actually two collections. One is for um, books or stories that you can download for free. And I, there is material for all ages, but there is also another collection for, uh, that I have for websites and l blogs that you can follow, such as Mac P May, Mike, the Mike Pito, the one that you mentioned. Uh -huh. It's so, called My yeah. Generation of Polyglot. Yes, yes. So I have several groups that you can join there or blogs or, yeah, there are several um, independent authors that they publish books and maybe right. you can find interesting too in that collection. And there are, um, in my presentation, which you'll be able to click whenever you have it, there, there was that page that was a list of all of the um, like different links and book lists that I've used before too. So go into there and, and there should be a lot of those as well. Mm -hmm. there, Any other questions? Yes. All right. Um, there was another question about Canvas. Do you need a Canvas subscription for the, the feature that you mentioned? So it's Canva, right? It, it's not um, Canvas is oh, it's Canva. Canvas at the, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just wanted you to know when you're looking for it, because Canvas is an LMS that's mm -hmm. used by a lot of school districts, but a learning management system, that's what LMS is. But there is also, it's kind of like Blackboard or uh, Schoology, right? But Canva is a, a, a way that you can uh, create materials. It's right here. I'll go home so you can see it. Um, so you can create a free account here, and then you can create different designs and things there. Um, and you, you can have folders and you can create teams and like share it with a bunch of people and it is free for educators. So mm -hmm. just so that you know, there is a, a free educator account and they uh, do give you the pro version free as an educator. So mm -hmm. that's helpful. And that's where I made most of the um, materials that I left for you as well. Mm -hmm. Let me see if there is another one. Um... Somebody was asking about rubrics. Can anyone, do you know anything about rubrics? Maybe everyone, can everyone post oh, rubrics? I mean, sure, I could put some, um, some reading rubrics in there for you as well that are uh, aligned with ACTful standards. I usually use rubrics um, when I'm reading that are all ACTful aligned and, uh, you know, really, go through that. I know that you may not be, I don't know about um, collegiate level Spanish and if that's something that you all have to use, but I, I have a lot of rubrics that I use for reading and uh, I do have a rubric that I use for the choice board as well if that's what someone was talking about and I will I get those for you and drop them in that Google folder. Awesome. I think that's it. I, those are most of the awesome. questions. Awesome and I think mm -hmm. we're out of time anyway so who do i Perfect need timing yeah thank you all so much for having me and it was awesome getting to um share some things with you all thank all you right. so much alana for your presentation thank you alana thank for you for sharing your work and i think we have a lot of great ideas to share and what i love is that everybody's sharing their own so it, it'll be great to have a place where we can all go and look at everything people are sharing yes definitely um, so now we are gonna move, we have lunch now, but before we head out to lunch, I just wanna make a quick uh, couple announcements. So first of all, um, we have a whole hour for lunch. And then after that at 1.15, we have the online poster session. 
And I just wanted to let you all know uh, that the poster session, the way that worked was um, we had people submit kind of little um, descriptions of projects they were working on. And then we, you know, we read their, um, their proposals and we accepted their uh, proposals to create a poster. And so we put the, all of these, because we're digital this year, we, they're all on Padlet and we've sent already the link where you can go and look at the posters and then watch a short little video of each uh, person speaking about their project. And these are sometimes research related, sometimes uh, pedagogy or whatever they're doing in their classrooms. So it would be great if, maybe if you get a chance during lunch to take a look at those, because in the poster session at 1.15, what we're gonna do is have the presenters available to answer any of your questions about their projects or anything you wanna know more about them. And the same poster presenters are gonna be there for the lunch session tomorrow as well. So you have an opportunity to do that tomorrow too. And just to keep you thinking about this, if you, um, want to present during the poster session next year, then you can also get some ideas of uh, what types of work you can do to submit for next year. So I don't know if any, um, Flavia or Sarah, do you have any other announcements before we go to lunch? No, just that, I mean, take your time, stretch your back, and if you have time, revise the posters again. So when we come back to, at 115, we're ready to start engaging with the, with the presenters. And it will be kind of an, an open round table with multiple questions. Yes, the poster session will be pretty informal. You just kind of drop in and out as you want, if you want to listen or to ask questions. Um, and then at two o'clock, we'll have our next workshop. So just thank you everybody everybody for participating. Sarah? Oh, I was just going to say in Padlet, you can make comments on the posters too. So we love to see your comments. Yeah. Great. So we'll see you in, a, in an hour or so. Muy bien. Buen provecho. Buen provecho. It's the language ideology project or language identity project. And that's the kind of start of the course. Um, and then there are different projects along the way. Uh, some of them have to do with like, say, academic writing, which they have to do like a formal typical class um, essay. Some things are more performative. Some things are more presentational. For the different modes of communication. But yes, they're all planned out and they're all uh, specifically linked to whatever the theme is. For instance, the academic paper is linked to, well, the science unit basically, and that'll be uh, for a few different things, but one of the most current ones being the coronavirus and sort of how Latinos are, um, are um, more affected than the general population and why and kind of being into some of those issues. So it'll be a way for them to kind of um, see something more topical, more something that we didn't all, we're all thinking about right now anyway, but then also taking a critical lens to it as well. Thank you. And another comment or question says, um, could you define what you consider authentic material? Yeah, that's a great question because for a lot of people, um, could it be, you know, is it a question of, is it someone, something written, is it a question of the audience, is it a question of the author? Um, and for me, I just typically choose things written by native speakers for native speakers. So um, basically, it will always be uh, things like news articles, um, YouTube videos, sometimes something more casual, documentaries, those kinds of things. Um, not that I'm a pro opposed to an instructor create content for um, the Spanish classroom, because that's also an authentic context, of course, and that's also probably why the person's asking the question. Mm -hmm. But um, that's just so people, just for, so for students to kind of get a, brighter, a broader sense of how the language is used, basically. Okay, perfect. Um, so those were the questions that I saw on the actual board, on the actual poster. Um, I can open it up to if anybody has any questions, if they want to um, raise their hand or they can ask something in the chat as well. Um, any other questions for Michael Allred? It looks like someone raised their hand, um, Gabriela. I don't see where it shows me where they raised their hand. Oh, oh it's I'm oh, sorry. It's yes. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. um, um, go ahead. Um, Okay, okay, thank you. So this is uh, Gabriela, I'm Michael's colleague and Veronica's colleague. I'm also at SMU. I just wanted to add that this course is going to be huge for us because up until uh, literally before the proposal of this course, we have only had mm, in theory two, but really one course for heritage Spanish speakers. And uh, that was the course that I mentioned to, to some of the uh, people that I talked to in the breakout group. It's uh, advanced Spanish for heritage speakers. And so everybody and anybody who was a heritage speaker would fall into that advanced Spanish course. And we do have a 
conversation course, but that one hasn't been often too frequently. So we have been really lucky to finally be able to, you know, uh, to with this course acknowledge the fact that our heritage speakers are not really a homogenous group. So we're, we're really thrilled to, to have this and thank you, Michael, for creating this. I think Gabriela, that's a great point too. It's just that, yeah, we want to better serve our community as much as we can, so. Um, I, I actually have a quick question. You said that um, you have two courses, right? So you have like a beginner's uh, heritage and then now you're creating this one, is that correct? No, basically so, and actually both Gabriela who just spoke and Professor Leon as well, there we start, the program started with an advanced course. So we have uh, both a mainstream and heritage version of advanced Spanish after students complete fourth semester. So we've sort of started at the top and then worked our way down. So we have an advanced course and then now probably an intermediate course. Or no, we're now on intermediate course. And I don't know that, we don't have, tend to have the same kind of um, population size that a lot of other programs do in Texas. So okay. we might not expand much farther down than that. But hopefully, I mean, that'd be a nice goal one day, I think. Yeah, this is great because if I'm the one that's, I'm, I'm starting to get this path going. So mm -hmm. from the beginner, and then they kind of, they don't, we don't have an intermediate, they just kind of jump back to um, the, the non-native track or the native track. So I think having that intermediate course in there to bridge both of them, you yeah. know, like to get them a little bit further down because eventually they kind of line up with the L2s. So they kind of, you know, they go through that path, but um, I definitely need to expand more, but it, it's, it's a one person process at the moment, but I yeah. think that's really useful for me uh, as far as in my university to have something as far as for the intermediate level. So thank you for that too. <laughs> thank you too for your insight. That's very helpful. That's actually why I want to do this because it's so nice to hear everyone else's ideas and approaches. And yeah. Thoughts. Yeah. And sometimes we, we feel alone. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> like, and, we, and that all that input and um, collaboration really does help. <laughs> right, for sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. Are there any other questions um, for Michael? I'm looking here to see if there's any hands. I think. Oh, Marta. Um, Marta, go ahead and, and ask your question. <laughs> hey, um, and I see that this Intermediate Heritage Spanish course is um, focused on the linguistics part of what it is to teach a, a heritage language. I do teach in a high school where um, I develop a program and we have three levels. Mm -hmm. And I am making sure that history is part of this, my advanced courses because I do think that um, our students' identities benefit from knowing our history here in, in this country. So I, I haven't seen anything, I'm looking through your poster and I haven't seen anything specifically to the history of the US Latinos. Um, and, but in my experience, and that's what I see their brain really and their identity really blooming is when they start making connections uh, between their identity and our history as Latinos in the U.S. I'm not talking about about the history of Spain or the history of Latin America. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Oh yeah, I mean every unit um, actually has a lot of literature and history and uh, history or I guess literature from the context of having students explore their own history for instance. Uh, so they'll read, uh, so far something I have slated, I think that I'm pretty sure I'll use uh, there'll, there'll be a couple of things, actually, one thing is in, actually in English, but there was a book written by, and I'm blanking on her name right now, but it's called Chicana Falsa, which is actually written in English, but it'll be a complimentary piece to something they read in Spanish, so they can translanguage and work through both languages to kind of talk about some of these issues, because it talks about, um, I forget the author's name, but she's from Oxnard, California, so it talks about sort of the questions of being Latino, and then we also, um, with that, the complimentary piece to that is actually a historical piece. So we're, first we work through her narrative, through her personal perspective, and then we look at the history of maybe why she feels that way or sort of uh, immigration patterns in the US, for instance, might be something that comes up. And so that's sort of how everything's integrated, basically. Um, I have here, is it Michelle Cerros, the person you're talking about? No? Oh, well, yes, yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, okay. Yes, <laughs> the other, yeah. Somebody wrote it yeah. in here, I don't know. <laughs> uh, thank you, I was like, because I was like, well, how am I blanking on this name? <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, somebody, uh, Eric Martinez just wanted to comment that Latino history in the U.S. is a great way to hook students. And April Goforth is asking if you have any resources regarding the history that you could share. 
Oh, uh, sure. I could try to think of something. Uh, let me think of what I'm. Perhaps um, just, yeah. is there like a way that maybe they can send some of these um, resources to everybody later? Since we kind of like putting them on the spot, maybe, you know, so they can gather something. I don't know. Yeah, because it's mostly just articles and just things. I, I, can, I can send a list of things I find online that I think are good, for, for instance. Yeah. Um, Sarah, I think there's a way we collect things usually, right, to share with other participants. Like we could put it on the Google Drive mm -hmm. if you send it to yeah. us. So it's accessible to everybody, right? I guess. Uh, you have a, yeah, you could just send an email and then we'll put it in there. Oh, yeah, you we email usually have like a Google Doc, share, but we'll, we'll share it. Or if you could put it on a Google Doc, mm -hmm. then we'll just link it to our Google Drive where we have everything. Okay. I guess the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, for one, for instance, one thing we'll watch at least part of will be, yo soy boricua para que tú lo, para, para que tú lo sepas. And so basically, students will get to learn part of like Puerto Rican history from that, for, for instance, as well. So I'm trying to think of actual written things. Is that what people are wondering about? Is like written? Yeah, I have um, Luis um, Aviles Gonzalez um, says, um, Acuna occupied America, I mm -hmm. guess, um, sharing. And Mercedes Fernandez Asenjo says the harvest of the empire, both the book and the documentary. So that's really good too. Mm -hmm. Oh, that reminds me. So yeah, we'll actually, um, we'll read a chapter from El Espejo Enterrado by Carlos Fuentes, and we'll watch part of the documentary of that for that as well. And actually we'll watch um, Jose Leon Portillo, we'll watch part of his documentary. Um, it's, uh, I forget what it's about, I forget what it's called right now, but yeah, that's most of a watch historically. Yeah, I use a lot of film and, and uh, visual in my, in my classes. So I always like to have the visual component or like a film or something that goes with it. So that's really right. good. Um, somebody here, uh, Marta also says PBS Latino, uh, Latino Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and Mercedes Fernandez also says um, the doc, oh, the documentaries on YouTube. She, um, she oh, nice. just hear that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for for all of those resources. Yes, that's awesome. Um, let me check my little hands over here and see if anybody else, <laughs> anybody else have a question or anything to say about um, Michael's? Um, if not, we will move on to, oh, um, Alicia Munoz. Hi, yeah, I was, hi, Michael. Thank you so much for your present, your poster and your, and your presentation. So Thank you. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the grammar instruction. I know that was one thing that you mentioned that you do more sort of targeted in, um, instruction. And that's probably why the reason for it. So the, the, what, the first um, project that's brought up in the video, that's actually used as a benchmark to see where students are. And then from there, they'll get an individualized plan. And we use Canvas as our online LMS. And so basically I'll just sort of have preloaded things for, for now I'll just have preloaded sort of the things I know that heritage speakers have um, difficulties with traditionally. And if I need to upload more things, of course I will, but it'll be um, a mix of different videos. Some of them actually from the Coral website, uh, some of them from one of the textbooks I like some of the explanations and other kind of, so it'll be like an explanation followed by an activity. And so um, as we go through with each project, um, different um, areas of growth be pinpointed and it'll be an opportunity, and I'll basically, um, in the comments on Canvas, basically I'll link to some of the things or mention and tell them to go to, you know, the resources module on our Canvas page and ask them to complete that. And I, I'm guessing I'll probably, uh, the way I'll probably handle it is over the course of the semester require somewhere in the range of, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 kind of things for students to work on. Uh, and then just sort of, um, and then also require that they use maybe whatever that structure is in the next project. That way I can see that maybe there's been growth there, for instance, or um, maybe even, so on a formative level and then summatively, or sorry, on a su summative level, but then form, uh, formatively in class, maybe then also um, kind of look for those things as well as they go through in different assignments, basically. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yes, it does. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, anybody else have a question? I think, I think I, well, we I, should move on to the other yeah. posters and there will be more time tomorrow as well. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So our next, um, poster comes from Angela Contreras Weiss. 
um, and her title is Conocimiento y Adquisición Ortográfico. And um, I'm going to start here. Where are you, Angela? Are you here? Angela? Yeah, I, I'm here. I was just unmuting myself. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I just wanted to make sure that we had you here. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so I'm going to start with um, some questions that have been posted on here on the poster board. Um, and it says, Encontraron que los EELH tienen más dificultad que los EEL2 identificando la sílaba tónica. Uh -huh. Y si es así, ¿han desarrollado algunas estrategias para ayudar a los EELH? Uh -huh. Bueno, esa es una buena pregunta. Eh, en la discusión yo incluí justamente la lista de palabras. Eh, normalmente cuando se hace un tipo de de prueba como esta, uno tiene que considerar el inventario fonético que a incluir, ¿verdad? Eh, se, deben tener diferentes, se deben tener en cuenta diferentes factores, como la frecuencia de las palabras. Eh, se, dio, se, se vio que hay eh, muchos de los estudiantes de el segunda lengua tienen mucho mu, uso de otras palabras, a diferencia de los de herencia, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, eh, para, para, para desarrollar estas estrategias, como decía, explicaba, es un proceso binario en el que los estudiantes, primero que todo, deben identificar esa, es, ese acento prosódico y, segundo, saber la regla. A nivel de experiencia, los estudiantes de segunda lengua tienen mucha más experiencia que los estudiantes de herencia, justamente por... Eh, eh, la forma como han sido alfabetizados. Entonces, esa es una de las respuestas que yo daría a esa pregunta. Muy bien, perfecto. Otra pregunta que, que tenemos aquí dice, ¿qué otros rasgos ortográficos, aparte de la tildación, se estudiaron y cuáles son las implicaciones del estudio? Sí, es, se incluyeron eh, palabras eh, de asimilación regresiva, es decir, eh, palabras que incluyen... Eh, o que contienen dos elementos del cual uno se copia al otro, como combate eh, o como decir conveniencia, uh -huh. que la B se pasa, eh, se vuelve bilabial cuando uno, uno no dice convivencia, uh -huh. <risa> sino que normalmente se transforma en una M. Entonces ahí esos rasgos se, se asimilan. De igual, forma, de igual forma confortable, la N se transforma en M, pero también se puede decir que puede ser una transferencia lingüística, eh, por lo que se escribe con M en, en inglés, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. Entonces, eh, lo que se vio básicamente era si había transferencia o si no, y qué tipo de, 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 de rasgos o de elementos se pueden eh, incluir en una... En un, en un lesson plan, ¿verdad? Para que los estudiantes tengan conciencia de las dos diferentes gramáticas. Perfecto. Muy bien. Muchísimas gracias. ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta? Para Ángela Contreras Wise. Voy a ver aquí rapidito nada más a ver si hay una manita. <risa> uh, ahorita no veo nada. ¿Alguien quiere decir algo en el chat? ¿Todos bien? Y no veo ninguna pregunta hasta ahorita. Sí, aquí yo puedo decir algo mientras tanto. Eh, la, ortografía, la ortografía es un elemento que se ha dejado olvidado, digámoslo así, porque la mayoría de instructores eh, dicen, no, bueno, o, o pasaron o no pasaron, pero normalmente no se toca ese tema y es un tema que está olvidado, especialmente en herencia. Se critica muchísimo, pero no se hace mucho. Entonces, hay que tener en cuenta que, que la ortografía es el pilar del léxico y de la lectura. Y también, pues, de la, de la comprensión de lectura y la escritura, obviamente. Porque si no, se, si no se domina ese componente, los otros componentes también se afectan. Entonces, es importante tenerlo en cuenta. Y el, el, el llamado que hago es, pues, para que se hagan más... Um, eh, ejercicios en clase, ¿no? Y, y se, se prueba a ver en qué, en qué parte está, eh, no está funcionando es esto. Si esa, porque la, la, definitivamente la ortografía 
se deriva primero la fonología, de la fonología, que el, el español es una lengua transparente, uh -huh. y segundo, la morfología. Entonces, mirar por qué o cómo mejor agrupar ciertas palabras para que los estudiantes aprendan eh, la ortografía de ellas, ¿verdad? Sí. Yo tengo una preguntita antes de ir con la profesora Verónica. Este, yo estoy de acuerdo con usted. Um, yo pongo mucho énfasis en la ortografía, ¿verdad? Pero de una manera que no los vaya a asustar, ni mucho menos. Pero, ¿qué piensa usted de, la, de los profesores o de otros uh, uh, maestros que dicen este, que la ortografía realmente no tiene mucha importancia uh, hasta ya que lleguen a niveles más altos porque... Um, lo importante es de que se den a entender y mientras lo podamos entender no pasa nada. <risa> Porque yo he hablado con mucha gente así y pues me dicen que no importa que yo, que no me debo de enfocar mucho en eso y yo pues estoy de acuerdo con usted, ¿verdad? <risa> sí, eh, pues eh, de hecho Carreira tiene un artículo muy bueno eh, en el 2002 donde habla justamente de esto de la competencia a nivel profesional eh, en la ortografía. Y esto es porque es especialmente si los estudiantes se van a enfocar en carreras como traducción, enseñanza, periodismo, etc. Todo lo que tenga que ver con la lengua escrita es vital. Entonces va a haber mucha menos, es decir, la competencia para ellos es, es, es bastante grande porque va a haber mucha gente que tiene muchas eh, capacidades ortográficas que van más allá. De hecho, estuve, conocí un caso... Eh, en una universidad donde no contrataron a una profesora porque su presentación tenía, su presentación tenía un, eh, un, un eh, eh, elemento ortográfico que no era convencional, no es canónico, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. Entonces, justamente no consiguió el trabajo por eso. Entonces, eso me parece importante sí, claro. y hay que, hay que tratarlo desde niveles básicos. Desde el principio, ¿verdad? Sí, este, aquí tengo a la profesora este, Verónica. Hola. Sí. Sí. <risa> eh, solo para um, apoyar a mi colega Ángela, yo creo que eh, la ortografía es esencial en nuestro idioma y como ahora en esta época de los medios y con los textos, se ha eh, deformado ya todo lo que se entiende por ortografía, que hay una broma que siempre les cuentan mis estudiantes, horrografía se está volviendo. <risa> y y este, este no es un chiste, ¿verdad? Yo también tengo eh, ejemplos de, de casos de la vida real en que se, incluso no solo no se dan trabajos, sino que se ha vuelto eh, caótico, caótico. Quiso decir una una idea y dijo otra. Entonces, yo creo que contextualizar es importante y eh, no nada más dar las reglas, sino siempre, siempre aplicarla desde lo más básico. Y eh, me encanta que, que se siga eh, pasando esta, no es solo una tradición, esta es nuestra norma eh, de identidad. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Aquí también este... Gabriel Germán dice que la gente también dice que la gramática no importa y es cierto, pero tampoco es verdad, ¿verdad? También necesitamos la gramática. Este, voy con Gabriela, también tiene una pregunta, Gabriela. Sí, hola, yo vengo con una perspectiva un tanto diferente y me gustaría invitar a Ángela a que con, contemplara esto en, en sus estudios subsecuentes de este tema. Eh, para darles un poco de contexto, pues yo soy fonetista y fonóloga, así que sí es cierto que la gramática es importante, pero las gramáticas también cambian, ¿sí? Entonces, eh, eh, a mí, yo en vez de decir que esto es una, eh, que la lengua está eh, deformándose o yo sé qué, este, podríamos eh, pensar en el hecho de que la lengua, y sobre todo la lengua española aquí, donde hay un contacto extenso del inglés y del español, pues es un cambio lingüístico este, eh, del, del cual eh, somos testigo de vista. Esto, eh, y dicho eso, entonces me pregunto que si Ángela eh, pudiera, eh, por ejemplo, además puse esta pregunta en el Padlet, eh, que si los resultados que, observ que, que observó entre los hablantes de herencia se pueden quizá explicar a través del hecho de que el acento es fundamentalmente previsible en español. Entonces, bueno, pues sí, 
este papa y papá no significa lo mismo, pero hay poca gente que son hablantes nativos del español o que son bilingües del español e inglés que, eh, eh, que se llegarían a confundir con eso. Entonces, eh, yo no, te, o sea, no estoy en contra de que les enseñemos la fundación y demás, pero si hay una resistencia fuerte entre los hablantes de herencia, de la cual todos somos testigos de vista, entonces quizás somos nosotros los que deberíamos de ver por qué se resisten tanto. Y a mí lo que se me ocurre, dado mi mi este background eh, eh, fonético y fonológico es, es la, eh, lo previsible que es el acento en español, ¿no? Solo eso. Sí, eh, gracias Gabriela, me parece muy interesante tu postura. Y justamente esta, este, esta prueba, lo que hice, mi experimento eh, eh, que hice, fue justamente... Primariamente era para las tildes, la tildación por la clase, no por la naturaleza de la clase, de que era fonética y fonología. Entonces aquí se trataba de que los estudiantes eh, desarrollaron un poco la percepción eh, a través de esos elementos básicos del español. Sin embargo, como sabemos, no, incluso nosotros mismos los monolingües tenemos a veces problemas con la tildación. Entonces es un, pro, es un proceso largo eh, y pues el, el estudio justamente llama a eso, ¿no? A hacer más estudios empíricos y a tener en cuenta que ese elemento ortográfico es vital para desarrollar todas las otras habilidades. Okay, gracias. Solo para decir algo aquí rápido, nada más, este, están comentando en el chat que también la ortografía causa mucho estrés o self-doubt, ¿verdad? En los hablantes de herencia. Y están preguntando también que si puede compartir después, no sé, con, um, en un Google Doc o cómo lo están haciendo, este, algunos ejercicios que recomienda usted para enseñar la ortografía. Eh, dice uh, Taff Boyer que como maestra de literatura, sus estudiantes tienen mucha dificultad, sobre todo cuando llegamos al análisis de la poesía. Um, también, este, uh, ¿qué más aquí? Este, creo, que, creo que es todo. Te, creo que tenemos que irnos al siguiente, ¿verdad, Jocelyn? Sí. Bueno, pues, okay. muchísimas no, gracias. Eh, los que no, si no da tiempo de hacer todos los posters, hoy, recuerden que tenemos la sesión de mañana. Entonces, los que no tengan tiempo hoy pueden empezar mañana. O presentar mañana. Ok. Perfecto. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, este, Ángela. Ángela, sí. perdón. Mucho gusto. Gracias. Este, pasamos con Sandy Ron. Hola, aquí estoy. ¿Dónde? Oh, ok. Uh, tu proyecto se llama, uh, o tu, po uh, tu poster se llama Attitude of Heritage Speakers of Spanish Towards Their Own Spanish Accent. Y aquí tengo 14 preguntas. Voy a ver en, el, en, en Padlet. Ok. Um, a ver qué hay. <laughs> Dice, thank you for sharing your research. How does the um, uh, heritage speaker desire to be perceived as foreign accent free? compared with the L2 desire to be perceived as foreign accent free. Sí, esa, si te das cuenta, las preguntas las estuvimos conversando durante la, durante el almuerzo, pero la, lo puedo oh, los traer que a la luz. Aquí. Ah, ok, ya, entonces ya vieron todos 14. los... Ah, perfecto, no había visto yo. Ok, entonces esto ya lo discutieron, ¿verdad? Los que sí, están pero ahí. no sé si quieres que lo traiga a la luz ahora de nuevo o vemos algunas otras preguntas. Probablemente vemos nuevas, ¿no? Nuevas sí, vamos a ver las nuevas. Sí, no sabía. Gracias por decirme. Ok. Eh, vamos a ver. Acá abajo también hay uno en tus videos. Dice, no sé si vieron eso, pero dice, Ayúdame. Inferiority Complex. ¿Sí la vieron o no? Sí. Los del video también. Ok, perfecto. Entonces, vamos a preguntas ahorita <ríe> que están aquí. Este, ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta este, para Sandy sobre eh, el acento, verdad? Um, ¿Alguien alguna? ¿Nos quieres decir un poquitito de tu, de tu mientras este, hacemos unas preguntas aquí de tu proyecto? Sí, perfecto. Uh -huh. Bueno, quería comentar un poco sobre lo que, eh, lo que habíamos estado conversando en el almuerzo, sobre eh, la... la la relación que existe entre que los alumnos, los alumnos de herencia, se, muchos tienen el, el, lo que se llama el complejo de inferioridad uh -huh. sobre, su, sobre su acento y, y que no se debe tomar en cuenta en el aula de clase que, algunas, o sea, que tener el acento nativo es la normativa. Entonces, uh -huh. eh, parte de la razón por la cual eh, 
quise hacer este proyecto es porque en vez, de, en vez de decir, ah, sí, los chicos quieren sonar como plantas nativos o no, en vez de asumir que esa es lo, eso es lo que se espera, entonces, ¿por qué no mejor uh, preguntar y realmente ver si es lo que ellos quieren hacer? Eh, en, realmente no, el objetivo no es como para que ese sea el, la normativa, el, el, el sonar como hablante nativo, sino simplemente ver cuál es la, la actitud que ellos tienen. Ya para otros estudios posteriores sobre cómo, so, cómo se perciben ellos mismos entre, entre ellos, digamos, de, con diferentes niveles, los chicos más um, de, de niveles más avanzados a, a los de nivel de proficiencia menores, y, e incluso cómo, cómo los perciben eh, los hablantes monolingües o, o bilingües que no son hablantes de herencia. Entonces, con diferentes grupos, cómo se perciben unos a otros y, y qué, cuál es la influencia de, de esas percepciones en ellos mismos. Y en tu estudio, ¿qué, ¿cuál fue tu resultado? ¿Qué fue lo que, lo que conseguiste? Sí, en, en el estudio, eh, los resultados iniciales, digamos, o más um, básicos que se pueden hacer sin correlación es que, que sí, en general, tanto que los chicos quieren ellos mismos para, para la percepción propia sonar como hablantes nativos, es casi, casi un del 1 al 6, casi el 6, la media, e incluso quieren que los demás hablantes los escuchen y que ellos que los escuchen y los perciban como hablantes nativos. Eh, también sobre su, su nivel de ansiedad, Uh -huh. eh, es un nivel relativamente alto, uh -huh. digamos, mayormente 4 de 6. Eh, por cierto, todas estas, la mayor, todas estas preguntas salieron del Bilingual Language Profile. Eh, la, el cuestionario ya estaba validado, entonces este, se utiliza okay. ese. Uh -huh. Y es, en general esa es la percepción de ellos. Ya por cuestiones de... Eh, si tiene que ver con ansiedad, si tiene que ver con eh, cuánto usan, también eso lo conversamos en, el, en las preguntas, en los comentarios, ¿cuánto us, ¿cuál es la influencia de qué tanto español usan en casa o en diferentes, eh, en diferentes áreas? Que si tiene que ver eso con o no, con, con que quieran ellos ser percibidos como hablantes nativos. Entonces, eh, lo interesante es que, como sabemos, mayormente los hablantes de herencia hablan español eh, en casa, mayormente, y en las otras, en el trabajo, en la escuela, y es conforme van avanzando y pues, que son adultos, ya no tanto usan el español. Eso también sale en el resultado, y, pero no hay ninguna, no, no salió ninguna influencia en que entre más hablan español en casa, tiene que ver con que más quieren ser percibidos o no, como hablantes nativos. Entonces, probablemente tenga que ver con cuestiones de que el ambiente en casa es un ambiente seguro, por lo que no importa cómo suenes, no importa si haces code switching o no. Entonces, uh -huh. eso, eso es algo interesante de los resultados. Gracias. Aquí tengo una preguntita de Tap Boyer que dice, ¿cuál es el acento que los estudiantes tratan de imitar? ¿El de sus padres, abuelos u otro acento en español? ¿Por qué este, entre hispanohablantes hay mucha discriminación en cuanto a los acentos más deseables? Sí, exacto. Ahí estamos hablando, ya nos metemos en cuestiones de variedad, eh, lingüística, dialectal. Entonces, eh, no... Este estudio piloto realmente lo que me hace también, lo que, lo que me hace también dar cuenta es que eh, se necesita como un follow-up con ellos. Sí. Entrevistas para, para, ver, para empezar a discriminar asuntos sociolingüísticos o de background y, y ver ya cuestiones como este, este tipo de preguntas, o sea, hacérselas a los chicos. Okay. Este, y una más que dice, accentism is linguistic discrimination. What do you mean by native speakers? Right, exactamente. Y por eso es que no es que se, se toma el, el, el foreign accent o native accent como, como lo deseado o como el, lo esperado, sino simplemente es una cuestión de cuál es la actitud de los chicos. En ningún momento se les, se les indica, ni tanto en el salón de clase como en, en ningún momento de la encuesta se les indica que eh, que, que, o sea, que eso es lo deseado. Entonces, realmente lo que se quiere aquí es las acti eh, per, simplemente um, hacer una recolección de cuáles son las actitudes de los chicos. Como lo Entonces, que ellos piensan acerca sí, de Sí, exactamente. Eso. O sea, lo que ellos piensan no, no tiene nada que ver con lo que se hace en el salón de clase. No. Exactamente. Entonces, en, no, no creo que de esa manera se, se tenga que ver con algo de, de discriminación. Uh -huh. Muy bien. Muchísimas gracias, este... Sí, perdón, sobre la otra pregunta, sobre lo de native speaker, eh, 
Ese, ese también es otro, otro asunto de, de, o sea, ¿qué significa ser un native speaker? Es si es un, uh -huh. si, o sea, probablemente los chicos de herencia, uh, para ellos la, la conexión que tienen con el español son los native speakers, sus padres, pero sus padres son bilingües y ahora viven acá. Entonces, uh -huh. um, si todos esos aspectos sociolingüísticos probablemente se tengan que ver con, con entrevistas que se tengan que hacer después, definitivamente. Muchísimas gracias, Sandy. Uh, uh -huh. Este, okay. Creo que, um, Jocelyn, creo que, ¿quieres que, que, que sigamos con el siguiente o, o paramos aquí? Eh, Nos quedan, que ¿Siete minutos? Sí, más o menos. Si quieres podemos empezar con el siguiente y luego podemos continuar mañana. Ok, perfecto, muchas gracias. Ok, entonces seguimos con Emily Bern, Bern, Bernate. Um, ¿Estás por ahí, Emily? Sí, ahora okay. este, tuve que ponerle unmute. Sí, es um, Bernate, ¿está bien? Bernate. Ok, um, tu proyecto se llama Using Oral History Projects to Promote Language, Literacy and Culture. Interesting. Uh -huh. Tengo aquí dos preguntas en el, en, 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 on the board already. Dice, uh -huh. um, bueno, I, I, one of them is just a comment saying, what a fantastic way to connect students to their community. And I agree, that's awesome. And somebody else says, this seems like a great idea. Were all of the uh, interviews related to bilingualism or were the students offered the option to create additional interview questions based on personal community interest? This is from Melissa B. Oh, okay, great. Well, um, yes and no. The interviews were 30 minutes long. Uh, the students started working with an archivist first and the archivist uh, was from uh, the Recovery Project in Houston mm -hmm. and helped them research ideologies about language maintenance and bilingualism in the first half of the 20th century. So since they already had research material, then they tried to identify how they thought those ideologies were different or not in their own community. And so they did have 30 full minutes with each of their interview subjects and they tried to develop questions that they thought would help them relate bilingualism in the first part of uh, the 20th century and those ideologies of maintenance with ideologies in their own community. So yes, they made up their own questions um, and they definitely covered a lot more topics because I told them they had to interview everybody for 30 minutes because I wanted good interviews that we could analyze later. <laughs> Thank you so much for that explanation. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have, alguien tiene una pregunta? Anybody have a question here? We have just about four more minutes. <laughs> um, if anybody would like to comment on anything or say anything. If not, I could just describe the project. Um, um, and and I, I just, if you can tell us a little bit about your program at St. Ed's too. Thank sure. You. So um, it is here in Austin. Um, it's a small liberal arts university and we are Hispanic serving. We're one of the universities that has the largest and the longest running camp program, which is uh, for migrant workers and their families. And so a lot of our heritage students are also from the camp program. And uh, this class, we tried to kind of like hide it on the bulletin and, until a little bit later during registration so that we mostly get freshmen in there. I, I love it to be just for freshmen. After that, we really only have one heritage class for them um, because most of our majors and minors are heritage learners uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but we try to get the ones that haven't had as much exposure to Spanish first in a class just with them. And we try to get them in their freshman year. Um, so we do a lot of recruitment with the camp program. And uh, we also go to uh, some of the high schools and work with uh, the biliteracy programs here in Austin schools. Uh, one of the schools next to us, Travis High School, for those of you that are also in Austin, um, It's one of the few schools that has a really great biliteracy program. And so they have very strong students that have a lot more experience really than our heritage learners with Spanish, but it gives our students a chance to be mentors and leaders and show them around the cafeteria at a university and how to make a university schedule so that uh, they're also being cultural ambassadors of how to manage a college education as a Latino student. Wow, that's amazing. I would like to know more. I would like to connect with you later. That, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So it is a small program. Um, 
yeah, we really only have one heritage class, but uh, in reality, all of our classes are heritage classes. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for that. Um, and I just have here a comment from Sandy Roan. Um, I believe it's directed to you, Emily, saying, una de las aplicaciones puede ser que una vez sabiendo, oh, and it's moving, sorry. ¿Cuál es la actitud de los alumnos? Entonces se puede trabajar con ellos sobre cuál es el origen de sus actitudes y si ellos piensan que sus expectativas personales implicarían discriminación lingüística. Un autoanálisis de las actitudes impuestas a sí mismos. And Marta says your program sounds amazing and a uh, great idea to Sandy. And Emily, um, they, uh, Luis Iris is saying that living history is amazing, just to kind of you know, end this, but yes, living history is amazing. That's a good way to, <laughs> to end this, right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily, for sharing with you. And we didn't get to Veronica, right? Is it Veronica? Leon and Maria Margarita, but as Jocely said, you will be able to present tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Perfecto, perfecto. Thank you, everybody. Gracias. Sí. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So, I mean, always fixing this, some small technological gaps, guys. So uh, basically, it's a real pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Encarna Bermejo. She's uh, originally native from Spain, but been living here in the States for a very long time. And is currently associate professor of Spanish at um, Houston Baptist University, where she also coordinates the study abroad program. And she has been successfully bringing students to, to Spain for, for several years now. Her primary areas of teachings are Spanish as a second language and Spanish as a heritage language, as, a, as well as bilingual education. She oversees the second language placement exam, and that's one of the parts that we've been talking about for a long time. What happens when we have to decide how to place students and all the levels that we have to consider. Her field of study uh, explore heritage language education single language education, bilingual education, and sociolinguistics, with a specific interest in Spanish in the US. Uh, so today, her presentation will be focused on core issues that we face when assessing uh, Spanish for heritage learners. Welcome, Encarna. Okay, thank you very much, Flavia, for such a nice presentation. Now I'm speechless. I don't think that I can continue with the workshop. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> it's a funny remark. Okay, first of all, uh, well, first I wanted to say uh, thank you to Coral for inviting me to participate in the workshop. It's an honor for me. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, sé que es una tarde un poquito difícil ahora mismo porque acabamos de comer. Tenemos el estómago lleno y quizás necesitamos un poco de café o té. Okay. Pero lo que quiero hacer ahora es, como bien Flavia dijo, uh, vamos a hablar sobre assessments. Y lo que quiero es compartir mi pantalla con ustedes primero para estar segura de que lo pueden ver. Okay. ¿Pueden ver mi pantalla? ¿No? Okay. Un momento. Seguimos trabajando con la tecnología. ¿Y ahora pueden ver la pantalla? Sí, ahora sí. Okay. Ay, sí. Ahora pueden ver la pantalla. El problema es... Ok, no voy a poder hacer break rooms and share at the same time. Ok, All right. perfecto. Okay. Muchísimas gracias. Bueno, lo primero que quiero decirles para comenzar es que se les había puesto en Google a un documento, un cuadernillo que lo van a necesitar porque vamos a realizar varias actividades y este cuadernillo, que es lo que tengo aquí, se van a necesitar. So, espero que la mayoría de ustedes o bien tengan acceso al cuadernillo en línea o lo hayan imprimido porque definitivamente lo vamos a necesitar. Okay? All right. so, para comenzar, um, voy a quitar un poco, minimizar el cuadernillo y abrir el PowerPoint. Si se puede. Oh, no quiero abrirse. Yeah. Ok. Right. Ok. So, um, como creo que Giselle dijo esta mañana, uh, vamos a ir, vamos a utilizar un poco las dos lenguas. So, durante la presentación, quizás a veces hablar en inglés, a veces hablar en español. Trataré de hablar mayormente en inglés, pero va a haber de los dos. Ok. Um, Ahora mismo sabemos que la población hispana... Ah, una cosa quiero mencionar. Ah, mi cámara está en este monitor que tengo, 
pero el PowerPoint lo tengo. O sea, si me ven de lado, es por eso, ¿okay? Porque estoy cada uno de un lado, ¿ok? Um, pero lo que quería decirles es que, um, como todos sabemos, um, the heritage population in the United States has been increasing. And not only has been increasing, but at the same time, the population of the Hispanic students has been increasing. They also have been the number of heritage learners that we find in our classes. This has... Um, definitely show um, interest in um, scholars wanting to really to investigate the two core issues that we're going to be talking about in this presentation now that I would like to share with you in this presentation this afternoon. One is the academic language placement and the other one is the language assessment, which are the two core issues that we, we will be talking about today. But um, before we start, I would like to ask um, everybody, hello everybody, uh, a couple of questions. We have over a hundred people right now. So um, I'm not going to go to breakout rooms. We will have several activities later on that I will go to breakout rooms. But I, right now what I wanted to do is I wanted to have your input in, in reference to the three questions that I had. So what I would like to do is instead either you can raise your hand and you can answer it, one of the questions. I'm not going to have time for everybody to answer the three questions, right? So maybe a couple of people can ask, answer question one, question two, and question three. And then the rest can write it down their comments on the chat because Ms. Delia is helping me with the chat. So we will be able to see it later. So I'm going to ask the first question and just please, anybody that wants to um, join, Please join. I think that you have to be unmute in order to answer to the question. Okay. So the first question that I have for you is, what is your personal experience with assessments? Anyone can answer the question. Do we have any volunteers? Anybody is raising their hand. So I, so I assume that nobody has experience with assessments. Hello, uh, I would like to comment that for me, the most uh, difficult is the use of the rubrics are very detailed and complex. Okay, rubrics for assessments? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, all right. So that's what has been your experience. Anybody else wanted to comment about their personal experience with assessments? What kind of issues they have? What kind of assessments have they used? How do they feel about assessments? Um, I, can, I can talk a little bit about uh, the assessments that we have in my classroom and I'll keep it short. Um, yeah. But typically, so uh, I do this with the Spanish department at my school. We have reading assessments, listening assessments, writing assessments, grammar assessments, um, and culture assessments. And we have it um, in the past, it really worked out for us to have them really split up. And uh, some of them we use rubrics, some of them, you know, it was just really like a like a, a picture bank that they pulled from. Some of them were like read a story and then answer questions. And I use this across the board for non-natives and heritage speakers. And they really work out um, in terms of letting us as the teachers know like what skills they're really really strong with but I will tell you that um, we're definitely having to tweak these because we found that having that many types of assessments being spread out over the course of a six weeks or you know a, a grading period was a little stressful for the students um, but definitely we did try to incorporate you know like I said speaking listening reading writing um, in any way that we could so yeah that's, that's my experience <laughs> Awesome. Anybody else can tell us uh, what kind of assessments do they use in their institutions? Uh, in a high school uh, here in uh, Garland, we've used uh, assessments to identify the heritage students. And of course, we covered the four skills. Mm -hmm. uh, what I noticed in most of them is in the speaking skills, most of them, a lot of them, I, I wouldn't say most of them, but a lot of them uh, were very shy in speaking. And so it was very, uh, in some cases, we had to drop the speaking skill and do it one by one, one to one, face to face with one of the teachers because they wouldn't, they, they didn't feel comfortable enough to record their own uh, output in front of others, you know. 
Florentia, is this assessment that it has been created at your institution or this is assessments that you have gotten from other institutions or from other places or you have created your, your own assessments? No, no, no. This is a district assessment. Okay. Uh, now, actually, they're, they're going towards assessments that are computer based. Okay. So uh, the, the one coming next year is going to be uh, much better than the one we've been using. And these assessments are specific for heritage language learners, or there are assessments for L2? They're, 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 yeah, they're triggered for uh, heritage, uh, but uh, basically because uh, when you look into high school, whether they pass Spanish 2, they look into the different types. There is a Spanish 2 assessment, then uh, once you identify the ones that are heritage speakers, then you need to uh, uh, see if they would pass Spanish 3, Spanish 4, and AP. So in which levels would they be identified or located for, for, the, for the future academic year? Okay, very good. Someone else can answer. What type of assessments are you familiar with? I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I, I might just be the only person who uh, is confused. Are we talking about formative assessments, summative assessments, or no, a, a assessments for yet. placement? Is it just for placement? Uh, yeah, this is what we're going to be talking about, Yeltsin. I haven't got there yet. It's just so, the, so the first question is for placement, like how we assess heritage students for mm -hmm. placement? Uh, that's what I said. Uh, this is how we assess in general. What instruments do you use? So like, are you, are you in a high school? Where are you at, uh, Gail? High school. High school. So my idea at the beginning is to see what kind of instruments are we using at different institutions. Like in a high school, what kind of instruments do you use? And then we want to get into different types of assessments. Definitely, we're going to talk about the formative, the submative, and the placement. And we will talk about the difference of the three of them. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was just a little confused. No problem. Thank you very much for asking the question. Okay. Muy so, buenas tardes. Eh, yo quería tarde. añadir, eh, en la Universidad Estatal de San Diego, creamos un uh, examen de diagnóstico y colocación. Uh -huh. Cubre, eh, pues, tres, cuatro áreas. Entonces, quería comentar con ustedes lo que hacemos. En primer lugar, el examen consta de un dictado oral. Uh -huh. para ver qué tan eh, preparados están los estudiantes en cuestión de ortografía, acentuación en ese momento. Eh, tenemos otra sección del examen donde, eh, y es de opción múltiple, donde evaluamos sus uh, conocimientos eh, de estructuras gramaticales, lo que saben en ese momento, no tienen por qué haber estudiado ni preparados, ni tenían por qué prepararse para el examen. Uh -huh. eh, es el diagnóstico y también tenemos otra sección de lectura para ver cuál es su capacidad de leer, en cuánto tiempo leen un cuento y después eh, hay una actividad de eh, comprensión en forma de opción múltiple también. Y tiene también la, el examen una sección de escritura. Uh -huh. Les damos un tema abierto, sobre todo, pues, Algo a que les involucre de la familia o de la inmigración, cosas así. Y de esa manera vamos viendo las diferentes habilidades. Lo que nos falta es la cuestión oral. Y eso quisiéramos incorporar eh, para evaluar en ese momento de entrada sus habilidades eh, de, de habla, pues, de la lengua. No, no solamente las otras, ¿verdad? So, Jose, Porque es... las otras las cubrimos con la escritura y la lectura y, y, la, y el repaso de ortografía o gramática. Muchísimas gracias por compartir, José. Y este es un assessment que se ha creado por ustedes dentro de sus... Sí, lo hicimos entre varios colegas uh -huh. y lo hemos aplicado para distribuir, porque tenemos una población de hispanohablantes, de hablantes por herencia muy heterogénea. Exactamente. Entonces nos llega gente... Muy bien preparada, con mucha escolaridad. Si, bueno, nosotros estamos en San Diego, entonces al pie de la frontera. Nos llega gente de Tijuana, de, de Ensenada, en fin, del más al sur, eh, que tienen ya cierta escolaridad, o de otros países incluso. Y por otro lado tenemos los estudiantes que tienen por primera vez 
la oportunidad de, de estudiar su lengua en un contexto académico, que nunca han tenido ninguna exposición y entonces hay que distribuirlos de acuerdo a esas necesidades muy particulares. Eh, el problema que hemos encontrado es que hay tanta diversidad de necesidades uh -huh. que no podríamos cubrir con, pues tendría que ser una multiplicidad de secciones para darles en cupo o, a, o ajustarlos a, a la necesidad. O sea, hay que de algún modo encontrar la manera de, uh -huh. de colocarlos en una clase que más que les convenga lo mejor posible. De las, pues tenemos cuatro niveles que se ofrecen para hablantes por herencia y de esa manera nos manejamos. Está entre nosotros también mi colega uh, Georgina Macías. Ella también podría, si gusta, sí, añadir sí, algo sobre esto que hacemos. Sí. Gracias, José. Eso Pero si nos falta el componente de lo hablado, o sea, cómo incorporarlo, me interesaría mucho ver eso. Ajá. Te lo agradezco muchísimo su participación sí. y, uh, sí, como dijimos, tenemos un tiempo limitado, entonces preguntas adicionales me encantaría poder contestarlas o en el chat o aparte podría contestarlas, pero quisiera continuar con la presentación. Ok. Um, sorry. Uh, due to all this, uh, the field of heritage language learners has been pressed to find effective ways not only to identify, but also to place the students. So today, what I'm trying to do with this uh, kind of sharing information is, uh, first of all, try to, um, <coughs> sorry, to provide a, a, an overview of what is the work that has been done uh, in reference to assessments. Uh, talk about a little bit what is the purpose and the significance of assessments. What are the different types of assessments? Uh, what are the alternatives that they have been proposed to assessments? And talk about uh, several unsolved issues. Uh, we will also have like a practical section where you will be working with uh, written examples uh, to identify uh, essays that it has been written by students. And we will also be able to work with um, other examples where you will be able to um, divide the students and proficiency levels. And we like to finalize this presentation uh, with examples of placement exam, uh, some resources and links that I think that it will help all of us to find that information uh, that we need for the assessments. Before, I like to uh, start with a little bit of the terminology that we're going to be using that in uh, our presentation. Uh, very simple, very fast. So the first one is just what is an assessment? An assessment, as I say, uh, is involved with serving and gathering information about our learners. Uh, a placement exam, like Yeltsin say, is an assessment. Mm -hmm. That's one type of assessment. Um, then assessment can be either being based curriculum neutral or curriculum based. And this we will talk about. So the curriculum neutral, that means uh, the assessment or the placement or the test that is designed is not based on a particular program. If it is, it can be used and then it'll, whatever, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> uh, the curriculum based, uh, base is this has been designed with a specific program in mind. And this is different between the two of them. The other one that we want to use, we're going to be talking and using is achievement assessment, proficiency assessment. So achievement assessment is a, uh, determine how much language the student has learned that in the course of instruction. Well, proficiency is telling us what is the student can do with the knowledge that it has from the language. Then as um, there's going to be, we're going to be talking about different types of assessment, which is the formative, the summative, and uh, the placement. So the formative assessment uh, is used uh, mainly to improve uh, instruction and to as a feedback to the student and to the instructors. Uh, the summative assessment is used towards the end, actually not towards the end, but at the end, um, every time that we finish either a semester or a unit. And a placement, the, per the main purpose of placement is to really to place students, okay? So uh, it is important that we know, as uh, Jose said, um, the students that we have, or the population of the students that we have, is not really a group of homogeneous 
is really a very heterogeneous group of students. So it's really important that we know what kind of students we have in our classroom because all these different characteristics is the one that it complicates sometimes the assessment. Even though that we place the students, it's still when we have it in the class, it's still the group is not an homogeneous group, it's still being an heterogeneous group. Valdez have um, used a way to divide the students or heritage learners in two major groups. I think a lot of us, we are familiar with the major two groups of there. That are the ones that are newly arrived and the ones that they were US born and they were raised here in the United States. She based this distribution and based on the schooling, the academic skills, and the language characteristics that they have. So we're only going to go one by one, um, but at least uh, to mention, like if we're talking about newly arrived, we're going to have a variety of population because some of them maybe have a good school in the home country, while others, they might just have a little school in the home country. When we're talking about the U.S. born, then we're going to find the same situation. Some of them, they have good academic skills in English. Uh, some of them, they may have uh, access to bilingual instruction in the U.S. So we are really looking at a completely heterogeneous population. And this is what it makes so difficult sometimes to do assessments of these students. Okay. Now I like to, sorry, stop my sharing. And, but everyone, before I stop my sharing, we're gonna to go to the breakout rooms. So that's everybody has access to these two essays that I had put on the Google Drive, because you're going to need these two essays in order to work on the different groups. The idea in here is that you look at it at the two essays and you decide, okay, on your group, if these two essays belong to heritage language learners or belongs to non-heritage language learner, or it was written by, or there are a mix of maybe L2 and heritage language learner. So that's what I would like to do. I don't think that it will take a lot of time because we don't have a lot of time. So I will say that I will do the break and room for about six minutes. In each of your group, I would like you to choose one person. So when we come back, that person will be the one who will say, okay, we have decided that student one is whatever, and we have decided that a student two is whatever based on this, okay? So let me stop sharing. And let me go to the breaking rooms, difficulties. So now, um, could you please let me know what each group uh, have decided about a student one and a student two. So, hello? I can go first. Okay, who is this? Uh, okay, Jelson, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, so in my group, uh, we decided that the student number one uh, is a um, HLL, uh, and student number two is a non-HLL. Um, because they use the verbs in the past, um, that's one. And they uh, and student number one was a little confused with the verb set and a star, which is normal uh, to see. Um, and they use more complex uh, words, I'd say. And student number two uh, was very organized, very direct. Um, tenía palabras de transición. Um, and then we also had some people that say. Really well. There's no you can you can go with either one. There's no really a specific words or you know or pattern that you're looking for to be able to decide which one it would be. That's it. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Uh, please? Thank you. Anyone else? We'll do a couple more. Uh, in our group, we we thought of the possibility that they were both um, coming from HLL students. Um, the possibility here is that uh, for student one, someone mentioned that um, their use of the subjunctive was um, an indication that it could come from a heritage student. Um, and I'm thinking for uh, student two, um, where they're using me, like M-I, but they spell it like me, like in English, M-E. I feel like that is something that I've seen so many times throughout the school year, this past school year, that I can see that both of these could potentially be HLLs. HLLs, okay. One more person, please. Uh, in our group. Yes, Nelda. 
Never. We decided that, um, yes, it's <laughs> all right. Uh, that uh, the paragraph one is from uh, heritage language students. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the prepositions and about uh, the conjugation of the verb. And I have seen the DC uh, with my freshman uh, students and um, we decided that uh, the paragraph two is uh, from uh, native speakers because it's fluid. It, uh, you can see that it, it flows. So you said H, uh, student two is a heritage speaker and student one is? No, student one is HL. Uh huh. And a student two is native. That's native. All right. Okay. Well, sometimes, I mean, most of the time, we are pretty easy for us to distinguish uh, what is an HL and what is an L2. But in this case, a student one is the L2. It's an intermediate <laughs> class of L2. And the student two is an HL. Really? Yes, mm -hmm. really. The a student one is an intermediate Spanish or an L2. Okay, so yes, okay, sometimes, uh, most of the times it doesn't happen. Most of the times it's pretty easy for us to distinguish between one and the other. But sometimes what the idea is that sometimes they have errors that they can be common to them. Okay, all right, so um, let's continue with assessments. Um, thank you for your participation on that assignment. Um, Okay, so due to the uniqueness of um, the student population that we're working with, um, the term of uh, placement or assessment it has been even been a problem even before the term of heritage language learners being used. And because of that, because of the uniqueness of this group, a lot of the institutions uh, especially at the beginning, now they've been changing a little by little, but they have resort to use a standardized placement. Uh, sometimes they have used Atfol, AP, STAMP, and a collection of more uh, assessment that they have been available. And as we all know, these all assessments, they were designed with L2 in mind. So what it seems to be, which is really problematic with our students. Uh -huh. uh, there has been a lot of, um, sorry, this, this one, okay, I missed one. Um, there has been a lot of um, research on different areas, on different aspects of what heritage language learners are, and, but it hasn't been as many when it comes to assessments. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will provide you a link with um, a resource where you will be able to have all the information from all the different studies that it has been done about assessments since 1989 to 2018. Um, the, uh, the study that is, has been done with uh, the heritage language learner, they have really taken two different uh, perspectives. One of the perspectives is we wanted to know what is the difference between the heritage learning and the non heritage learning from a morphological and syntaxis point of view. And also from the way that these students construct their speeches. Another way of looking at it, that's, uh, the research that it has been done is from a language education perspective. And from the language education perspective, uh, a lot of the studies where they have um, coincide is that there is really a lack of the studies yet describing heritage language proficiency standard and also the validity of the assessment that we're using, the tools that we're using. Uh, are the tools that we're using reliable? Okay, so um, there is this difference between these two group of studies or research. So that's one they're worried about the morphology of the assessment that we are uh, analyzing once it's from the um, language perspective. Okay. Now, whenever we do assessments, uh, 
all the assessments has a reason, and there is a purpose. And we can say that all the purpose of assessment is divided in three categories. They can be either administrative, they can be instructional, and they can be a research. When we talk about administrative, it's to place a student. So we do assessments because we wanted to place a student into a specific course or to, extend, to exempt a student from the course. And that is from the administrative point of view. Whenever we do from the instructional, we wanted to evaluate uh, the learning needs. We need to determine the learning objectives and provide feedback. And from the research, we wanted to experiment to evaluate teaching methods. We wanted to know how are these students. And the only way that we can know is by assessing them. What is the significance of assessing? Um, definitely. Um, Assessing is really important. And the reason that it's important is because not only it helps help us to place a student into the appropriate levels or instructional levels, if a students are placed on the appropriate instructional levels, that means the students are going to be more satisfied. Also, it helps us to have a better quality program. Um, the assessing also helped to explore and to modify if we need to make any changes to the curriculum, if we need to make any changes to the structure. It also helped us to, um, sorry, if we have assessments, we can provide information to our different institutions to create different assessments that they are just appropriate for the heritage language learner instead of relying on assessment that they originally were designed for language learners, second language learners. Right. Now, uh, I don't know if I'm going to try the breaking rooms again. Um, Sarah, can you try the breaking rooms for me? Yes, sure. We will have this one, we're going to have 10 minutes. They need 10 minutes for this one, and it's the same. So we have three different essays. And uh, what I will ask you to please, with these three different essays that you have, or examples, is to try to place these students. Uh, well, what level would you place them? Will they be intermediate? Will they be advanced? Will they be beginners? How would you place them? And where do you base your information on it? Okay, and the same, then we will have one person from each group that it will tell us how you got, how you arrived to the decision that you made to place then in different proficiency levels. All right, so how about uh, who wants to start and to tell me what have you decided and how, what are the proficiency levels that you have put the students on? In nuestro grupo, el grupo 19. <laughs> Luis? Este, decidimos, sí, Luis. Luis? Perdón. Okay. El grupo de pensamos colectivamente que el número dos es beginner okay. uh, por el uso de las ñes y varias cosas que se miran un poquito, uh, no sé, que, que llaman la atención. Uh -huh. Luego decidimos que el número uno sería intermedio y okay. el número tres sería avanzado. Okay. Pero ahí ya lo dejamos al colectivo que, que, nos, que nos corrijan o nos ayuden o, o confirmen. Okay. Okay. ¿Alguien más, por favor? En eh, nuestro grupo también coincidimos plenamente. Okay. El estudiante 2 es el que tiene, pues se le alaba su creatividad, pero mm -hmm. su lenguaje, es más, su escritura es más bien conversacional. Okay. Eh, hay muchos errores de ortografía, eh, Spanglish, hay muchas cositas por todo el camino, como vemos ahí en rojo. El, de, el estudiante 1 sería el intermedio, tiene errores, pero ya no a tal cantidad y, y tan eh, básicos. Y claramente el estudiante 3 es el avanzado, ¿no? Este, quería comentar que para mi grupo, este, pues sí también coincidimos en sí, si es que los tenemos que poner en niveles. Sin embargo, también es importante este, reconocer que estos tres estudiantes uh -huh. típicamente están en nuestra misma clase. Y aquí sí. la pregunta es, ¿cómo les podemos ayudar? No necesariamente en este, decir, ok, está en este nivel, está en, porque todos están en la misma clase, ¿no? Entonces, como profesor, como maestro, ¿cómo le podemos ayudar? ¿Cómo le podemos dar el feedback necesario para que puedan este, seguir creciendo académicamente y desarrollando el español? Definitivamente. 
Definitivamente. En, en, en mi grupo este, decidimos que el 2 era el principiante, uh -huh. el 3 era intermedio y Ajá. el 1 un intermedio avanzado, ya que el estudiante número 1 conjuga sus verbos uh -huh. mejor que el estudiante número 3. Número 3, ¿ok? Muy bien. Sí. Nosotros, tam, perdón, nosotros también en el 1, otra razón por la cual lo pusimos en el avanzado es la estructura de... La, cómo organiza las ideas, tiene una frase uh -huh. de introducción y claramente uh -huh. se identifica también la frase de conclusión. Uh -huh. ¿Y qué hicieron con el 2? El 2 eh, básico. Básico, ok. ¿Y el 3? Um, ese es el más complejo, pero si sí, había que categorizar a uno en cada uno, no sabíamos si, si era así la actividad o no, el, al, al 3 estábamos entre intermedio o no. Muchísimas gracias. Okay. ¿Alguien más? ¿Uno más? Tenemos que... Sí, en nuestro grupo eh, dijimos gracias. que ni, ninguno era principiante porque no, un principiante no, no, la verdad es que no, no tiene tan desarrollada la escritura, entonces el, el estudiante 2 se quedaría como en intermedio y el estudiante 1 y 3 en el borderline entre, entre intermedio alto o o avanzado y llamó mucho la atención que el estudiante número uno usa vuestra ¿no? vuestra privacidad uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. muchísimas gracias uh, uh, creo que la mayoría de ustedes han coincidido si tuviésemos que hacer los niveles uh, estos están basados en niveles que ya estaban establecidos en una universidad estos fueron exámenes que tomaron y debido al examen tú, se tuvo en cuenta el examen y otras partes del assessment para ponerlos en diferentes niveles de, de proficiency. Okay. Y definitivamente el estudiante 2, como la mayoría de ustedes coincidieron, sería un beginner. Aunque estoy de acuerdo que beginner, beginner no puede ser porque realmente tiene una serie de conocimientos. Okay. Uh, luego, el estudiante 1 se le consideraba un intermedio y el, el estudiante 3 se le consideraba un avanzado. Realmente la diferencia entre el estudiante 1 y el estudiante 3 no es tan grande porque los grupos que se le pusieron no hay tan grande la diferencia. Realmente que el, el estudiante 1 y el estudiante 3 ambos son intermedios. Uh -huh. Simplemente con un nivel, definitivamente el, nivel, el estudiante 3 es un poco más avanzado y se debe, como hemos estado hablando hasta ahora, a que estos grupos de estudiantes que tenemos son realmente heterogéneos. Por lo tanto, es tan difícil a veces evaluarlos. Uh -huh. Muchas gracias. Okay. Me gustaría seguir con esto, me parece muy interesante, pero vamos a continuar. Okay. Ahora vamos a hablar un poco de los diferentes tipos de assessments que hay, como dijimos. Uh, hay muchísimos más tipos de assessments. There's a lot of more types of assessments, but we're going to talk about three particular assessments for now, okay? And we're going to be divided in three groups. Prior is the placement, meaning that is what we do before we put them on the classes, right? Then formative assessment, that's what we do during, okay? So that means, and summative is what we do after the fact. Now we're going to talk a little bit after each of them. So placement, the placement assessment, I'm going to be skipping some of them because it's already almost three o'clock. Okay, so placement assessment, this is, I'll put it for you, some of the studies that has been done with all the different placement assessments that they are. Okay, so all of them, they are measuring uh, different characteristics. Uh, there is, um, sorry, all of them, they are measuring different characteristics. All of you has, the assessments that you are using, they have commonalities with what they've been measuring here. As you see in here, uh, there's a lot of assessments that they've been done uh, by difference. We only have one. They're all from Spanish. Uh, oops. Sorry. Okay. okay. And uh, they're uh, really uh, measuring three. What is recommended is that it's three big groups that has been measuring. So one is what is called the receptive skills, which and I'm going to take right here. The lexical recognition, the vocabulary is the one that is the receptive skills. 
The practice skills, we have to be able to do the practice skill. And when we talk about practice skill, we're gonna be talking about special formats, special uh, focus and form, dog forms that we know that the HL have problems with. And finally, the creative skills. So we need to measure the creative skills too. And then it will be a combination of the reading and writing and the listening and the speaking. So the majority of them, they have this portion that they're measuring. Also, some of them, and a lot of them, they have background questionnaires. Okay, background questionnaires, a lot of the times they are used originally, well, at the beginning of a placement to really distinguish between what is going to be HHL and non-HLL type slamming. So a lot of the questionnaire, that is what it helped us when we're doing assessments. Okay, Ferkel has proposed a model that I have put in here for you for the assessments. Okay, so there is, and this uh, model, what is really covered is the three skills that we were talking, the receptive skills, uh, the productive skills, and the creative skills. Okay, and this is kind of, kind of what uh, she proposed that it needs to be uh, included and taken into account while we are designing or developing an assessment. Okay, so the pre I'm not going to go every single one, but the preliminary consideration is the teaching mission, uh, the program student characteristics, and the course content. And then with the test, uh, what do students know and the linguistic gaps that they have, okay? What are, as we said, the receptor practice and creative skills. And then how, when we do this assessment, they have to be a multifaceted approach because we have to use many different, like a dictation, a partial translation, a grammar, a reading, a writing. So we weren't going to be reading, um, assessing all the skills of these students to really get a picture exactly of what proficiency level they are. Mm -hmm. So this is um, for you. Now what I have in here, I have two different, sorry, okay. Two different examples. There's many different examples. I got one from Corel. The first one is from Corel and it's from a high school. And I'm only gonna have time to show you but it's on the PowerPoint and it will be available to you. So this one is from a high school. And as I say, I, take it, I took it from Corel, which is available for us to see as an example. And there, uh, this uh, heritage uh, speaker exam or placement uh, is divided in sections. So the first three sections is reading and the last two sections is writing, okay? This is what it mainly consists of. Uh, then advanced, a band is a company that it has a placement exam that is based on all receptive uh, production and creative skills, which is already available. And it's available from the seventh grade to, uh, to be used for a student from seventh grade all the way to a uh, university and college student. So I will recommend that you will take a look at it uh, of these two assessments um, that they are available to give you ideas. Or if you're looking for assessment, your institution is looking for an assessment that is already been done, was already good to go, maybe a band will be a place where you can start looking at. Okay. Sorry. All right. So formative assessments. Okay, uh, formative assessments, uh, we know and um, the research indicated that we do need a placement exam. We need a placement exam, but a placement exam is not just sufficient. So that's why we have the formative assessment. The formative assessment is what we do and what it has been proposed by Carreta and other scholars. And that's what we do during when they are taking the classes because that will help us not only to see how the students are developing, but also to provide us the structures with information if we need to change or modify our curriculums or what we're covering is appropriate or is not. And these are some examples of formative ass um, assessments. Mm -hmm. um, summative assessments, uh, right here, sorry. Summative assessment, uh, is the assessments that we do at the end. So when the students have taken uh, the whole semester or a whole year or a whole two semester, that's some assessment that that's the summative to see what it is that it has learned. 
Okay. Um, this uh, a final project is considered a summative assessment. I know that some, a lot of you are familiar with the three different assessments, the formative assessment, the summative assessment, and the placement. Okay. So uh, taking into account, we're not going to go into breakup rooms because we don't have the time and because it's now working from my side. So thank you, Sarah, for helping me up to here with the breakup room. But backtracking to your own experience with assessment practice as language teacher and consider whether formative or summative options were more common and what type of activities or items appear more frequently in those. Uh, can we have like about three minutes for you guys to uh, tell me? If you can, let's talk about question, discuss number two. Do you use more placement? Do you use more formative assessment, summative? Do you use a combination? Or what kind of activities do you have? Encarna, si puedo participar. Um, uh, Marta? Sí. Sí, gracias, Marta. Yo, uh, yo soy coordinadora del, del programa de Heritage en mi high school, donde tenemos ya como cuatro high schools que están utilizando el programa, etc. Mm -hmm. Y hemos variado mucho, hemos crecido mucho, sobre todo porque aceptamos el self-identification as Heritage Language uh, Speaker as our placement. Mm -hmm. uh, los estudiantes son los que they self-identify as, porque... Si no nos dimos cuenta, estábamos utilizando uh, como el de Valley View Schools, un tipo de assessment like that, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. Those are literacy skills. We have students who don't have those literacy skills, mm -hmm. and they can have a conversation with somebody in Spanish. Así que creo que es muy importante ver por qué utilizamos estos placement assessments. En otro punto que hablé con mi grupo mm -hmm. en cuanto a assessments es... Um, mis estudiantes, si vienen a la escuela con 14 años, no me importa su proficiency, yo los pongo siempre en el nivel 1, porque quiero que estén tres años en el programa, quiero que estén lo máximo tiempo posible expuestos a la lectura, a la escritura, podcasting, todo. Entonces sí, tenemos grupos bien heterogéneos, pero se puede, Son, uh, es como dar clase de, de inglés, o sea, se puede trabajar con esos grupos heterogéneos, es trabajo por supuesto, pero al final el beneficio de los estudiantes es mucho mayor uh, estando repetidamente expuestos a la lengua que si es un estudiante que recién llegó de Guatemala y los ponemos en el, el último nivel, tenemos tres niveles uh, uh -huh. y al siguiente año no pueden hacer nada. Gracias. Okay. Muchas gracias. Uh -huh. ¿Alguien más? ¿Alguien más? Yo tendría una pregunta para continuar un poquito este, este, lo que acaba de decir Marta Silva. Cuando nosotros identificamos los estudiantes hablantes de herencia en nuestro programa, uno, normalmente no podemos utilizar solamente la self-identification porque a veces los estudiantes no entienden lo que significa ser hablante de herencia de herencia y con algunas variedades, estudiantes que vienen de algunas regiones, nosotros tenemos a muchos caribeños, cubanos, dominicanos, puertorriqueños, a veces las, las identidades son confundidas, entonces tenemos que nosotros entrevistar a los estudiantes, hablar con los estudiantes para, para identificarlos, entonces quería saber si ustedes tienen algunas sugerencias a propósito de ese tema. Sugerencia en cuanto a, perdón, es que escuché la mitad de lo que estaba diciendo. You keep breaking off, so I only heard what, half of what you said. Ok, Hello? perdón, es que <laughs> nada, can you hear me? Yeah. Sí. Mm -hmm. Pues nada, sugerencia con respecto a uh, otras estrategias que no sean self-identification. Otras estrategias que no sean a self-identification. De definitivamente hay diferentes y con esta lista que les, probé, les dije, hay toda esta serie de assessments que están disponibles. Y al final tengo una serie de links okay, donde hay diferentes assessments que se pueden utilizar. Pero definitivamente ellos, estos nos dan una ayuda de cómo utilizar, aparte de self-identification, que esto, que cada institución, dependiendo de lo que necesite, por ejemplo, a Marta le ha funcionado, Marta, ¿verdad? Self-identification. Quizás uh, 
tu punto es que a vosotros nos funciona self-identification. Hay una variedad de assessments que se pueden utilizar, no simplemente self-identification. Self-identification puede ser parte del de assessment, no simplemente puede ser quizás el beginning o el punto de partida. Y eso se puede compaginar o se puede añadir otro tipo de assessments. Uh -huh. Espero que conteste tu respuesta. Sí, a mí sí. la pregunta. Marta. If I can just tell you one thing. Um, no sé ustedes, pero en, en, en mi high school, it's not that we have a line of students trying to um, take our classes, or we didn't have that line of students. We had to go and recruit them from all different um, areas. Like we had to go to the ELL classes. We had to go to the soccer games. We had to recruit them because the, the HL student already imposes on himself or herself that, um, that imposter syndrome, like I'm not really, I'm not really uh, un hablante de herencia. I'm not really a native speaker, which I never use that word or that terminology ever. So um, that's not a, para mí nunca ha sido un problema, honestamente. Cuando un estudiante ha querido matricularse en mi programa, en el programa nuestro, es like you are welcome here. Um, si tienen dudas una vez que están en la clase, that's when you talk to them and you can have uh, interactions with them. O si tienen open house, o si tienen algo en sus, en sus escuelas. But that has never been a problem for us just because of that piece of the relationship, also that culture, the history, uh, all the things that we offer in the classroom. You know? I understand, Martin, because I think that that's not the problem with only with your institution, but with a lot of institutions, that we don't have enough students that we can have the luxury to say, okay, we're going to divide it in here, we're going to do this. Okay. But that doesn't mean that we are looking for uh, an assessment or a tool that in the future, right now, will be able to help us all. That is what the whole, the whole idea. But yes, definitely, I understand your point. I'm going to continue because I don't have a lot more time. Uh, thank you for your questions. Okay, so there is, um, when we're talking about alternative assessment, uh, there's two group of, uh, there is some being um, sent um, researchers that have proposed that we can use ADFL, the ADFL guidelines to, as an assessment for the heritage language learners. And some of uh, these guidelines, it really has worked for some researchers or for some heritage language learners, how it has been the case of the Russian. And the reason for, as is being proposed by Swender, Marine, Rivera, Martinez, and Keegan, is because the majority of the speakers, the heritage language speakers from Russia, they are exposed to the standard variety of the heritage language. But we know that that's not the case for Spanish. Okay, therefore, at fall, uh, the guidelines that they were built and based on L2, um, it may work for some type of heritage language learners, how is the case of Russian, as has been proposed by this uh, researchers, but it definitely, we know that it doesn't work for Spanish. Okay, so the, the reason that it doesn't work for Spanish, as we've been talking, is because the population that we have is pretty, it's not homogeneous at all, it's very heterogeneous, and also because we know that we can have one tool to really assess two completely different group of speakers, which are L2 and heritage learners. Okay, uh, what are dependence issues? And I just wanted, I have three minutes. Um, so I'm going to, dependence issues that we have is that um, we are using all different assessments, but the assessments that we use, we don't know if they are really uh, stand the criteria of reliability and validity. Um, we also know that there is not one single assessment that it can cover everything, right? So we have to come out with a combination of assessments. Um, that also there is a, 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 an issue when it comes to um, the curriculum that we have and the instruction, the courses that we offer. Okay, we might have, like Marta said, we don't have the variety. We may not have many students, or we may only have one course to, to be able to sit. And we also have, as uh, one of the um, participants was talking, sorry, I moved this so fast. Uh, but we have all these students in one class, and a lot of our 
teachers, a lot of our instructor lack training on how to deal with all these different students. So these are all the issues that are still pending when it comes to assessment as well. It's not only to distraction, to differentiate distraction, but also when it comes to assessment. As I only have two minutes, I believe, want to go to all the links. So what I did with the links, and there is two pages in here, links, uh, two slices. So what I picked out, all the information that is available for uh, assessment. Um, and I cannot be able to go into all of them, but what we did is just try to give you a little introduction of what is the information that you're going to be able to find once that you click on the link. So this is what I was saying at the beginning of the presentation. Here it has all the, uh, all the studies that it has been done since 1989 to now about assessment. Here they provide you with uh, reports and with example of assessment. So there is two different uh, pages with about nine, uh, the Ohio Department of Education has several assessments uh, for you to look at it. So I will just recommend that you go through the links and see because everybody's going to be looking at these links, everybody's going to be using it differently. It's going to be needing different information from all the links, but at least uh, we don't have to start from scratch. The idea that there is information in there, there is assessments in there, there are examples in there that it can help us do our work. Well, I'm sorry, too fast. All right. Muchas gracias por su participación. I think I have questions. If you have questions for. Muchas gracias por toda esta información tan importante y vamos a tratar de aplicar, mm -hmm. aplicarla lo mejor posible. Okay. En, en su universidad, ¿qué, qué, pro, ¿qué tipo de asesoría usan para uh, placement. Okay. En mi universidad um, tenemos solamente una clase de heritage mm -hmm. en la universidad donde estoy ahora. Mm -hmm. Solamente tenemos una. Y ha sido recientemente que he podido utilizar an assessment. Okay. Quiere decir, ahora mismo tenemos un placement exam que está basado en el que trabajamos uh, la doctora Marta Ferclock, la doctora Belpoliti y myself. Okay. Quiere decir, eso es lo que utilizamos, el placement que utilizamos para poner a los estudiantes. Pero, como Marta dijo, no tengo el lujo de decidir porque hasta ahora solamente tengo una clase. Y creo que uno de los posters, uh, no recuerdo exactamente cómo se llama, Michael, creo Michael, que estaba hablando un poco la idea, estamos trabajando más o menos lo mismo. Hemos empezado con un grupo, entonces trabajamos del grupo de arriba yendo a tratar para establecer diferentes niveles, pero todo va a tratar, va a depender de si tenemos o no tenemos la población. Tenemos la población, pero no para poder tener demasiadas dos clases. Gracias. Entonces, los, entonces, cualquier alumno que se autoidentifique entra a la clase. No es autoidentificarse, sino que ellos toman un placement exam. Y el placement exam está hecho de varias partes. Primero tienen un background, luego tienen uh, receptives, vocabulario, tienen um, perdón, un dictado, tienen escritura, tienen lectura, se les mide todo. Okay. Luego, basándose en eso, solamente hay una clase, eso es cierto, aunque se mide y la clase que la que empiezan es un nivel 3000. Uh -huh. Si no están, dependiendo del puntaje que saquen en este nivel, se van a quedar en la clase 3000 y si no los tenemos que poner en una clase 2000. Esa clase 2000 no es una clase que está hecha solamente para las hablantes de aquí. Gracias. Una clase mixta. Okay. Encarna, ¿Sí? una persona preguntaba, bueno, y, en, un... Algunos hicieron la observación que no todos los links que tienes están funcionando. Y yo okay. creo que alguien dijo que el de Avanti no. Pero alguien dijo este, que si nos les puedes dar información de dónde puedes encontrar esos assessment, placement assessments al que te refieres. Ok, el, okay, el de Corel, uh, el primero que refería assessments, el del high school está en Corel. Uh, en el OER son open resources, 
¿okay? Y el segundo, el de Aban, el link debe de funcionar. Um, déjame un momento. Déjame, Dicen ando. el del cuadernillo. El del cuadernillo. El, sí. del, el de cuadernillo son los mismos que están aquí. Ok. Ok. So, hyperlink. Uh, y el de Aban. Está funcionando. Oh, un momentito. Acabo de poner en el, en el chat el link a la página de, de Coral donde tenemos los dos. Yes, se puede poner de Coral y Aban, porque en el Coral es, están los dos. Está Aban y está Coral. Uh -huh. El de High School y el que se puede utilizar para los demás. Uh -huh. oh. ¿Alguna pregunta más? Tenemos un par. Ok. Este, otra pregunta que se hicieron después de lo que hiciste del online placement exam for heritage students, este, comentarios que hicieron que algunos aceptan a cualquiera que quiere venir, pero otros querían saber, este, si se enfocan más en la parte escrita o se enfocan más en la parte auditiva, más o menos qué es lo que se usa y entonces sería interesante saber cuál es vuestra idea de ello. La parte escrita, la parte auditiva o el habla para colocarlos. Uh, yo creo que debe de ser una combinación de todos para saber exactamente qué es lo que estamos, qué, a qué nivel están los estudiantes. Porque tenemos una diferencia niveles de estudiantes y tenemos estudiantes con diferentes niveles de proficiencia. Algunos pueden escribir, quiere decir que si solamente lo basamos en la escritura, no estamos siendo justos. Si solamente lo basamos en la oralidad, tampoco estamos midiendo realmente. Eso debe de ser una combinación de todo. Más preguntas. Y otros también comentaron este, que les sorprende un poco el poder tener tres años de, de clases para estudiantes de herencia. Yo sé que tú dices que tienes uno. Nosotros ya por suerte tenemos beginners and intermediate y luego ya otro avanzado y uno nuevo avanzado, aún más avanzado que va a venir. Uh -huh. uh, no entiendo lo que te refieres, tres años. Sí, ellos quieren saber. Bueno, muchas veces piensas en high school. Uh -huh. es, un, tienes beginners, then intermediate. Y then maybe you go into pre-AP o AP. Uh -huh. Pero ellos quieren saber cómo, cómo, cuántos años haría falta. Y yo creo que Mar, este, Marta, no, no recuerdo quién le contestó, que un dominio avanzado son cinco a seis años. Pero yo no sé si eso es para Heritage Learners o para L2 Learners. Fue mi respuesta. Ah, Hay un sí. estudio de Sara ah. Madre, donde ella hace un análisis de varios, de varios tipos de estudiantes en su institución en Arizona, uh -huh. y la, la conclusión que llega es que si lo que se está esperando es un dominio avanzado de prácticamente nivel universitario, no. realmente los estudiantes tienen que completar no solamente un major de cuatro o cinco años, sino incluso un posgrado. Es decir, son realmente, o sea, es un tiempo largo para una adquisición completa de nivel académico muy avanzado. Es exactamente el mismo estudio que me iba a referir. Uh -huh. de Quiere decir, depende de lo que estemos buscando realmente que el estudiante. Uh -huh. uh, la última pregunta que tengo para ustedes, si no hay más preguntas, Delmi, ¿hay más preguntas? No. Ok, so, uh, he puesto, ¿todavía pueden ver mi pantalla o no? Sí. Ok, so there is an active thought. Can a single instrument adequately serve native speakers and non-native speakers alike? Any comment? Yo diría que no, porque las necesidades de... Los hablantes por herencia son muy distintas de las de los estudiantes L2, que, son, que no conocen nada de la lengua. Sí, yo creo que casi todo el mundo contesta que no y alguien dice depende, que depende de lo que uno está asesorando. Ahora, hay una cosa que yo voy a comentar en Carna, 
Y por favor. Y es que muchas veces cuando hablamos native speakers and non-native speakers, we start throwing in a huge bunch. Mm -hmm. ¿Eh? Y realmente incluso cuando decimos, here in the States, your English is our language, okay. But there's a huge range of variety with English speakers. And I think that that's one thing that we have to take into account. Si decimos L2 or decimos heritage language, la gama es tremenda de lo que tenemos. Sí. En, entonces yo creo que lo más importante es poner más o menos una meta. En este curso yo quiero que mis estudiantes lleguen a este nivel mm -hmm. y en el otro, porque es que es enorme la variedad que tenemos. Exactamente. Yo creo que depende de los cursos que tengamos y las habilidades que tengamos. Si solamente tenemos un curso, depende de lo que la institución tenga. Estoy sí. completamente de acuerdo, Dan, pero depende de lo que la institución tenga. Pero sí, definitivamente no podemos llevar a un estudiante uh, que completamente dentro de la misma clase va a ser un grupo totalmente heterogéneo. No podemos llevar a esperar que todos van a, al final, cuando terminamos, van a tener el mismo nivel porque todos, cada uno, necesitan una serie de, de tiempo y tienen un conocimiento diferente. Sí. ¿Alguien más? ¿No? Bueno, quiero agregar, quiero agregar que si lo que dice Encarna, si al final del curso cada uno mm. tiene un nivel diferente, la evaluación se hace muy compleja. Sí. ¿Cómo, cómo, ¿Cómo generalizar un assessment para todos si cada uno tiene un nivel muy diferente? Uh, vas a tener que estar basado en lo que se ha enseñado durante ese curso que usted esté trabajando con él. Uh, ¿Cómo se llama? Ah, perdón, no, no veo el nombre ahora. ¿Cuál era? Pablet. El... Pablet, Pablet. Uh, va a ser basándose en lo que ha enseñado en ese eh, trimestre o en ese semestre. Porque realmente sabemos que los estudiantes desde el principio cuando entran no es un grupo homogéneo. Por lo tanto, cuando termina tampoco va a ser un grupo homogéneo, sigue siendo heterogéneo. Entonces es medir lo que realmente se ha, se ha practicado y se ha enseñado durante ese semestre. Ok, y alguien más hizo el comentario que los consejeros son un instrumento esencial. Tienen que saber lo que se está buscando y trabajar con los consejeros, uh -huh. ya sea a nivel de high school, middle school o universidad. So be kind to your counselors. Es cierto, es cierto, es cierto. Yo creo que uh, eso uh, más en las high schools que en las universidades. O en, en mi experiencia, por lo menos en las universidades, es que los counselors mayormente no tienen mucha idea de lo que estamos hablando cuando nos estamos refiriendo a hablantes de herencia. Entonces, nos encontramos con que quieren aconsejarles, pero en realidad no saben qué aconsejarles porque ellos mismos no entienden los conceptos. So, creo que nos falta mucho enseñar a los consejeros en realmente qué es lo que estamos hablando cuando hablamos, porque para ellos, bueno, toman español, ah, bueno, pues es lo mismo. No hay una gran diferencia para ellos si el estudiante ya sabe hablar español o no sabe hablar español. Okay. Bueno, yo creo que mi, si no hay más preguntas, si no hay más preguntas o comentarios, quiero darles las gracias, pedirles disculpa por los problemas que hemos tenido, bueno, o que tuve, con al de hacer los break rooms y les agradezco su compañía y sus preguntas y su participación en el taller. Muchas gracias, Encarna. Thank you everybody for, I mean, keeping this going and I think that there are many things that we need to continue talking. Uh, we're going to start with our uh, last um, event of the day that is actually a um, round table, un con conversatorio actually. And I don't know, Sara, if you can make me the host so I can share my screen. Yes. Um, and the topic for this conversation started with a conversation actually with, with Carl that he told us, okay, we are facing an unprecedented times. We all know what happened over the spring break when everybody at least in Texas had to move in just one week or in 10 days 
from face-to-face -face teaching to absolutely online with very different results, but it was really a critical situation. So the conversation for today is going to be a moment of reflection, a reflective moment to start thinking what happened in that transition, what happened to us, what happened to our students, our classes, our institutions, our communities, and then start thinking forward because still we are in a period of great uncertainty. We don't know. I just was checking my emails a moment ago and they're still in my university deciding how many classes will be face-to-face -face, and the rest of us, probably Spanish, will be blended and online. And they're deciding this today and tomorrow. So we really don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so part of the discussion and the conversation has to do with what will happen if online teaching becomes the new normal for our heritage uh, classes. And for starters, I would like to um, share my screen. Give me just a second. And this is how it's going to work. I will present uh, just uh, four questions for all the presenters that participated today. And then we will dedicate about 20 minutes in the break rooms so you can talk with your partners, classmates, uh, about what happened in your particular situation. And then we will come back to share ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's just start with the sharing. Please let me know if you can see the, uh, the slide. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And basically, um, the question is, is Spanish as a heritage language teaching online the new normal for us? So I'm going to start asking the presenters, Carl and Karna, Lilian, uh, Joseli, even the, the people that are going to speak tomorrow, Alana, Delia, uh, Edna, um, if you can summarize your experience during this time and try to kind of address these four questions. What went well in the transition? What went wrong in the transition? How did your students re experience and reactions happen regarding the, the, this change? And basically at the end, what, what are your plans or what you're planning to do if online teaching becomes the new normal? So please, any of you can start uh, the conversation. Um, this is Alana, I can start. So um, I think that for me, um, we had to really change things uh, a lot actually to um, move to online very quickly, especially since I'm at middle school. So not all the students had um, devices and I live in a uh, and work in a place where, you know, we have a, a lot of underprivileged students. So I think, um, you know, what went well is kind of after what went wrong. So what went wrong was that, you know, we didn't have everybody connected and, and we, everyone wasn't able to, you know, be there um, in person, like in classes and online and, and all of that. But out of that came some really great things and that we were able to um, figure out a way to connect with our students uh, virtually and to give them some support, especially those that, you know, really needed it at home. Um, and uh, the, especially a lot of my students from my heritage classes and my native speaker classes, they were the ones who had a lot of trouble with, um, you know, getting online and, and getting some internet access. So it was nice to be able to help them. So I, I feel like because of what went wrong, we figured out some some good to just start just troubleshooting and and, and getting good solutions. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then um, how did they experience the change, and what is our plan? Okay, so um, it, my students really did well with with the change. Well, I mean, at first we played a lot of games and we did a lot of fun things online to try to help want them make them want to come to class. And so then I figured out the Google form that I shared with everyone today during my presentation. I'm sorry, we didn't have time to really go through it. Um, but once I was able to kind of like fix the tweak, you know, tweak it a little bit and, and perfect it for, for my class and my actual form that I used in class was a little bit longer that included some, you know, things uh, throughout our day. But once I was able to get that, um, the kids knew what to expect. And so whether it was 
they were there during my class when we met or they weren't able to be there then and they had to watch the Zoom recording later. And that happened to a lot of kids. They were still able to participate through the Google form. Mm -hmm. So um, if we go to online teaching again, it's really hard with languages, especially to do that uh, speaking component and to get the that um, interpersonal communication, I think is the hardest part. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to continue to perfect my Google form a little bit and try to uh, find a few more resources. And I saw some today that are going to be great um, to help us with more authentic listening and authentic resources for, you know, uh, them hearing different accents and different native speakers talking. So um, I plan to just continue to perfect that Google form and to continue to follow my uh, daily framework because that seems to really give them something to grab onto and something to work from. So. Fantastic, Elena, thank you. Okay, who else? Um, I'll go ahead, this is Carl. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll, I, I'm speaking from a different department, French and Italian, um, but I think you know we can generalize across foreign languages. Um, so here at the University of Texas, what we found was that for languages, and we, we've been conducting surveys now, and I've been reading through them, mm -hmm. we lost about, so what went wrong? Well, you know, a lot, a lot of things went wrong. We lost about 10% of our students. They just kind of dropped, they disappeared. Yep. Um, the people who were enrolled, we found out that even at um, a flagship institution like University of Texas, you think everybody has great internet access? That's not true. Mm -hmm. And so um, when people moved to the online, when, when, when we moved online, many of our students, of course, went home and that changed their circumstances. For some people, it was a radical change and they, they had very different home experiences. So yeah, we lost a, a certain percentage of them and they didn't, some of them never came back. Um, but of course, what went well, I would agree with Alana, it was like over time, we worked out a lot of the kinks. One of the things that worked well for me were office hours. I know I don't, you, we have office hours and they don't often come, but they, <laughs> for some reason they were, they were accessing their office hours and they, um, since we, we all had virtual office hours, there was not a lot of difference between the off dropping in and doing one-on-one -on -one talk versus going, going to the Zoom. Everything is in Zoom now. So office hours seem to be working really well. Um, one of the things I think went well was that we, we asked them that, what did they like? And they said, well, they, were, they felt grateful. Our students felt grateful in a way that they hadn't for language classes because of course, they get to share, they get to talk about themselves. It was really a moment of um, kind of a deeper connection. So even though we think that, that we've lost so much, we've lost something, we're all feeling that we've lost something in the online component. I think don't, don't overlook the fact that just act, still maintaining connections with your students is important because a lot of them are bored, they're lonely, and this, this is meeting a very deep need for socialization in them. Um, and so, you know, is this going to be a new normal? Well, I think, yeah, w what you were saying, Flavia, you know, this is the situation is so dynamic. And here in Texas, the situation is worsening right now. Hospitalization rates are going up. And at the University of Texas, they keep saying, oh, well, we'll decide, we'll decide. But they keep putting it off because the situation is dynamic. And so we're, we are still completely up in the air about how, what we will be doing in the fall, even though we're saying now officially, yes, we will have- on. Come back. <laughs> but but I know, I'm listening to the deans and to the president and all these other higher ups and they're changing their tunes because, well, because the situation's dynamic. So I do think that, um, you know, it it's forced everybody to go online and that we are finding out that we can do things with Zoom, maybe not as well. Um, I agree with Alana. It's great for asynchronous. I've learned how to do the asynchronous parts much better. Mm -hmm. I'm still working out how to do the synchronous parts of language teaching. Um, so that's where I am. I can follow up with that. Um, Thank you, Carl. Yes. Uh, because I'm also at the University of Texas, but I am with the Heritage Spanish students. And so one thing I, I wanted to follow up on what Carl said about the connection with the students. One thing, well, what went wrong, I'll address that first because that's what we don't like, what went wrong. 
-hmm. Their situations are so different. They have to help with siblings who are now homeschooled. They have to help their families keep their business afloat. Uh, They have to get a job. So that's why we lost a lot of students or even if we didn't really lose them, they weren't all there. You know, they could only come sometimes to class. But uh, regardless of that, when we did meet together synchronously, you know, we always at these um, heritage classes, one of the things the students say is it builds community, right? That's one of the main things. And they finally, out of this huge campus, uh, they finally are in a class where they feel like they're with people that are similar to them or they really belong and they have people who support each other. And so we still had that online. And a lot of my students said, this is the only class where I'm actually talking to other people. Most Mm -hmm. of them are, they became asynchronous and you just, you know, study the chapter and then go take the test. Whereas for mine, I still held class at the same, we all got together at the same time. We started the class talking about the news, what was going on and just being able to share with the other students what was going on. That was the main thing I think that they appreciated. And so, yes, now I have to learn a bunch of technology and all these apps and the Google Forms and all that. And that I think we all have to work on and it's more work for us because we have to provide the synchronous class and then create material for those students who cannot do it synchronously. But we still have to do it, I think, because that sense of community that the students get when they get together is something that, that's what they say they miss the most of being on campus and the socializing and being with their friends. So. As much as a lot of people say, no, we need to just give them the material because we can't expect them to all be logged on at the same time. We need to at least try to have a little bit of that because it really helps them in many different ways. Yeah, and to piggyback a little bit on what Joseli was saying, um, I think we'll be much more at ease with future classes because it just sort of came out of the blue. In two weeks, you're going to be teaching online through Zoom Mm -hmm. And I had done presentations through Zoom, but somebody else was always manipulating things. I -hmm. wasn't doing it. But the students learned, I learned. And this summer, I'm teaching a class. It's not for heritage learners. It's an advanced grammar and composition class. But I'm finding a lot more things which I think are are really good. And breakout rooms are excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I put them into small groups. And at the very beginning, I put them into small groups that they would meet each other. And we would switch them around every day day and then I try and then we I use breakout rooms a great deal and I try to go in every day to each one of the groups and you get to meet them because that was my biggest concern the communication still exists I form large groups I have pre-assigned groups so and now with Flipgrid I think it will even be better because that's the way they can meet each other I wish we had voice thread at UT but we don't but it's another excellent tool for students to converse so I think we'll it'll work out much better for all of us in the fall. I I'm agree with uh, all of you and what Wittenbrunn. I think um, it was very difficult for our students. Everything changed from one day to the next for them. As I think Jocely say, a lot of them, they lost the jobs and a lot uh, I have even a student that they lost their apartments. So everything completely changed around then. But out of that, a lot of good came out as well. You know, they built that that community that you guys were talking about. I have students come in and say, you know, that they're being closest to the classmates because now they depend more on each other uh, to communicate and to get a lot of the things done. Um, one of the discuss, uh, one of the things that it worked for me besides the Zoom, I wasn't doing the breaking at that point. We just will have the virtual, and the virtuals it really worked for them because, as Joselle mentioned, and they said a lot of classes what they were doing is just studying whatever they have to study, take, you know, the the quiz or the exam, and that was it. So they really have the the opportunity to converse among themselves and practice. So that was a good thing that they like it, and the discussion board also they like it because uh, what I have, I have a discussion board that is specific for the topics that we were working on it, but also a discussion board for just for them to kind of vent out. And that was really good for them. They really liked that. And um, definitely for the future, if this is going to be the norm, um, more, I uh, definitely need to learn a lot more about technology that uh, we can use online. And that I think that uh, that will be uh, something that I will have to work on my own. It's interesting because what I hear from you and I, I mean, we start with the break, break, room, break rooms 
um, I would like to see what other people has to say, mm -hmm. is like the languages inside humanities um, may take a role that is not expected from us, uh, which is that basically will be sustaining the community inside university if everything continues to be online. And I find that truly exciting as an idea mm -hmm. that, I mean, normally um, Spanish, foreign languages, we are not the big boys in, in, the, in the academic world, but maybe humanities and the role that we play as communicators and sustaining communication can become one of the foundations for really keeping the institutions moving as a, as a real uh, communities of learning. That's something I've seen. I mean, what you're saying has to do with that because in my institution is the same. Other other uh, content areas is just basically everything was posted online. Mm -hmm. They had to study and then take a test or maybe complete a project and that was it. We were mm -hmm. the only ones having to meet with them every single week, office hours, uh, constant communication, flip grids, I mean, videos. So we were doing a lot of that uh, maintaining community. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that we should kind of, I mean, emphasize in our, in all our programs. Uh, Can you answer I'm, the questions, Flavia? Sure, Edna, yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> so yeah, I completely agree with all of you. And uh, also I just wanted to point out that what went wrong for me at the beginning, I noticed the high levels of anxiety from all of our students and mm. the level of frustra frustration, not only from, from our students, but also from us. So it was really difficult, but what went well for me is, as all of you were saying, that uh, it was key to, to have good communication with my, my students and to let them know that uh, we all were doing the best that we could at the moment, but trying to understand every particular situation and open the channels for communication with all my students, that worked really well. Um, and uh, definitely, um, if uh, this is gonna be the new normal, what I'm planning on doing is paying a subscription for the gym because not doing exercise is killing me. So yeah, I'm also learning from all these uh, opportunities and uh, getting resources from from things like OEL and uh, com the community that we are uh, trying to strengthen here. So that's gonna going to be really crash. helpful. Yeah, we need to crash our website, just taking resources there. I mean, everybody. Uh, I don't know if there is someone else who wants to share something regarding Just one this. more little thing, Flavia. Sure, Delia, please. This has been new to us. We were surprised by this, wow. but it was also new to our institutions. Mm -hmm. So I think that as it progresses, it's going to get much better for all of us. I can only see it positive because they are learning a lot. They are getting things ready for us. We are learning a lot. I've learned tons right yeah. here today. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot out there and I think we should look at it very positively. Mm. I agree. I would like right. to say something um, uh, representing UTSA and um, I just wanted to say that uh, our school was just great to try to help everybody and the transition for me specifically, um, my two heritage classes were hybrid already. So we were only meeting on Friday. So it wasn't too much of a drastic change. And my, um, I, I was teaching an upper division film uh, course. So that one we had to do online, but we worked through it. Um, but just um, what I kind of like a re recommendation is um, to always be present with them. So Right away, I told them, you, you can contact me through GroupMe or whatever, you know, uh, sometimes I'm not stuck to the computer, so I don't see their emails, but GroupMe goes straight to my phone, so I see them right away, and this is for university, of course, I'm sure high school is different, but um, so I reassure them right from the beginning, I'm here all the time, I'm with you, I'm not leaving you alone, don't be scared, like to kind of like ease that anxiety. And I think the biggest problem for me, um, as far as uh, the future, is um, how we develop our online classes as far as the platform. So right now I'm getting um, certified with Qu uh, QM Quality Matters uh, because we need to structure our online classes in a way that it is easy for the students to follow. So if a student has never taken an online class, 
and we already used to maybe online teaching. Well, to us, the, the, the course might look, you know, simple, mm -hmm. but that's because we created it, right? And we're like, oh, they can follow this. They know what to do. No, they don't know what to do. They need clear, clear instructions all the time and guidance. So that's something that I'm learning right now, and it's helping me a lot as far as, okay, what do you need to have on your homepage? How, you know, what do you need to do next? Make sure that everything's clearly labeled. Make sure your objectives are clear. Make sure, you know, so I think that's something that I still need to work on mm -hmm. to restructure my classes, my online classes, to where it's easy and, it, you know, it's, uh, it meets all the standards for our students to follow because I think a lot of that anxiety for my students where I don't know how to do online. I've never, we think they're like technology savvy because they're younger or whatever, but a lot of them, you know, they, they freak out and they're like, I don't know where, where to click. I don't know where to go. What am I supposed to do? What assignment am I supposed to turn in? So that's something that I think we all need to work on if, if this continues and we need to do online classes is to make sure that our course format, everything that we build is structurally correct as far as the standards for the students to be able to follow it correctly and easily. So everything needs to be clear and not and, and have other people maybe take a look at it because sometimes our own eyes don't look at it. We don't see it. We're like, oh, this is simple. They can, they can do this, but you'll see all the questions like, I don't even know where to start. Where do I click to, to begin this course? You know, So that's something that I think uh, is just kind of like a recommendation um, for everybody to kind of like to pay attention to that, how your instructions have to be very clear in different spaces and everything kind of flows and agrees and everything's aligned with your course objectives, your module objectives, right? And your assessments. But. Yeah, I want to um, mention, um, I, I didn't really say it, but I, I, I think I mentioned really quickly that our students expressed that they were grateful. That mm -hmm. is a, that's pretty wonderful. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah. I think they were very generous in their evaluations because they recognize that everybody is doing the best they can under difficult difficult circumstances, and so they were they they talked about their courses in a in a different way. I think in a personal and meaningful way. Um, but I want to come back to what Flavia mentioned. That for me, this has really reminded me of why we do what we do as foreign language instructors or language instructors, heritage language instructors and so forth. And I just had an interesting conversation. I had to drop out of uh, the, this, this workshop to go talk to the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Texas. And our, our new Dean is um, a very well-known economist. And um, I, I found myself with a, about 10 other faculty around the foreign language departments explaining to her why foreign languages were different or what made us so different than other content areas. Because she, she really didn't understand. And she was asking very good questions. And I said, well, it's not that we're trying to transfer information from our brains to their brains in content courses. We are... Um, we now have shifted our kind of paradigm to interaction and communication. And so what we are is we manage different situations to get them to use parts of language. Um, and so what we're talking about is really about negotiation of meaning. I use the word input and comprehensive, blah, blah, blah. blah. So she listened and she said, so basically you're trying to create a community. And I said, absolutely, <laughs> it's a community, that's yeah. what we do. And not only that, but we're trying to talk about who they are as people, because we always say this in the catalogs, but foreign languages are central to the humanities. So we want them to understand who they are as human beings. And that of course is tied to their identities and to their cultures and to their heritage. So it all comes back to what we are talking about trying to do. And I feel like in this moment, which is, um, pushing us online, we're in a way rediscovering the centrality of what it means to be a human and what it means to be connected or not connected to other humans. And so I find that uh, it plays out differently in different languages, different language communities. Of course, the heritage language community, the, the identity piece is so important, but it's important for all of us and, and it's just become more important under these conditions. So I'm, I, I'm weird, it's weird, but I'm, I'm excited because I think that people are understanding the value of what we do in a, in a way that they haven't before. It's not just about 
okay, so you speak Spanish, so you can make more money, like your return on investment. And we often talk about it, learning languages in a very instrumentalist fashion. And that's fine, that's good. But it's more centrally about feeling connected and socializing and knowing who you are as a human. And that's, that's pretty powerful. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Okay, guys, I will stop sharing and I will create, we have just a few minutes, but I would like to have everybody try to respond to the same questions. What went well, what went wrong, what you learned, what happened with your students, and finally your plans in a small group, so everybody had the opportunity to at least share their experience. I hope that everybody had the opportunity to share a little bit about the experience and talk about plans. And for me, just having this opportunity to meet all of you, be in contact and start sharing resources, ideas, projects, what we're doing in class, um, it's really a privilege. I feel like, a, like it's a privilege, so thank you everyone. And if there are comments or any points that we would like to talk about later on about this particular situation, the transitioning and the online teaching for, for our classes, we can continue this, uh, this conversation tomorrow. Vamos a empezar. Voy a presentar a mi querida compañera, la doctora Flavia del Politi. Uh, Flavia is originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina, and she's now associate professor of Spanish, and she's the director of the Spanish Graduate Studies Program at the Department of Literature and Languages at Texas A&M Commerce. Uh, Flavia teaches undergraduate and graduate courses related to the areas of Spanish language pedagogy, teaching methods, and Hispanic linguistics. Her primary areas of research include Spanish as a second and as a heritage language, curriculum design, and Spanish sociolinguistics. So we're very lucky today to have her talk to us. Um, and her talk is called, find the right name, Core <laughs> Issues in SHL. Oh no, that was yesterday, oh, I'm sorry. That was yesterday. <laughs> that was yesterday. I lost it. Mapping for Success, Alignment in the Spanish Heritage Curriculum. Gracias, Flavia. No, gracias, Jocely. Thank you for su such a nice um, presentation, and I'm really happy to be with all of you uh, today. Um, I want to start with a disclaimer. My presentation and my materials are all in Spanish. Uh, we'll do some translanguaging, but I believe that if we really want our own students to be proud of the language that they speak at home, uh, we need to start creating materials and creating positioning of using Spanish in academic settings all the time. So uh, this is start, something that started um, in, my, uh, in, in my consideration a year ago. And what happened is that during the spring semester, I had the, the opportunity to teach heritage languages in my institution in a postgraduate class. And the graduate students themselves told me that we were using 98% of readings videos, podcasts, using the class as resources, everything was in English. Only 2% of the materials, the academic materials that we had were in Spanish. So mm -hmm. I think that we need to change that. So that's my disclaimer for today. And I'm sorry if you have people with uh, limited skills understanding Spanish, I will be translating some pieces. There will be some translanguaging, but basically I want to start uh, a strong, uh, making a strong case for Spanish in the academia. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to share my screen and we'll start with a traditional, very um, old fashioned PowerPoint. Muy bien. Eh, creo que algunos de ustedes preguntaron y comentaron sobre la imagen. Um, y efectivamente es el momento en que la nave espacial es SpaceX está conectándose con la Estación Espacial Internacional y esos últimos momentos del acercamiento fueron sumamente lentos. Tardaron más de 15 minutos en recorrer dos metros de distancia porque tenían que estar seguros que la alineación fuera perfecta antes de poder conectar ambos componentes. Y creo que eh, es una buena metáfora sobre el tema que quiero a, hablar eh, con ustedes hoy, que es justamente la cuestión de cómo alineamos nuestro currículum en todos los niveles. No solamente en el nivel de un programa general, 
no solamente en el nivel de un curso, sino en las propias unidades y los planes de elección, porque creo que realmente la buena alineación es lo que lleva a tener éxito en nuestras clases. Bien, eh, como pueden ver, en la presentación, así como los materiales del cuadernillo, están bajo la licencia de Creative Commons, entonces pueden compartirlos, pueden utilizarlos, pueden uh, transformarlos también. Para finalizar eh, esta sesión, me gustaría que para todos ustedes fuera mucho más claro el tipo de desafíos que enfrentamos en el momento de hacer diseño curricular para las clases de herencia. Eh, también quisiera que todos pudiéramos uh, explicar y uh, de alguna manera eh, compartir la importancia de la alineación al armar cualquier tipo de estructura programática desde la lección que hacemos para cada día de clase hasta la idea de un programa general que abarque dos, tres, cuatro, cinco niveles de, de, de cursos de herencia. Y por último, espero que todos puedan estar familiarizados y se acostumbren a utilizar mapas curriculares como una herramienta sumamente útil a la hora de realizar alineación. Entonces, uh, teníamos una actividad de pretaller. yo sé que ayer fue un día largo y fue un poco injusto pretender tener una tarea extra, pero la idea central, y pueden revisarlo en, en el momento del, del almuerzo o quizás más tarde, era de alguna manera enfocar los conocimientos previos que ustedes poseen sobre diseño curricular, sobre conceptos básicos como eh, mapa curricular, como alineación, articulación, secuenciación, y ver un poco algunas de las reflexiones que han hecho eh, autores y académicos. Entonces, lo que vamos a desarrollar a partir de ahora son básicamente seis grandes puntos. Mi parte va a ser breve porque quiero que le dediquemos un periodo largo de tiempo de esta presentación a las dos actividades, la actividad B, que es un análisis de caso, y la actividad C, que es un um, primer intento de hacer el uso de un mapa curricular para desarrollar una unidad pensando en el español de herencia. Entonces, uh, sin más comentarios... Si alguien me preguntara cuáles son los, los desafíos, y como todo desafío también las posibilidades que aparecen ante, ante situaciones digamos, desafiantes, cuando intentamos o necesitamos realizar currículo para, los, para el español de herencia, hay una serie de razones que son desafiantes. ¿sí? Primero, y algo que comentamos ayer, creo que entre todos, tanto la presentación de Lana como la presentación de Encarna, eh, algo que fuimos comentando eh, en las mesas, y algo que todos ustedes ya saben es que contamos con una diversidad muy amplia de aprendientes. Es decir, ustedes vieron el esquema que presenta Valdés, ya muy temprano en los noventas, donde ella reconoce al mismo siete grupos posibles de estudiantes, y que normalmente tenemos esos siete grupos juntos en la misma, en la misma clase. Um, relacionado con esto, es que no tenemos niveles estandarizados para definir justamente qué tipo de estudiante estamos encontrando en la clase. Lo que para mí es un nivel principiante, para otra persona puede ser un nivel intermedio, intermedio avanzado, eh, avanzado, y creo que la cuestión central es que seguimos intentando, y yo esto lo veo como un problema serio, intentando acomodar los modelos de proficiencia, de competencia lingüística, de competencia cultural, de los hablantes y estudiantes de segunda lengua, o de foreign languages, como ustedes prefieran, al, 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 a otro grupo poblacional que son los hablantes de herencia. Y yo lo que siento es querer encajar algo que funciona bien para un cierto tipo de, de población, tratar de encajarlo con un grupo que no se adecua claramente. Eh, y podemos hacer un largo debate sobre esto, pero es obvio que, digamos, cuando ustedes intentan tomar una rúbrica de lo que es, por ejemplo, un intermedio alto en el modelo de Axfold, eh, no, no queda demasiado claro qué estudiante de herencia entraría allí y siempre escaparían eh, habilidades, ¿sí? siempre habría tipo de conocimientos que la rúbrica y la descripción de Axfold no representan. Otro problema que tenemos en el momento de organizar o desarrollar currículo es que lamentablemente en la mayoría o en la gran mayoría de las instituciones nos encontramos que hay un número limitado de cursos o de secuencias de cursos y que estén dedicados solamente a los estudiantes de herencia. Normalmente, y les digo datos de una encuesta que hice en Texas, eh, de 75 universidades de todo el estado y colleges, ¿sí? grandes, grandes unidades de colleges, es decir, educación terciaria. 
que eh, tenían cursos de herencia, el 78% tenían solamente uno a dos cursos, muchos no tenían, y solamente tres instituciones tenían más de tres niveles, es decir, una secuencia de al menos in inicial, intermedio, avanzado. Eh, entonces, ese es un problema a la hora de diseñar y querer realizar currículo, porque podemos hacer un currículo perfecto para un curso, un nivel, y luego ese estudiante tiene que irse a una clase de segunda lengua o de world languages, ¿sí? y ahí la, la, el diseño curricular fracasa. Eh, volviendo otra vez a la cuestión de los estándares, ya tomen ustedes ACFOL o el marco común europeo, eh, todas las definiciones, caracterizaciones, modelos de aprendizaje, grandes metas, eh, están sustentando con un modelo de aprendizaje del, la, del español como una segunda lengua o como una lengua extranjera. Y por último, y creo que también este es un desafío que al mismo tiempo lo veo con mucha posibilidad y con muchísimas oportunidades creativas, es que en este momento de la disciplina contamos con una pluralidad de enfoques pedagógicos. ¿sí? Y tenemos una lista que abarca por lo menos cinco o seis modelos que se han ido desarrollando en las últimas dos décadas. Podemos pensar en alfabetizaciones múltiples, pedagogía crítica, eh, um, macro approaches, ¿sí? ya sea textuales, discursivos, funcionales, podemos pensar en sociolingüística, modelos de adquisición dialectal, es decir, tenemos un conjunto de enfoques pedagógicos que sirven, que sabemos que sirven, pero estos enfoques todavía no están curricularizados, es decir, no se han convertido en currículo, y esto en la parte yo creo que tenemos todos la oportunidad de, uh, de empezar a transformar lo que estamos haciendo. Bien, entonces, um, si consideramos que no contamos con estándares específicos para la enseñanza de lenguas de herencia, no solamente el español, sino cualquier otra lengua, eh, pienso que las metas globales que distintos autores han planteado para la educación en una lengua de herencia deberían ser nuestros uh, estándares. Y creo que esta propuesta tiene que, de alguna manera, uh, reforzarse con un trabajo muy dedicado y muy prolijo de, justamente, transformar meta global en un estándar específico claramente descrito. Eh, si van al cuadernillo, en la página 5, si no me equivoco, tienen una descripción completa a partir de, eh, de las lecturas de estos autores, y otros autores han propuesto redefiniciones para cada una de estas uh, seis grandes metas. ¿sí? Entonces, las más conocidas, las que fueron propuestas por Valdés en los, en los 90, son las que tienen, eh, en la primer, en, en, comenzando al inicio del, del círculo, y hacia abajo, ¿sí? el mantenimiento de la lengua de herencia, la adquisición de una variedad prestigiosa, la expansión del rango bilingüe, la transferencia de habilidades alfabéticas, ¿sí? básicamente literacy skills, uh, la adquisición de variedades académicas que conecta directamente con uh, variedad prestigiosa, y por último, y estas han sido de alguna manera las metas de la nueva generación de autores que posibilitan pensar que la educación de herencia tiene que centrarse en las necesidades del estudiante, ya no lingüísticas, sino en el sentido de agentividad social, conexión con la cultura, conexión con la comunidad y un cambio en cuanto a las actitudes. Es decir, um, todos creo que somos muy conscientes de la desvalorización que hay sobre el español de herencia, eh, en dos, como en dos contextos distintos. Por un lado tenemos las perspectivas monoglósicas del inglés, y con el mensaje de You need English to succeed in the United States, I mean, so English is the language of success. Y por otro lado tenemos la representación de lo que es el español en los países donde esa lengua es lengua mayoritaria, lengua dominante. Por ejemplo, México, por ejemplo, Argentina, por ejemplo, España, donde el español hablado por los, español, por los hablantes de herencia está desprestigiado ¿sí? y estigmatizado. Entonces, transformar esas actitudes es uno de los pasos, creo, esenciales y una de las metas que debíamos lograr. Entonces, mi idea para el taller de hoy es que ustedes estén pensando cómo sería tener estándares que estuvieran basados en estas metas. Eh, no los tenemos, no han sido escritos, no han sido publicados, no han sido apoyados por ninguna gran um, organización, pero creo que es el punto esencial de partida para, para nuestro trabajo.
Bien, entonces, um, cambiando un poquito el foco de la idea de estandarización y cuáles son las metas, volvamos al concepto esencial de este, de este taller que es el de alineación. ¿sí? Y um, creo que todos estamos bastante eh, acostumbrados o hemos escuchado el término en distintos contextos, eh, en el campo curricular, alineación básicamente es la idea de que cada componente que forma parte del proceso pedagógico, del proceso educativo, va a tener una conexión clara, lógica y directa con los demás componentes para conformar este continuo que es el proceso de educación, de enseñanza-aprendizaje. ¿sí? Entonces, ese continuo va a operar bien solamente si los componentes a distinto nivel están interrelacionados coherentemente. Eh, creo que es importante también considerar que la alineación puede verse en distintos uh, niveles, justamente. ¿sí? Yo puedo hablar que mi curso tiene alineación en la medida en que todos sus componentes están organizados para que al final del semestre, al final del año, mis alumnos logren los objetivos de aprendizaje que propuse al inicio. También puedo pensar que eh, necesito considerar alineación si estoy dentro de un programa o una secuencia de clases donde tenemos niveles o tenemos grados, y yo puedo ver que lo que estoy haciendo en mi clase, nivel 1, va a tener una conexión directa con lo que va a ocurrir en nivel 2, y también hacia el pasado. Hay conocimientos previos, saberes previos que estoy retomando. Entonces, cuanto más um, ajustada sea la alineación en este, entre estos elementos, entre estos niveles, obviamente el resultado va a ser mucho más exitoso. Bien, uh, elementos básicos o mínimos, y por supuesto no tenemos tiempo de desarrollar todo un proyecto curricular en, en 15 minutos, pero básicamente eh, estos serían los, uh, la, la, el diseño o la base de un diseño mínimo para crear una unidad de, eh, curricular, un currículo completo para un curso o una secuencia, un programa. ¿sí? Vamos, tenemos objetivos, metas de aprendizaje, tenemos contenidos y destrezas que vamos a desarrollar, tenemos el proceso de instruccional, la conexión con los estudiantes, nuestra práctica docente, tenemos una serie de recursos, materiales, distintos tipos de tecnologías, etc. Y por último tenemos el, el constructo de la evaluación, que evidentemente tiene que terminar o tiene que dirigirse a conectar con los objetivos. Al final del día, lo que yo necesito medir es los logros a partir de esos objetivos iniciales. Y por supuesto tenemos, mmm, tenemos otros, otros elementos, otro, otros componentes que, que, tienen, uh, que tienen peso. ¿sí? El contexto institucional, por supuesto, estamos todos inmersos en la cultura institucional con distintas demandas, distintas políticas, distintas perspectivas. Tenemos también eh, nuestra, digamos, la variable del marco disciplinar Estamos trabajando dentro de las humanidades, dentro de la enseñanza de lenguas, dentro de la enseñanza del español, y hay un marco completo de, justamente, cómo entendemos la enseñanza y el aprendizaje de una lengua. Tenemos enfoques pedagógicos, me faltó el plural, me parece, es decir, tenemos distintas maneras de enfocar la, uh, la enseñanza y el aprendizaje. Tenemos los aprendientes individuales con sus propias necesidades, y por supuesto, estamos también nosotros con nuestra propia formación, nuestras propias necesidades, nuestras propias perspectivas. Eh, todos estos componentes funcionan como una especie de gran uh, nube que rodea las decisiones que tomamos al diseñar currículo. Aquí tienen otro esquema, que es el mismo, eh, y estos dos fueron intentos de tratar de cómo visualizar la alineación entre los componentes y la nube de variables que de alguna manera rodean y funcionan sobre el proceso de, uh, de, de construcción de curricular. Entonces, um, para empezar eh, con el concepto de alineación, pensándolo como una integración entre partes, les propongo que vayamos al cuadernillo, a la página 6, donde se encuentra la actividad B. La actividad B es un análisis de caso, tienen una unidad, no tenemos tiempo de analizar un currículum completo, un programa, solamente vamos a enfocarnos en una unidad. Una unidad creada por una escuela con muy buenas intenciones para un programa para uh, Native Speakers 2. ¿sí? Y lo que vamos a hacer es analizar los componentes de esa unidad a partir de una grilla de alineación. Entonces, los invito a que todos vayan a la página 6 y se reúnan en grupos de... Um, de cinco personas, 
y vamos a dedicar eh, 15 minutos a esta actividad. Gracias a todos. Um, si tienen algún comentario, pregunta o alguna idea después de esta actividad, si por favor pueden um, ponerla en el chat y vamos a discutirlas al final cuando lleguemos a la etapa de puesta en común. Eh, entonces voy a uh, básicamente continuar con uh, la presentación, pero me gustaría saber, um, bien, ¿qué, ¿qué les pareció esta, esta actividad que revisamos de alineación? Um, entonces, cuando planteamos la cuestión de uh, alinear un programa, de lograr que nuestras clases, nuestras unidades, nuestros um, recorridos pedagógicos tengan alineación y cohesión interna, eh, una herramienta que resulta altamente um, valiosa, creo, es el mapa curricular. Eh, probablemente ustedes están familiarizados con esta herramienta, muchos de ustedes han participado en el proceso de construir mapas curriculares, eh, y básicamente lo que estoy haciendo es darles una brevísima introducción al tema. Eh, tienen una definición que creo es bastante concisa, ¿sí? porque también tenemos definiciones altamente largas, y hay por supuesto distintos tipos de mapas curriculares, pero me gustó la, la que propone Harden, básicamente, Curriculum Mapping is a systematic analysis of the content of the courses in a curriculum. The original Latin word means of the word curriculum, Lucin translate as the course, the path, the road. Y creo que esa es la idea, de que realmente el proceso de aprendizaje es un recorrido, es un camino. Y lo que hace el mapa, justamente como en un mapa en, en la vida real, es darnos indicadores y ubicarnos en ese recorrido. Entonces, algunas de las propiedades centrales del, de un mapa curricular son dinámicos. Es decir, por más que los modelos que yo ahora les voy a presentar son estáticos, son documentos, rúbricas fijas, en sí el mapa tiene que ser dinámico. Tiene que estar uh, integrado por la acción que estamos realizando en el aula, que nos permite ir revisándolo de manera consistente. Entonces no hay un mapa final. El mapa es como si fuera un snapshot, me dice cómo están las cosas organizadas en este momento, pero sé que va a haber cambios. En segundo lugar, los mapas son macroscópicos, es decir, no van a la acción concreta en el aula, no van a la lección del día o al plan del día, sino que tratan de mirar justamente lo que ocurre en el proceso educativo desde una perspectiva más amplia, y por eso se enfocan normalmente en los cursos o en la secuencia de cursos. Eh, son comparativos, es decir, en un mundo ideal podríamos todos nosotros que estamos hoy eh, participando en esta, en esta sesión, sentarnos, realizar un mapa de una cierta clase y luego compararlo. Entonces, esa comparación nos permite ver lugares donde hay desconexiones, donde falta alineación entre nosotros. Pero también son comparativos, yo los puedo ver al inicio y al final de un curso, Puedo decir, este fue el mapa con el cual yo inicié mi clase y este es el mapa que he construido al final y comparar y ver justamente qué funcionó, qué, funcio qué no funcionó, qué tuve que cambiar. Eh, son informativos. Idealmente un mapa curricular no se queda en nuestra computadora, sino que se comparte. Y este compartir tiene varios niveles de acceso, se comparte con la uh, administración de nuestra institución para que sepan lo que estamos haciendo, se comparte con los estudiantes, que los estudiantes puedan saber de qué manera se va a llevar a cabo el recorrido, se comparte con los padres, con las familias, para que también puedan ver de qué manera sus hijos, sus, los niños, están construyendo ese recorrido, y, y de un modo ideal se ve, deberían compartir con toda la comunidad, para que la comunidad en sí sepa qué tipo de procesos están ocurriendo en las aulas. Y por último, y para mí es quizás debería haberlo puesto en otro color porque es altamente relevante, un mapa curricular es un trabajo colaborativo. Eh, yo puedo crear uno, dos, muchos mapas curriculares, pero si no tengo la oportunidad de sentarme con alguien y discutir ese diseño y hablar de las posibilidades de alineación, es muy difícil que el trabajo del mapa curricular sea completo. Entonces, algo esencial es saber que la creación de un buen mapa curricular demanda un trabajo con un otro. Bien, entonces, eh, 
seleccioné este video que espero vaya bien. Es muy breve, pero básicamente presenta los uh, pasos esenciales para la creación de mapas. Y lo bueno es que ustedes pueden buscar en YouTube a Heidi Hayes y ver otros videos que tiene con cada una de estas etapas desarrolladas más ampliamente. Pero me gustó tener la, la introducción. ¿sí? Oh. Just give me one second. Okay. Ahora debería andar. You're thinking about phases for curriculum mapping now. Can, can you tell us briefly what, what the phases are? And sure. Um, uh, Dr. Ann Johnson and I, as I mentioned, are working, have just actually finished the work on this book with ASCD. And what we talk about are four fundamental phases in the mapping process. The first phase is laying the foundation. Um, sometimes I've called it the prologue. It has to do with getting ready to do your homework, do your R&D, your research, before you actually start developing your initiatives. The second phase is launching the mapping initiative. And I want to call attention to that because I think the biggest problem is people want to go right to that one first without laying the foundation. So phase one is laying the foundation. Phase two is launching the program and how to organize that best and orchestrate it based on the size of your school, conditions, readiness level of the faculty. The third phase is sustaining and integrating mapping into the system. So it's not one more thing, but rather it becomes the, the basic way people communicate and share their curriculum, their assessment, integrating with standards, and how it becomes embedded, in a sense, in a school or district. The fourth phase has to do with mapping into the future. More sophisticated, refined ways of working, 21st century replacement strategies, taking old ways of teaching and learning and replacing them with new ones, um, and, and a, a look into the possibilities for mapping into the future. So these are four phases for curriculum mapping, but in essence these are all also four phases for professional development. That's exactly right. That, what we're really talking about is mapping, mapping. So it's professional development and mapping. And, and then if I understand this correctly, re we're really seeing mapping as this umbrella that encompasses our unit design, our professional development. All these pieces are fitting into the puzzle. Yes. Bien. Um, entonces, pueden justamente ver las otras secciones donde ella desarrolla más en detalle uh, cada una de estas etapas, pero creo que es algo interesante la forma en que plantea que el diseño de un mapa requiere un proceso inicial de investigación antes de sentarnos básicamente a trabajar con los documentos y empezar el análisis, requiere colaboración, requiere un desarrollo a nivel institucional y muchas veces nos encontramos con que no hay suficiente apoyo o quizás no hay tiempo, pero creo que es importante que cada uno tenga la posibilidad de hablar con un colega cercano, un colega en otra institución, un colega de otro lugar y esta plataforma que estamos creando en Tex es una de sus metas uh, y parte de la, de la misión, eh, justamente para tener el apoyo y la colaboración de alguien al estar trabajando con esto. Y por supuesto, la idea que creo que también hay que rescatar de esta brevísima presentación es la necesidad de integrar lo que podríamos llamar pedagogías del siglo XXI, es decir, empezar a transformar y a evaluar estas transformaciones de cómo conducimos nuestras, nuestra práctica pedagógica. I know you. Oops. Okay. Próxima. Bien, como quiero que tengamos tiempo de intentar comenzar el trabajo de mapeo curricular, eh, les voy a dar dos ejemplos muy breves que he desarrollado en los últimos dos, tres años. ¿sí? Y quiero, los quiero usar como ejemplo para que vean, digamos, un mapa en el sentido más amplio, en el sentido programático, y un mapa menor, un mapa que se enfoca justamente en el desarrollo de un currículum para una clase. Entonces, um, déjenme cambiar a... Vamos a empezar con el um, modelo amplio. Creo que pueden verlo, ¿verdad? Es, es un documento Excel. 
Eh, este documento Excel, ustedes tienen el enlace en el cuadernillo, eh, está adaptado de un documento abierto que creó Carnegie Mellon para justamente diseño uh, de, uh, de mapas curriculares. Y funciona realmente bien, no es complejo, eh, y sobre todo, algo importante, es gratuito. Van a ver que dentro de la lista de recursos, en el cuadernillo, hay muchas empresas que han creado plataformas virtuales que permiten realizar justamente mapas curriculares de manera sistemática, tener toda la información dentro de, de un formato digital, pero justamente el problema es que muchas de estas um, empresas requieren que paguemos dinero que muchas veces no tenemos. Pero pueden ustedes tranquilamente explorar, preguntar y ver si es una opción para la escuela de ustedes, la institución de ustedes. Esta herramienta, en cambio, es gratuita, es básicamente un documento Excel que ustedes pueden bajar directamente y viene con un modelo de uh, instrucciones. Así que básicamente es muy fácil para cuando estamos trabajando en grupos, en equipos, las personas leen las instrucciones se ponen de acuerdo en cómo van a desarrollar esas instrucciones y comienzan el trabajo de mapeo. ¿sí? Entonces, este es el mapa curricular de nuestro programa de español en la Universidad de Texas en EM Commerce. Como pueden ver, aquí está el nombre del programa y luego tenemos los distintos logros o metas globales de que son cinco, de nuestro programa. Lo que nosotros esperamos es que nuestros egresados sean capaces de hacer y, se, y sepan, es decir, conocimientos y habilidades, al final del recorrido de, de los cursos. Eh, como pueden ver acá, y lo puse en gris para que sea más claro, es una especie de resumen de las instrucciones. Eh, el mapa se construye con cada uno de los cursos, y voy a mover... Eh, mi, a mi vista para que ustedes vean la secuencia de clases, están organizados por su secuencia y por el tipo de requerimiento que tienen. Entonces van los distintos números, avanzamos, 33, 341, etcétera, etcétera, ¿sí? hasta los últimos dos, en 483, 489. Eh, el título del curso, y luego están los objetivos de cada curso en relación al Program Outcome, es decir, a la meta global. Entonces, si mi Program Outcome es que mis estudiantes van a tener la capacidad de utilizar el español a un nivel avanzado, alto e incluso más arriba, el, la meta de el habla en el español 1 tiene que estar conectada. Y es aquí donde yo empiezo a ver las líneas de alineación. En segundo lugar, y esto es algo que me gustó mucho del modelo que, que implementaron en Carson y Mellon. Tienen niveles de competencia o niveles de logro. Y representa un nivel inicial, beginner, A representa avanzado, y M representa mastery. Es decir, hay ciertos objetivos que van a cubrirse en estos tres niveles en cada curso. Por supuesto, si estoy en un curso de nivel inicial, beginners, no voy a poder obtener un mastery, que sería básicamente advanced high. Entonces, ahí está la correlación entre qué se espera de una clase y qué se espera al final del programa. Y por último, lo que se lista es el tipo de evaluación que se desarrolla para medir la competencia del curso y que me tiene que servir a largo plazo para medir la, el, el logro total o la meta total. Entonces, como pueden ver, nosotros usamos IPA como modo en las clases básicas. Ya en el nivel intermedio avanzado aparecen otro tipo de herramientas, videos y presentaciones académicas, eh, elementos multimediales. Eh, empiezan a aparecer otro tipo de, uh, de actividades globales que realizamos al final de los cursos. Por supuesto, uh, esto ha tenido ajustes. El mapa fue creado en el 2018, hicimos un ajuste el año pasado. Y por supuesto, va a ir transformándose. Pero lo que sirvió, esencialmente, fue para ver más claramente la conexión entre nuestras clases. Y ese es un tema bastante preocupante en programas, sobre todo a nivel universitario, donde tenemos esta división entre los cursos de lengua y los cursos de contenido. Entonces, encontramos overlaps, muchos overlaps, encontramos agujeros, todo el mundo suponía que los estudiantes sabían ciertas cosas, pero esas cosas no estaban en ningún lugar, y nos permitió justamente empezar a revisar el currículum de cursos individuales. Um, es un trabajo largo y es un trabajo que no se termina. Y creo que esa es la parte, la parte esencial. 
pero creo que el, el esfuerzo que pusimos en realizarlo y los cambios que estamos haciendo tienen una importancia enorme para los logros que queremos, que queremos obtener. Bien, la segunda um, herramienta o modelo que les quiero, les quiero mostrar es un mapa curricular en un nivel más, uh, más bajo. ¿Sí? O, más, 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 eh, o menor, podríamos decir, un, un, un nivel menor. Y básicamente es un course map. ¿sí? Y esta clase fue la clase que, que les contaba del semestre pasado. Yo normalmente uso los mapas para cursos solamente en las clases en línea, pero creo que quiero habituarme en utilizar los mapas en todas mis clases, no importa el nivel, no importa el formato. Creo que me ayuda a mí. Muchísimo, creo que ayuda a los estudiantes. Y si alguien más quiere o necesita revisar de qué manera mi clase está estructurada, por ejemplo, el jefe de mi departamento, no necesito traerle ese enorme documento que es el sílabus oficial, que tiene como 25 páginas, con muchísimos datos y cosas que no son demasiado relevantes. Puedo directamente mostrarle mi mapa y simplificarlo. Entonces, les cuento cómo lo organicé. Está organizado por los módulos semanales con que trabajaban los estudiantes. En cada, cada dos o tres módulos se cubrió una unidad, tuvimos seis unidades centrales. Entonces, eh, sobre esta primera columna pueden ver la semana, pueden ver el módulo, pueden ver los objetivos de esa semana. Y estos objetivos están ligados, nuevamente, directamente ligados con los objetivos globales de la clase, ¿sí? con los learning outcomes. Las actividades que espero que los estudiantes realicen, Sí, especialmente siendo una clase en línea, quería tener descrito muy, muy claramente cada uno de los, de los elementos. El tipo de evaluación que se va a desarrollar para medir el logro de esos objetivos y los materiales que van a utilizar cada semana. ¿sí? Eh, UCU es una herramienta similar a Zoom, ¿sí? entonces la usábamos para las reuniones personales. Eh, semana 1, semana 2, entonces cada semana teníamos distintos elementos y hubo algunas adaptaciones del diseño inicial, agregué ciertos materiales, eliminé otros, y eso es algo normal que ocurre, pero lo que no cambió fue la estructura básica, objetivos, actividades, evaluación. Y los materiales fueron eh, más dinámicos. ¿sí? Eh, entonces, si ustedes toman el trabajo de leer una semana con mayor uh, cuidado, pueden ver que hay distintas maneras en que estos objetivos están siendo medidos con estas evaluaciones, y estas evaluaciones a su vez están conectadas con las actividades que realizaron durante la semana. Bien. Entonces, um, volvamos a la presentación, y estoy bastante contenta de que um, estamos prácticamente en tiempo, para la actividad que creo va a ser más interesante, que es la del cuadernillo en la página uh, 8. Entonces, uh, en la página 8 del cuadernillo, la actividad C, que tiene todos los materiales en el apéndice, es básicamente una, um, un intento de que ustedes creen una unidad pedagógica para el español de herencia en un grupo, y si esa unidad ustedes consideran que es completa y de que realmente puede ser llevada a cabo, mi idea sería que la compartieran con todos nosotros y que fuera parte del reservorio que tenemos en CoreF. Por supuesto, utilizando la licencia de Creative Commons porque queremos compartirlo. Entonces, eh, les comento brevemente, eh, hay más o menos unos 20 minutos, vamos a tratar de ajustarlos para que puedan tener tiempo de pensar y desarrollar. Eh, la unidad es la unidad, imaginen, dentro de una secuencia de unidades de una clase, que pueden ser cinco o seis, entonces llevaría un bloque de tiempo de cuatro o cinco semanas, dependiendo. Tiene que estar claro cuál es el nivel y el tipo de estudiante al cual va a ir a dirigir esa unidad. Los objetivos, los objetivos, necesito que por favor los piensen a partir de las metas globales de la educación de herencia, es decir, ese, ese círculo de seis componentes que vimos, traten de pensar sus objetivos a partir de, de, estas, de estos nuevos estándares o estas nuevas uh, metas que tenemos. Eh, y luego, por supuesto, tienen una lista um, bastante amplia de temas, de big topics que podemos utilizar para nuestras clases, 
que justamente el, la unidad temática debería estar sostenida o sosteniéndose en uno de estos temas. Eh, el resto es la creatividad del grupo y, bueno, básicamente vamos a, um, a hacerlo. ¿sí? Sara, bien, uh, bienvenidos de vuelta. Eh, para terminar entonces la, la puesta en común de esta, de esta presentación, eh, Quisiera tener unos minutos para, no tenemos muchísimo tiempo, pero quisiera tener algunos uh, comentarios, ideas a partir de estas preguntas. Uh, las preguntas son uh, muy generales y buscan un poco ver qué tal fue intentar hacer esta actividad, qué, qué tipo de eh, conflictos, si hubo alguno apareció al tratar de seleccionar el tema, los objetivos, diseñarlos, pensar qué criterios se utilizaron. Entonces, les agradezco si básicamente escriben en el, en el chat o si prefieren directamente abrir el micrófono y hablar, creo que podemos, uh, podemos tranquilamente hacer este, este mecanismo. Y tenemos más o menos unos ocho minutos antes de, de ir a nuestro receso. ¿sí? Entonces voy a básicamente dejar de compartir, pero estas serían las preguntas de, de reflexión que me gustaría que, que pensaran y siguieran pensando una vez que, que terminamos esta, esta sesión. Um, sé que algunos preguntaron por los materiales, sí, el PowerPoint va a estar disponible, este, es, apenas terminemos esta sesión lo voy a incorporar al, 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 al sitio que tenemos compartido. Puedo compartir también el mapa del curso, pero no puedo compartir el, el documento Excel porque es un documento institucional, sin embargo tienen el enlace para bajar el, uh, la plantilla de trabajo y pueden realizar tranquilamente la misma actividad con sus propias, uh, sus propias clases. Entonces, um, volviendo a la sala, a la sala común. Bien, um, preguntas, comentarios, ideas, uh, ¿qué tal les resultó la actividad? Bueno, ¿puedo, ¿puedo participar? Claro. A, no, a nuestro grupo en realidad sí no, eh, discutimos al inicio para escoger el tema y discutimos el, si el tema, la dificultad del tema, cuál sería el primer tema como para una unidad uno, y escogimos el de la identidad. Luego seguimos avanzando, vamos a ver los objetivos. Los objetivos son los más difíciles hasta ahora para nosotros, siendo maestras, muchas tenemos muchos años de experiencia, pero siguen siendo los objetivos una dificultad, ¿no? Porque o lo hacemos muy amplio, o lo hace, no los hacemos que los podemos medir, y luego no llegamos a la parte de la evaluación. Eso sí me interesaría escuchar otros comentarios sobre la parte de la evaluación de esta unidad. ¿Qué métodos de evaluación vamos a usar? Y si los métodos de evaluación van, tienen que estar ligados a los objetivos. ¿Correcto? Eh, pero tenemos que cubrir todas las habilidades también. Entonces, Entonces es interesante porque justamente es, me gustó la palabra que usó la, la presentadora del video. Es un puzzle. Es realmente un puzzle. Y si no logramos encajar las piezas, no armamos la imagen final. Sí, creo que esa es una metáfora excelente para hablar de diseño curricular y alineación. Entonces, eh, yo sé que el tiempo fue, por supuesto, insuficiente para desarrollar una unidad, pero al menos quería tratar de que trataran de pensar el trabajo a través de un mapa y ver qué desafíos implica armar ese mapa. Entonces, María, por supuesto, hasta una vez que se eligen los objetivos, realmente ahí podemos empezar a armar lo demás. Tanto el contenido, como el tipo de habilidades que queremos que desarrollen, con el tipo de evaluación, y por supuesto, eh, qué tipo de materiales, qué tipo de elementos vamos a utilizar en la clase. Queda fuera, y eso creo que está bien dejarlo fuera, el modelo instruccional, porque hay más de una manera de justamente presentar y trabajar esa unidad, y ahí es donde yo creo es la creatividad de cada, de cada docente, sí, el método que va a utilizar en su clase. Gracias. Sí, gracias. Nosotros en nuestro grupo hicimos, eh, lo, lo puse en el chat, hice un screenshot del, del, del plan. La idea era que el grupo fuera más o menos, era un intermediate students, high school. Y las dos unidades que ligamos fueron eh, Everyday Heroes y la otra era que sentíamos que tenía una relación a gender roles and gender identities in Hispanic cultures. Uh -huh. Y a partir de eso, o sea, se pueden, pueden abrirlo porque lo puse en el chat. Empezamos con las preguntas y eso creo que nos ayudó muchísimo a ver cuál en, eh, cuáles eran los learning objectives, ¿no? A partir de las preguntas que realizamos, 
uh, how would you define an everyday hero? How do you relate with today's heroes? What are the effects of heroism in the community? What is the difference between an everyday hero and a superhero? And so, so, so. Y de a partir de eso, desarrollar los learning objectives. No students will understand the importance of Latin, uh, Latino heroes in our society and how are they related to their own experiences. Eh, este era un tema que discutíamos, que justamente lo hemos, lo hemos realizado en high school, porque había dos participantes también que enseñaron en high school. Y es un tema que eh, es interesante por cómo, cómo los chicos eh, se identifican uh -huh. con el tema. Eh, no, no heroes, eh, 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 aparecen heroes que son conocidos y son populares, pero a veces hasta nombran a sus propios padres y hacen un desarrollo de eh, hacer conexiones entre lo que ellos definen, lo que es un hero y su experiencia personal de familia. Uh -huh. Es muy interesante. En el skill... Cosa que también en, digamos, engancha con la conexión familiar-cultural. Uh -huh. Personal, sí, es tan, tan sí, importante. Sí. Es, es, esencial, es esencial. Y los skills definimos interpersonal, intrapersonal y los four skills, ¿no? Uh -huh. Y en assessment lo, lo vimos como presentation in PowerPoint, Prezi or other, o integrated performance assessment. Uh -huh. O sea, que hicieron prácticamente toda la unidad. Es un no, equipo faltó, muy trabajador. No, me faltó el contenido de los resources. Pero, pero no, no, o sea... La idea eh, era unir esos no, dos, esas dos unidades porque vimos un link entre esas uh -huh. dos unidades. Y después, por supuesto, cuando hablas de gender roles and gender identities in Hispanic cultures, es muy interesante ver la diferencia de género que existe, ¿no? Uh -huh. Gracias. Pero bien, bueno, entonces, eh, para los equipos que avanzaron y para, por supuesto, a los grupos que quieren seguir trabajando, la idea, de nuevo, es empujarles a que preparen materiales para compartir eh, en Creative Commons en Quora. ¿sí? La, la meta última es, es llegar allí. Y lo que decía Asher Carl, que todos ustedes están creando cosas constantemente, lo, la, lo único que falta es el sharing, falta el, el paso final. Y eh, creo, mi idea al, al, al proponer este trabajo fue empujarlos a, a empezar a pensar en algo. Eh, tenemos creo que tiempo para una pregunta, un comentario más de alguien, y Jocelyn, no sé si hay preguntas que quieras que yo revise. Nosotros, um, Flavia, en uh -huh. el grupo de nosotros eh, nos concentramos en el tema de ni de aquí ni de allá, Uh -huh. eh, o sea, es el mismo tema de identidad, sin embargo, eh, decidimos que, que no es que lo vamos a ver como, como teoría de identidad y relación y todo eso, sino en vez de eso, algo más aterrizado a que, a que los chicos se enganchen y quiere, quieran ellos también contar sus propias historias. Entonces, bajo el, la, la, la temática de eh, Y no se lo tragó la tierra, del libro de Y no se lo tragó la tierra, eh, que los chicos... Ese libro es de, de antes, ¿no? Entonces los chicos lo ven, se identifican y ellos, hacerlos que se den cuenta que ellos pueden vocalizar sus propias historias. Entonces uno de los objetivos es eso, que ellos vocalicen sus historias uh -huh. a través de diferentes maneras. Y ahora si estamos dando clases en línea, eh, que ya sea que ellos escriban su historia, escriban su poema o que entrevisten a alguien, videos, recursos, lo que ellos quieran poner en el internet, crear... Eh, un repositorio e incluso, o sea, los, los cuatro maestros que estábamos ahí decir, o sea, incluso crear un repositorio entre diferentes, eh, por ejemplo, si lo, si lo implementamos los cuatro maestros, uh -huh. eh, yo comparto todos mis recursos con ellos y entonces se crea como que un círculo de lectura y recursos en el que uh -huh. los chicos uh -huh. ven que otras escuelas también están pasando por lo mismo y entonces les, les hace como, you know, you raise awareness that they also have a story to tell that uh -huh. people would want to hear. Exacto, y que, y que otros otros estudiantes, yo creo que la producción, que ese es un paso más que hay que dar y que por supuesto no tenemos el tiempo ahora de, de hablar demasiado, pero la creación del material es, por los propios estudiantes es, es realmente algo que tiene que normalizarse, ya no es una cosa especial, un proyecto especial, tiene que ser algo normal en nuestras clases, que al final del curso, al final de la unidad, hay un material que se comparte, que está producido para share, y que hay otros lectores, otros, otros videntes, otros auditores que van a, van a justamente consumir o interpretar ese material. Así Exacto, que, y en vez de, en vez de dar todo el textbook y todas las teorías y todos los conceptos, nada más se les, se les crea por medio de una o dos, y ni siquiera usaríamos todo el libro de Y no se lo trae la tierra, una uh -huh. o dos partes, y de ahí que ellos empiezan a crear el contenido. Uh -huh. O sea, no tiene que ser teacher center. Uh -huh. 
Bien, excelente, gracias. Así que en el grupo de ustedes grupo, también grupo, unidades. En nuestro grupo partimos del cuentito de el eclipse de Augusto Monterroso. Ajá. Una de nuestras compañeras, yo creo que debe ser familiar de él, porque tiene el apellido Monterroso de Guatemala. Y la compañera eh, Giselle les va a decir un poquito más de cómo logramos formar la unidad, eh, buscando sobre todo el, el, que los jóvenes, los chicos y chicas, revaloren nuestra herencia, gran herencia cultural eh, nativoamericana. No sé si Giselle quiera continuar. Hola a todos. Este, eh, sí, de hecho les compartí lo que hicimos como preguntas esenciales, que fue en realidad en lo que nos enfocamos. Este, si las pueden ver, eh, se las leo rápidamente. Nuestro tema en realidad entonces fue, sí, lo que es la tradición oral. Eh, las preguntas son, ¿de qué manera nos influyen los cuentos en nuestras culturas? Pero más específicamente en tu cultura, ¿no? Este... Eh, ¿Por qué existe y de dónde viene la tradición oral en las comunidades latinoamericanas? ¿Cómo se presenta o se mantiene hoy en día? ¿Y de qué manera ha cambiado, no? Porque ahora estamos en un contexto bastante diferente. Entonces, me interesaría mucho de que los estudiantes se den cuenta de que muchas de las tradiciones que, que, con las que ellos han crecido se mantienen, pero se mantienen de maneras diferentes, ¿no? Este, y también de qué manera nos ayudan a conectar los cuentos los unos con los otros y qué nos enseñan. Este, y más específicamente, hablando de la evolución de tradiciones, eh, un ejemplo que me viene muy claramente a la mente es, no sé si ustedes conozcan lo que es TikTok. <risa> eh, creo que no somos tan viejos, creo. <risa> bueno, bueno, este, pues es una aplicación muy, muy de moda ahorita mismo y yo veo que yo sigo muchos este, jóvenes latinoamericanos o hispanohablantes que ahora ellos comparten los cuentos de esa manera, son súper cortitos, pero ahora comparte, entonces evoluciona de una manera súper interesante la cultura, entonces a mí me encantaría hacer esas conexiones a través de esta unidad que comenzamos de la tradición oral este, y el cuento como herramienta. Excelente, o sea, creo que las ideas, estoy segura, digamos, no tenemos lamentablemente el tiempo para que todos compartan, pero estoy segura que las ideas que han generado son altamente creativas, son interesantes para nosotros como docentes y también son interesantes para los estudiantes. Entonces, el desafío es que sigan conectados y trabajando y hagan una unidad final que podamos, podamos ver todos, ¿sí? Eh, lamentablemente tenemos un minuto para que Jocely me diga alguna pregunta, big question que queda pendiente. Pero, de... Había dos cositas del principio de la presentación que preguntaron. Eh, bueno, uno es eh, tal vez la controversia con el término de la adquisición de la variedad prestigiosa de la lengua. Esa fue una. Y la otra es eh, a partir de la primera actividad que hicimos de evaluar el primer mapa saber cuál es tu opinión sobre ese mapa. Entonces, esas son las dos cositas. Bien, eh, sobre la cuestión de la variedad de prestigio como una, eh, como una meta, tienen que pensar que esa, esa meta global viene desde una posición previa a lo que sería el, la incorporación de los modelos pedagógicos críticos. Es decir, figura en Valdés en el 95, en uno de sus primeros textos, también en el 97, y de alguna manera está ligado con, y ahí es donde podemos empezar a desarmar, porque yo creo que eh, tenemos que desarmar las cosas antes de poder usarlas, que la cuestión de prestigio aparece ligada internamente con la variedad académica, es decir, qué español estamos enseñando en la escuela, en la universidad. Eh, y cuál es la posición de la comunidad y la cultura en torno a esa variedad enseñada en la escuela. Y como ejemplo muy cortito, les puedo decir que en Argentina, hasta los noventas, el estudio sistemático de la forma pronominal voz, con todo el sistema de conjugación de verbos, no era parte del currículo. Lo que aparecía en la, en la clase de lengua castellana era la forma de tú. Entonces, nosotros que estudiamos con este modelo escolar en Argentina, antes de los noventas, eh, aprendimos a conjugar la forma de tú y a saber qué formas tienen los verbos, pero una vez que salíamos de la clase específica de lengua castellana, nadie usaba el tú, usábamos usted o usábamos vos en la ciudad de Buenos Aires. Entonces, la variedad prestigiosa del tú era lo que eh, 
predominaba y se consideraba académicamente aceptable. Eso por suerte cambió en los 90 y la voz, el voz es la forma que se enseña hoy en día, y las conjugaciones y cómo se escriben los verbos, etc. Entonces, cuando hablamos de prestigio estamos hablando de historicidad, de constructos sociales y que tenemos que desarmar, y probablemente la idea de prestigio dentro de la lengua de herencia como una meta es debatible al día de hoy, porque ¿con qué variedad estamos hablando en esta, en esta situación? ¿Cuál es el registro en el cual estamos comunicándonos hoy en español en estas, en estas presentaciones? ¿No será la variedad prestigiosa? ¿Será la variedad formal? ¿La variedad académica? Y ha habido muchísimo debate. Lo bueno es que las pedagogías críticas están revisando eso y, y creo que es algo que hay que seguir, uh, seguir continuando en discusión. Con respecto a la unidad 1, eh, lo que le comentaba a Sara, que me preguntó, digamos, de dónde la había tomado, le dije, estoy haciendo una recopilación, tratando de recopilar lo que distintas escuelas y distritos están haciendo con los proyectos para cursos de herencia. Es muy lento, o sea, me gustaría tener ya una base de datos armadas, pero hay cosas muy interesantes, hay proyectos muy buenos, hay la creación de estándares locales que son sumamente valiosos, y también hay escuelas que están intentando lo mejor que pueden, pero de nuevo, están forzando el modelo curricular de segundas lenguas a la lengua de herencia. Y ese para mí es el problema esencial con la unidad de la escuela de Somerville, que les que compartí. Eh, tiene varios problemas de diseño, eh, la cantidad de preguntas, una unidad no puede tener 20 preguntas, porque no hay manera de resolverlas. El tema es excelente, es un tema fascinante, pero la implementación en los contenidos, como muchos de ustedes ya comentaron, eh, deja mucho que desear, si es limitante. Eh, quiere incluir demasiado y termina incluyendo prácticamente nada que sea valioso que aporte a la reflexión. Entonces, eso sería un problema. La alineación no es clara, y sobre todo no hay objetivos específicamente claros. ¿Qué es lo que estos estudiantes van a desarrollar de explicado de manera clara? Que yo lo pueda medir al completar mi proceso. Y justamente como ustedes observaron, posiblemente en la sección de assessment, en la evaluación, había una lista de posibles assessments, y es como, bien, pero todos estos modelos o herramientas me sirven para medir todo esto, el problema central es un problema de alineación. ¿sí? Y yo sé que ellos han tenido la mejor intención al crear esta unidad, pero tiene que ser, uh, tiene que ser revisada. Hi everyone, welcome back. Bienvenidos a la siguiente sesión. Uh, realmente para mí es un gusto enorme eh, presentar a mi colega Edna, Edna Velázquez. Nos conocemos hace bastante tiempo y siempre ha sido un gusto trabajar con ella. So Edna is assistant professor of Spanish, a coordinator of the Spanish teaching minor at Sam Houston University uh, in Texas. She was born in Colombia and earned her PhD in Hispanic Linguistics and Studies from the University of Houston. Uh, Edna has a broad range of experience working in the K-12 level uh, as a teacher, but also as a teacher trainer and mentor. Her main research interests include advanced biliteracy for heritage language learners, uh, Spanish teacher training, and also working with, uh, with direct, directly with the schools. She teaches face-to-face -face and online courses in Spanish at all levels of instruction. So please, let's give her a big uh, welcome. And Edna, estamos muy contentos de que estés presentando hoy con nosotros. Gracias, Flavia. Gracias por la presentación. Igualmente es para mí un placer estar aquí. Estoy muy emocionada de, de estar en este eh, taller, de tener la oportunidad eh, de compartir un poco y de aprender de todos. Eh, voy a utilizar igualmente inglés y español. I'm going to be code switching. I code switch a lot. I, um, uh, my PowerPoint or my slides are all in English. Um, but all of our interaction can be in English or Spanish. I'm gonna be using Nearpod. So probably if you were yesterday in Alana's presentation, you're already familiar with the platform. So I think it's a, a, I decided to use it so that we can interact. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen. You need another device. If you can uh, use your phone or maybe um, a tablet, or you can also access Nearpod in another window if you prefer to do it. Um, anyway, I'm gonna be sharing my screen so that you are gonna be seeing what we do. 
uh, from near, near Pocho. So um, from the materials that I have in my folder, you probably you're gonna need by the end, you're gonna need um, the material that says uh, reading strategies, lesson plan. So uh, I will be sharing with, with you, but if you if you can have it so that you can um, work in groups, uh, you maybe it, it'll be easier if you have it with you. Um, okay. Bueno, entonces creo que voy a compartir la pantalla para que puedan tener acceso a Nearpod. Um, okay. Espero que lo puedan ver, ¿ya? Eh, simplemente tienen que ir a eh, Nearpod, eh, perdón, join.nearpod.com eh, y entrar este código o ingresar con el código GSBBY. Ah, creo que también por si la gente va llegando tarde, creo que lo que voy a hacer es voy a copiar el link y lo voy a poner en el chat. Ah, Ok, let me see. How do I need to stop sharing? And now I'm going to put in the, the chat room. Ok. Este es el, está en el chat. Oh, I think you sent it just to me, no. but I'll send it. Ah, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, can you do that? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, what is the code? Ok. We don't have the code. Oh, Sarah, I sent it. Let me see if I can the send code, it again. The code will also be in the top left-hand corner when you start, Edna, so people will be able to see it as long as you okay. share your screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's here on the top two, right? Let me see, okay. Okay, I think we can start now. Okay, um, pues bueno, esta presenta presentación también tiene que ver con lectura como la presentación de ayer de Alana. Eh, I'm going to be talking about heritage language reading strategies in and out of the classroom. Um, hopefully it will be a complement to, uh, uh, to Alana's presentation. Um, okay, so... Sí. Parece, Edna, que están teniendo problemas con el Nearport porque hay un límite de participantes. ¿Por qué hay un qué? Límite de participantes que se pueden unir oh. al Nearport. Ok, ok. Ok, oh, yeah. uh, anyways, I'm going to be sharing with everybody, so sí. there is no problem. If you cannot join, I will be sharing my screen so that you can see. I didn't realize that there was a limit. Maybe okay. because I don't have I got out. You got out? Yeah, I'll get out, so that way. Okay, somewhere. anyways, all the slides are going to be here, so. Yes. No problem. <clears throat> okay, and also this presentation, my power presentation is going to be at the end in the folder. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Okay, so, um, well, my objectives. Uh, uh, these are my objectives. Um, I want us to review some research findings on heritage language reading. Um, uh, we will also be discussing the implementation of a reading program for the Spanish class. I also want us to reflect a little bit on explicit instruction of reading strategies. And by the end, uh, I wanna share with you some material that I created, specifically a lesson plan to teach a reading strategy. So, um, okay, so let's talk first about research. So what do we know about research so far, about heritage language reading or research? So um, most of the, of the uh, experts agree on saying that it is crucial to promote higher levels of high, high, uh, heritage language literacy in general terms. I have, um, I am citing some studies here. Uh, however, most of the studies 
uh, in this area uh, in the field of heritage language literacy have been, have been conducted around heritage language writing, um, specifically, the, uh, specifically about writing strategies. And I am citing some of the studies here, uh, just a few studies. Please ignore the numbers. I was trying to do something with those numbers, but uh, I decided to change it and I couldn't uh, get rid of the numbers at the end. So please ignore those, those numbers. Okay, so yeah, most of the studies have been conducted around heritage language writing strategies. I am particularly interested in the factors, in studying the factors that affect uh, reading comprehension, heritage language reading comprehension. And I have studied two factors, vocabulary, the effect of vocabulary on, on heritage language reading comprehension, and also the effect of uh, having previous knowledge of the discipline. And of those two factors, I found that uh, probably vocabulary is the one that affects the most. So it is really important and not having enough vocabulary uh, is really a problem because uh, it, it impedes reading comprehension. Uh, I found that in one of the studies, of course, more studies need to be done, but I have, I found in one of the studies that students needed 98 uh, to know 98% of the vocabulary uh, in a nonfiction text in order to be able to show adequate comprehending, comprehension of it. So it's a lot of vocabulary that they need. Um, paradójicamente, o sea, no leen porque no tienen vocabulario y, y ¿Cómo adquieren el vocabulario? Paradójicamente es a través de la lectura, ¿verdad? Entonces eh, es, es una contradicción, por eso tenemos que preocuparnos mucho por el tipo de, de textos que les ofrecemos, ¿cierto? Que sean textos que puedan leer y que los, y que los lleven a, a eh, que entiendan fáciles de leer al comienzo y que los atrapen y para que se vuelvan lectores eh, independientes, ¿verdad? Eh, de los pocos está de estudios que así que están alrededor de, del área de la lectura, la mayoría tienen que ver con eh, demostrar los beneficios de la lectura extensiva. So most of them have to do, uh, uh, they show the benefits of extensive reading. And I have a summary of the studies here. Some of the studies, well, this is a, a, I adapted and translated and also expanded these uh, information from Rodrigo in 2018. And you can see here in the chart, um, the name of the author and the participants in the study and also the results. Uh, you, you see the participants, secondary and college students. And most of them, for most of them, the, the conclusions, the conclusion is that students uh, through extensive reading, they get to improve their reading comprehension skills and also writing comprehension skills. Um, they also uh, get more vocabulary um, and they also get better in their reading habits. And there is one study by Rodrigo in 2013 that concluded that uh, students improved grammar competency, um, their grammar competency in five out of the eight. Uh, of uh, the grammar structure study. So it really has a lot of benefits, uh, this extensive reading. Pero vamos a entrar a hacer una diferenciación ahora. <clears throat> it's important to clarify some, some terminology and to understand the differences between intensive reading and extensive reading and what is an extensive reading program. Uh, okay, uh, intensive reading. There are two different, or these are two different ways or two different, um, depending on the, on the objective that you have when you read, you can read in two different ways. You can do an intensive reading. Let's say that you, uh, um, you have a new equipment, a new phone, and if you don't know how it works, then you need to learn how to operate maybe a, 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 an equipment or a machine. Uh, then what you do is you go to the manual, you read the manual, but the way you read it, you need to focus on the meaning of words because you really want to understand. So the kind of reading that you conduct that is more detailed, you want to understand every single detail, this is intensive reading, which is different from extensive. When you are reading uh, for pleasure, 
and you are just focus you are focusing on the message in general but you are not concentrating on understanding every single detail uh, the the goal is comprehension of the text and is for pleasure uh, for example when you read a novel that's uh, what we call extensive reading now if you add to that extensive reading that way of reading you add doing it abundantly about a topic of interest then uh, and doing it for pleasure then you have an extensive reading program you do it every day for example at a certain period of time or when you do it abundantly um, and those are the extensive reading programs that we are talking about um, because precisely because reading is is uh, so important then many uh, uh, world language teachers have turned to the TPRS method, which is uh, TPRS stands for teaching proficiency through reading and storytelling. Um, uh, this method was created by Blaine Raid in the, the 80s and is based on, maybe you remember Krashen's uh, comprehensible input theory, according to which the brain needs enormous amounts of comprehensible input to acquire a new language. Uh, how, how do we do that? By providing extensive reading, interactive books, and oral stories to our students. Uh, Alana, Alana, ayer estaba hablando un poco de esto, de extensive reading, de todos los beneficios que tiene la lectura extensiva, ¿no? que ayuda a mejorar las habilidades de escritura, en general contribuye con el éxito académico de los estudiantes, estimula la reflexión, y el, el pensamiento crítico reduce el estrés y sobre todo si estamos hablando de nuestra población de herencia, el eh, conectarlos con la literatura hispana, por ejemplo, y con materiales eh, que tengan que ver con su cultura y con los cuales se, ven, se vean reflejados, les ayuda a fortalecer sus lazos de identidad, su identidad cultural, identidad lingüística, eh, lo que es muy importante, ¿no? Y algo que me parece eh, muy, muy y importante y clave para esto, para, sobre todo cuando tenemos estudiantes de herencia eh, o estas clases mixtas en donde tenemos de herencia y de segunda lengua, es que a través de la lectura podre, podemos lograr la, hacer la diferenciación en el salón de clases. Reading is a way to differentiate in the classroom. <coughs> y precisamente eso era lo que veíamos ayer, Alana hablaba, de, en su marco ella... Eh, Habla del silent sustained reading o free voluntary reading, ¿cierto? Que uh, de esas dos terminologías son las que se usan dependiendo del contexto. Yo fui profesora de escuela elemental y recuerdo que en escuela elemental lo llamábamos dear time. Dear, D-E-A-R, drop everything and read. Y era precisamente este periodo de tiempo en el que nos eh, soltábamos todo lo que estábamos haciendo con los niños y nos sentábamos a leer. Entonces, eh, Esto idealmente se debe a se, el, la conexión de los niños con la lectura y el encontrar ese libro que los dispare hacia la lectura, eh, idealmente deberíamos lograrlo eh, y, y, y tener estos lectores eh, eh, independientes, empezar ese proceso desde el, desde el kinder, ¿no? Desde, desde, sí, desde la escuela elemental. Eh, esa es nuestra labor como maestros, pero pues no, no debería parar ahí y es un proceso que se debe continuar. Ahora que Flavia estaba hablando de la alinea, alineación, eh, precisamente eso, ¿no? O sea, ese, ese, ese tipo de, de programas deberían tener continuidad desde la escuela elemental, luego a la secundaria y luego a la universidad, ¿verdad? Eh, para nosotros en la universidad, y eh, hablo porque ahorita yo estoy trabajando con, sobre todo con profesores que se están preparando para ser profesores de español eh, K-12, eh, y, y tenemos eh, la dificultad de que no están pasando los exámenes de certificación, y es precisamente por esto, porque no tienen estos hábitos de lectura y tienen dificultades, eso se ve reflejado en la, en, en la escritura de los estudiantes. Eh, yo estoy, eh, como Alana eh, les mencionó ayer, eh, hay varios profesores que están promoviendo, eh, estoy siguiendo a, en especial a Mike Piro, que eh, habla acerca de, tiene dos, dos frases que me llaman mucho la atención, una es, teaching students to read is not the same as teaching them to love reading. Entonces, eh, es muy importante eh, y es nuestra labor, como lo dije, conectarlos con la lectura, ¿sí? No es tan solo enseñarlos a leer, sino es eh, hacer que se enamoren de la lectura, ¿verdad? 
Eh, y otra cosa que propone Mike Pito es, ra, ra, dice, rather than have a language course with a reading component, teachers should leave reading courses with a language component. Estoy totalmente de acuerdo con él y pienso que esto es algo a lo que deberíamos apuntar también en la universidad. Eh, o sea que en lugar de crear cursos eh, que tengan un componente de, de lectura, deberíamos enfatizar bastante en la lectura y alrededor de la lectura, por ejemplo, si se trata de un curso de gramática, que sea a partir de la lectura. Bueno, esto lo, lo, lo refleja eh, Rodrigo. Eh, en 2018 propone estos eh, diferentes modelos que hay para implementar estos programas de extensión, de lectura extensiva. Eh, ella propone que pueden existir estos tres modelos, ¿no? Eh, primero, pues, crearlo como, crearlos como cursos independientes. Eh, para nosotros en la universidad es muy, muy difícil, ¿no? O sea, ya si ya tenemos un currículo establecido y crear estos cursos de forma independiente, un, club, un curso de lectura a veces es, es bastante complicado. Eh, sin embargo, eh, se puede hacer, tal vez eh, lo más fácil sería el segundo modelo, que son eh, crear, los, crear estos programas extensivos de lectura como complementos de un curso, ¿sí? eh, eh, que es... Básicamente lo que yo estoy tratando de hacer y mi propuesta es, eh, por ejemplo, como les dije que trabajo con maestras, el semestre que viene voy a eh, enseñar un curso eh, para maestras eh, para ayudarlas a preparar, a, a mejorar su escritura, ¿no? Para prepararse para este examen lote de certificación de maestros de español en Texas. Eh, y lo que hago es eso, y imple, implementar bastantes lecturas, eh, lecturas que tienen que ver con su profesión. Y al, el, alrededor de, de esas lecturas, eh, estos, estos cursos se llaman eh, Writing Enhanced. Y al, para mí estos que son Writing Enhanced eh, son sinónimo de Extensive Reading. Entonces, el objetivo que me, me dicen en el currículo que debo cumplir es mm, ayudarles a mejorar la escritura. Pero ¿cómo le, lo hago? A través de la lectura extensiva. Entonces, eh, bueno... Eh, otra forma que se puede hacer es con actividades extracurriculares, ¿no? Es otra idea que tengo y otro plan. Eh, por ejemplo, un club de lectura. A través de clubes de lectura eh, podemos también eh, motivarlos si tienen que ver con los clubes de lectura que tengan que ver, por ejemplo, con sus intereses, con la profesión. Eh, bueno, estas son diferentes propuestas eh, que me parece que, que son interesantes para, para estudiar. Bueno, pero me interesa ahora saber acerca de eh, Now I'm interested in know about you. What do you do? What do you do? Eh, how do you teach reading? Do you have or know any of these extensive reading programs? What do you think? What are the challenges, if there are any, for the implementation? Imp implementation? Yeah, I'm sorry. For the implementation of such programs. So what I want you to do is to get into groups and discuss these two questions and maybe choose one person from the group to summarize and, and share the discussion with the whole group. So what, what are you doing? How do you implement uh, reading and the challenges that you see for the implementation? So I know we're gonna have uh, different uh, people from my, uh, high school, or college level, so I want to know what each one of you is doing in order to to implement reading in your courses. Okay, so, <laughs> no sé si alguien quiere co eh, compartir lo que discutieron <clears throat> acerca de el, eh, los eh, programas de lectura extensiva, si conocen alguno, las dificultades que hay o los retos para implementarlos. Hay alguien que está levantando la mano, yo creo. Uh, yo okay. puedo también sí. comentar, si desean. Sí, sí, Patricia. Hola, ¿cómo están? Soy Patricia, este, nuestro grupo. Eh, yo soy profesora de Community College, pero nuestro grupo son dos profesoras de este, la escuela. Y entonces estábamos comentando que para los tres, inclusive para Community College y para eh, los niños, la motivación es un tema totalmente decisivo a la hora de escoger un material para que los niños lean 
Y segundo, también estábamos hablando de adecuar el grado de dificultad de la lectura a el grupo que tenemos. Y lo otro que estábamos viendo, que justamente Florencia estaba comentando, es la extensión, que si el texto de lectura es demasiado largo, ya de por sí, en sus propias palabras, dijo, ellos ponen un muro. Entonces, es importante el, el, la extensión, la motivación y que se adecue eh, al nivel de los alumnos. Y en mi caso, que yo enseño nivel 200, yo trato de traer temas OER, por ejemplo, de un blog o que lean el resumen de una película porque es en español, porque es la película que todos van a ver y temas que los enganchen, ¿no? Pero que sean OER porque es el texto real que ellos se van a enfrentar en algún momento en su vida, leer eh, no solamente cuestiones académicas, sino del día a día. Uh -huh. Sí, perfecto. Muy bien, gracias. Uh -huh. Bueno, más? Quiero, com quiero, comentar, sí. quiero comentar en nuestro grupo, eh, pues no, son, no fuimos mucho, tres personas y dos, las otras dos personas trabajan en, en la high school. Y también me sorprende que eh, soy casi tal vez el único que representa a una organización que trabaja eh, de manera un poco informal la enseñanza del español como lengua de herencia. Somos una escuela que solamente enseña español los días sábados a, a los estudiantes hijos de inmigrantes aquí en Carolina del Norte. Y lo, lo que poco hacemos eh, en, este, en esta organización, pues con el tiempo poco que tenemos tratamos de implementar la lectura extensiva con los grados superiores porque tenemos niños desde tres años de edad hasta grado 12 y con los grados de quinto en adelante, de quinto elemental hasta grado 12 seleccionamos alguna novela corta y cada sábado que nos encontramos leemos una parte y reflexionamos, respondemos algunas preguntas. So, eso, ese es en mi programa que es un poco informal. A nivel de la gran mayoría de los que están en este taller que tienen sus programas formales de enseñanza, pues tienen de lunes a sábado para seleccionar mucho más tiempo y escoger otro tipo de lectura. Sin embargo, mis dos compañeros se inclinan por hacer lectura extensiva. Uh -huh. Ok, muy bien, gracias. Eh, creo que Marta Silva está pidiendo la palabra. Ok. Um, sí, nosotros en mi high school, en el primer nivel de lenguas de herencia, hemos incluido en nuestro currículum una unidad que es una novela, una novelita por la frustración de nunca poder terminar uh, una novela, porque una de las cosas que hemos hablado en mi grupo es que uh, nosotros no podemos hacer como a lo mejor ustedes en college o los, eh, los maestros de ELA que pueden dar una novela para leer en casa, tenemos que ser muy, uh, muy responsables con el tiempo de nuestros estudiantes que muchas veces trabajan después de la escuela. Entonces, lo que se lee es lo que se lee en la clase. Eh, entonces, no hay mucho tiempo para leer una novela y si paras de semana a semana eh, se, se pierde el interés, se pierden los conocimientos. Con lo cual, la, el establecimiento de una unidad para leer una novela, que es lo que se hace durante seis semanas, en mi caso ha resultado muy, muy exitoso. A los estudiantes se han enganchado bastante. Y otro aspecto que quería comentar es la lectura oral, que creo que viene de la tradición cultural. Uh, no es mi tradición, a mí me gusta leer en silencio y que nadie me moleste. A mis estudiantes les gusta que leemos todos juntos en voz alta, haciendo comentarios. Y tengo un Socrative que hace formative assessments as we go, con ciertas preguntas de reflexión. Uh -huh. Ok, muy bien. Gracias. Gracias a todos por compartir. Eh, creo que voy a compartir de nuevo para continuar. Eh, Looks like Gabriela had her hand raised. Oh, Gabriela. Oh, yes, Gabriela, sorry. Sí, no pasa nada. Solo un comentario breve. Este, en mi grupo sí habíamos dicho que en realidad habíamos reconocido las tres que, que no hacemos mucha enseñanza de de lectura como tal, en parte porque no tenemos recursos y, y herramientas y tal, pero también habíamos concluido que en realidad eso eh, pasa, no, nos pasa también eh, por una cuestión que había hablado Flavia hace un par de minutos eh, y es una cuestión curricular, si se pone 
que en realidad a nivel universitario hay pocas clases de lectura como tal, hay writing, hay este, una clase de conversación, civilización, etcétera, etcétera, pero no hay clases este, dedicadas a la lectura como tal. Eh, Mayra también comentaba que a nivel este, primario y secundario, pues sí hay clases de, de me imagino que a nivel secundario no, no pero hay clases de e-reading, pero no hay re, eh, reading como tal, ¿no? O sea, entonces es una cuestión curricular también. Y bueno, siempre trabajamos dentro del marco, o sea, de la, dentro de la restricción real, que es el tiempo, lo que se puede cubrir en unas 12 o 14 semanas. Y bueno, pues siempre la lectura se queda en el back burner, como dicen, ¿no? Sí, eso es lo que pasa siempre en, a nivel universitario, que siempre la relegamos, ¿no? Si no es un curso de literatura, entonces, eh, la lectura pasa a un segundo plano, ¿sí? Los cursos de, de lingüística siempre nos concentramos en la gramática y la dejamos a... Definitivamente esos son los, los eh, eh, inconvenientes que hay, ¿no? Bueno, vamos a, a, a pasar, a continuar. Gracias a todos por la participación. Eh, y voy a continuar... En general, sí, por lo que veo y por lo que han discutido bastantes, hay bastantes eh, retos para la implementación de estos programas de lectura extensiva, ¿cierto? Y yo creo que hay, unos, hay unas preguntas que tenemos que hacernos eh, una vez decidimos que esto es lo que queremos hacer, que queremos implementar un programa de lectura extensiva. Y tal vez la primera pregunta, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, am I a good model reader? Si yo no estoy convencida... Y si yo no soy una buena lectora y no soy un buen o un buen lector eh, para mis estudiantes y no estoy convencida, pues difícilmente los voy a convencer a ellos, ¿no? Entonces esa es la primera pregunta que tenemos que hacernos. Y la otra es acerca de los materiales que lo, lo, lo comentaron también ustedes, acerca de qué materiales, con qué materiales pues, cuento yo en el salón de clase, en la biblioteca de mi institución, ¿cierto? Y si no tengo el, los suficientes materiales, ¿qué puedo hacer para acceder a más materiales? La otra pregunta es, eh, ¿material auténtico o material instructivo? Eh, literatura, eh, ¿La literatura para niños es apropiada con los adolescentes, por ejemplo? Uh, y las traducciones, ¿qué tal de las, las traducciones? ¿Son apropiadas? Bueno, aquí hay unas pautas tal vez para res responder algunas de estas preguntas. Voy a ir rápido. Eh, para construir una, una biblioteca, eh, yo diría que tanto los, el material auténtico, si estamos pensando en los hablantes de herencia, eh, tanto material auténtico como el material instructivo. O sea, ahí sabemos que la población de herencia, los estudiantes de herencia son una población bastante heterogénea. Vamos a tener de todos los niveles, de todas las eh, proficiencias lingüísticas. Eh, es decir, eh, en, en ocasiones el ideal y el objetivo sí es que todos estén leyendo material auténtico, pero a veces necesitamos este puente. Hay ciertos estudiantes de herencia que se benefician mucho de las actividades como que hacemos con los Second Language Learners. Entonces, eh, yo diría que tenemos que tener de todo material, o sea, auténtico, tanto auténtico como material, lecturas graduadas, es decir, estas que vienen eh, modificadas en especial para la enseñanza. Eh, también la diversidad, una diversidad de tópicos. Hay que tener en cuenta que no todos nuestros estudiantes les gusta leer eh, fiction. No todos nuestros estudiantes like reading fiction. So we have to offer them a diverse a diversity, diverse topics and genre. Some of our students like to read uh, science, uh, or, uh, some others like manga. Um, maybe 10% of the um, instructional material uh, has to do with STEM. And it, I think it's really important that we start uh, offering them different kinds of material. Uh, and also involve students in the search of new books. Uh, involve your heritage language learners. And voy a mencionar aquí un artículo que, que del que habló ayer, el libro de Mike Piro, que habló ayer eh, Alana. Tiene una, un ensayo, eh, él eh, editó una colección de ensayos de maestros que dan consejos prácticos para los eh, profesores de estudiantes de español como lengua de herencia. Y este artículo de Masem Ken, ese libro que lo tengo en la bibliografía por si están interesados, en este artículo ella comparte su experiencia escribiendo un grant en el que incluyó a sus estudiantes de herencia para conseguir materiales 
eh, para dotar su, su biblioteca. Entonces es importante escuchar las voces de, nos estu de nuestros estudiantes porque generalmente no los escuchamos a ellos, a los de herencia, sino los ofrecemos el material, el mismo material que les ofrecemos a los, a los Second Language Learners. Eh, bueno, más, eh, más ideas. Bueno, eh, con esta situación en la que estamos ahorita de la pandemia, definitivamente nos vemos abocados a crear bibliotecas virtuales, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, más adelante voy a compartir con ustedes, eh, a, a raíz de que pasó esto, empecé a coleccionar eh, todos los materiales que se han puesto accesibles eh, eh, en línea. Eh, de pronto esto les va a ayudar a crear las, eh, la biblioteca virtual. Eh, y hay que tener en cuenta que son los estudiantes los, los que escogen los libros. Ellos mismos eh, debemos eh, enseñarles a identificar el tipo de lectura, el, 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 sí, las lecturas adecuadas para ellos. ¿no? Eh, generalmente les digo a mis estudiantes que eh, para elegir el, el, el libro correcto a, deberían abrir en una página. Primero saber que es, están interesados en el, te, en el tema. Es algo que me interesa, es algo sobre lo cual quiero aprender más. Segundo, abrir el libro y si encuentro más de cinco palabras que no entiendo, pues tal vez no es el, el nivel adecuado del libro, ¿cierto? También esta pregunta en cuanto a la pregunta de literatura infantil y, y las traducciones. Tal vez la literatura infantil no es la más apropiada para los jóvenes. Hay que tener en cuenta Sometimes those are not like compelling books, eh, de, debido a los temas. No, para algunos de nuestros estudiantes sí puede ser, y definitivamente son ellos los que deciden, pero hay que tener eh, cuidado con esta, con, con si es que se trata de comprar, de comprar libros, tal vez no es lo mejor la adquisición de literatura infantil en la lengua materna. Eh, también las traducciones, y creo que eso lo mencioné ayer a Lana, eh, por ejemplo, de estos best sellers como Harry Potter o Narnia, o, si existe la versión en inglés, hay que tener en cuenta que el estudiante generalmente se va a ir por la, lección en, la, la versión en inglés porque, porque va a ser más fácil para él leerla, ¿no? Si su lengua dominante es el inglés y, la, y nuestro propósito es eh, que, que lo lean en español. Entonces, tal vez no es una buena adquisición, no son buena adquisición estas eh, traducciones. Bueno, y como les dije, pues eh, hay muchos recursos eh, que también los van a encontrar y ahorita les voy a mostrar la colección eh, de, que pueden encontrar, en donde pueden encontrar eh, ayuda para los que estén interesados en empezar a trabajar con, este, con el, eh, la lectura extensiva. Entonces pueden encontrar, eh, yo estoy siguiendo tres blogs, el, el de Mike Pito, My Generation of Polyglots, que lo mencionó también ayer Alana, Adriana Ramírez, Bryce... Eh, Headstrom, eh, eh, algunos de ellos tienen libros o recomiendan buenos libros, entonces les recomiendo revisar también el, el blog de Adventures in Heritage Teaching y también varios grupos de Facebook y, y otros recursos que les voy a mostrar más adelante. Otra, otra cosa importante, la, la biblioteca, estar en contacto con su bibliotecario, tener buena relación, trabajar a la par con el bibliotecario eh, es importante Tal vez organizando estos eventos, eh, no sé si han escuchado de Speed Dating, de esos de Speed Dating que es Book Tasting, la versión de libros es Book Tasting. Um, eh, hay un artículo muy interesante en eh, The National Council of, Teacher, eh, of Teachers of English en donde eh, pueden darse ideas acerca de cómo organizar estos eventos. Bueno, eh, una vez ya tenemos eh, como establecida nuestra comunidad de lectores, es importante también buscar mecanismos para eh, evaluar los libros, ¿no? Que los estudiantes evalúen los libros. So these are some suggestions for, for, eh, para tal vez a, a, eh, estrechar los, los lazos de esa comunidad de, de lectores. Eh, You can, you, you can ask your students to rate the books with emoji stickers and uh, you can also create bulletin boards with quotes from the books and also wall charts with reviews written by the students. And now that we have to go digital, maybe using Padlet, uh, there's a mistake here, Padlet, or the digital displays of books, that's another idea. And finally, for, for uh, if we talk about uh, evaluation or uh, para la evaluación, 
creo que es importante que tratemos de salir de, de esta mentalidad y del esquema punitivo de nuestro sistema educativo en el que siempre les vamos a pedir cuentas, ¿no? O sea, y para la lectura eh, lo, lo que hacemos tradicionalmente es los cuestionarios de comprensión de lectura. Particularmente con los estudiantes de herencia es importante eh, explorar diferentes formas en eh, las que hagamos que nos demuestren la comprensión de la lectura o make them accountable for reading. Eh, tal vez eh, podemos explorar cosas como uh, una vez que lean un libro o que es, estén involucrados con la lectura, convertirse en booktubers. No sé si han escuchado estos influenciadores que promueven la lectura a través de canales de YouTube y se llaman los booktubers. También tengo ejemplos en la colección. Eh, crear, por ejemplo, también podcasts, eh, pertenecer a, a estas redes sociales, parecida a la del Facebook, pero es alrededor de la lectura, Goodreads, celebración de los libros, por ejemplo. ¿no? En, mi, en mi universidad celebramos eh, book, eh, este, perdón, eh, San Jordi, on April the 23rd, es el equivalente a, a la celebración de... Eh, el Día de los Enamorados o San Valentine's Day eh, en Barcelona, en eh, donde lo que hay es un intercambio de rosas y de libros. Entonces nosotros en la universidad para promover la lectura hacemos, promocionamos también libros. Justamente ahorita iba a hacerlo para abril, iba a hacerlo en la universidad cuando pasó lo del coronavirus. Pero es una buena idea también como a través de estos, estas eh, celebraciones dar a conocer la literatura hispana de los Estados Unidos, ¿no? Bueno, esto ya lo había mencionado, <coughs> voy un poquito rápido. Esta es la colección que les mencioné. Entonces, yo ya, ya los oí mencionar este Wakelet eh, y yo encontré este sitio para estas, estas eh, colecciones. Entonces, eh, soy nueva en esto, pero hasta donde tengo entendido es público, totalmente público. No sé si ustedes, los que tienen el Nearpod, pueden acceder. Pero si no, voy a, voy a compartir. Ah, creo que yo estoy compartiendo la pantalla. Creo que todo lo pueden ver, ¿verdad? ¿Sí lo pueden ver? Ok. Sí, entonces, eh, bueno, hay tres, pero tal vez las que más les interesen son estas dos. Eh, una es la colección de lectura digital en español. <coughs> bueno, eh, entonces acá lo que hice fue, hay en este momento 40... Eh, sitios que espero que les puedan servir para empezar a crear sus, eh, sus bibliotecas virtuales. Eh, muchos de los, eh, por ejemplo, Arte Público Press aquí en, en Houston en, tiene, ha puesto sus, algunos recursos de forma gratuita y me parece que es un buen sitio para explorar. Eh, también para los que están interesados en TPRS, bueno, hay una cantidad de sitios todos gratis, hay algunos que también son donde se sugieren libros a, o donde hay reseñas de libros, por ejemplo, Latino and Latin American Authors to add to your 2020 reading list. Bueno, hay, hay una variedad de recursos que eh, sería bueno que le echen un vistazo, hay para todas las edades. Eh, y, y hay cómics, hay también National Geographic, Mozilla, que puede, pueden ayudarles eh, a formar su biblioteca virtual. Y la otra es eh, la que les mencioné de eh, social media para la lectura, en donde yo he estado poniendo sitios como blogs, por ejemplo, o páginas web de, de personas que promueven la lectura. Por ejemplo, acá está el blog que les mencioné, My Generation of Polyglots, TPR, uh, Storytelling, bueno, esto también, y varios grupos que están promoviendo la lectura. Eh, bueno, eso es con respecto a la lectura. <coughs> Digital. Bueno, ahora voy a pasar un poco a hablar acerca de las estrategias de, de lectura. Eh, reading strategies. So we know that those mental operations that help a reader, reader understand and assign meaning to a text, right? So we know that it is really important to teach them how to use these reading strategies because we want, we want them to become independent readers, right? Entonces, <coughs> viene mi pregunta, what reading strategies do you teach? 
si pueden de forma breve los que están conectados con Padlet eh, escribir acerca de las estrategias que ustedes enseñan, qué estrategias de lectura y si pueden brevemente comentar si tienen ideas de cómo las utilizan. Los que no puedan eh, interactuar a través de Padlet podrían escribirlo en el chat. Entonces vamos a pensar en qué, qué estrategias de lectura enseñan y cómo las enseñan y si pueden por favor compartir en el, en el tablero. ¿Alguien? O de pronto en el chat, no sé si están funcionando, si ven cómo hacerlo. ¿Qué estrategias de lectura enseñan? Sí, aquí tenemos algunas. Uh, making inferences, predicting, silent reading. Mm. Ok. Talking to the text. Uh -huh. reading, coral reading. Ok. One, okay two, no sé three, si no. Cognate, mm -hmm. uh, personal o individual connections. Ok. Ok. Muy bien. Muy bien. Gracias. No sé si no, no está. Bueno, ahí creo que ya estoy escasa. No, todavía tengo tiempo. Eh, eh, ahí pues utilizo esta. Eh, hay varias clasificaciones de las estrategias de lectura pero estoy utilizando esta de Rodrigo, 2018. Ella las clasifica en las estrategias metacognitivas, cognitivas y socioafectivas. Entonces, estrategias eh, cognitivas son las que les ayudan a pensar al, al lector eh, sobre el proceso de la lectura, y ahí pueden leer algunas. Planea cómo va a leer, atendiendo al objetivo, la finalidad. Las cognitivas son las que tienen que ver con los procesos que, mentales que, está, que realiza el lector en la medida que va leyendo. Y las socioafectivas son las que tienen que ver con eh, las estrategias de naturaleza social que, le, que utiliza el lector para ayudar a bajar la ansiedad que le produce la lectura, ¿verdad? Y, y para estimular que continúe eh, leyendo. Entonces podemos ver ahí algunas también. <coughs> Bueno, entonces eh, ella utiliza estas tres y son bastantes. Ok. Eh, básicamente lo que propone ella y los y bastantes eh, y los expertos en general es utilizar estos tres pasos, ¿no? Explicar, modelar y practicar. ¿Cierto? Eh, tres pasos para la enseñanza, porque tenemos que hacerlo y hay que salir de esa idea de que esto solamente se, se hace en la primaria. Yo he encontrado que esto hay que hacerlo tanto en el bachillerato como en la universidad. O sea, no nos podemos quedar en que esto lo hizo el maestro porque nos, a la hora que llegan a la universidad... Uh, resulta que no manejan las estrategias y nosotros tenemos que hacerlo. Nosotros tenemos que aprovechar esos momentos en los que leemos esos read alouds, en los que le leemos en voz alta, como alguien estaba mencionando, a los estudiantes y aprovechar ese momento para modelar las estrategias de lectura. ¿sí? Eh, estos son eh, ejercicios eh, ya no es la lectura extensiva, pero, sino la lectura intensiva que tenemos que hacer. Estos ejercicios de práctica en donde les explicamos, modelamos y los dejamos que practiquen las eh, estrategias, ¿verdad? Entonces, lo que yo hice fue crear, y ya no, no tenemos mucho tiempo así de que solamente se los voy a explicar, eh, la idea era que quería hacer que trabajaran en grupos con este material que creé, pero tal vez no me alcanza ya el tiempo definitivamente. Entonces lo que voy a hacer es explicarles. Eh, son muchas las estrategias que tiene Victoria Rodrigo. Entonces yo dije, pues si tengo que comenzar por algunas, hice una selección de unas cuantas eh, que me parecen muy importantes. Eh, esto es a mi criterio, pero ustedes pueden pensar que okay, incluirían 
o sacarían de aquí. Pero yo elegí ocho que son las que creo que si tengo que comenzar por un lado, comienzo por enseñar estas, ¿no? Entonces, eh, aquí están las definiciones y eh, yo lo que hice fue crear una plantilla de un lesson plan y eh, para cada estrategia lo que yo propongo es que crear el plan de cómo la voy a enseñar, ¿cierto? Siguiendo estos pasos de los que nos eh, mencionó, eh, nos mencionó Rodrigo. Eh, entonces, la explicación que la divido en definición de la estrategia, explicar el propósito y el ejemplo. Y eh, la parte 2, el paso 2 que es modelar. Y 3, la práctica. Entonces, eh, tengo acá un ejemplo de cómo utilizaría esta plantilla, por ejemplo, para explicar eh, la estrategia, para enseñar la estrategia de inferencia de significados. Entonces, ¿cómo defino la, la estrategia? La idea es eh, hacerlo con, pro, con un vocabulario bastante sencillo y escribir básicamente como, como el script, cómo se lo enseñaría yo a los estudiantes, ¿no? Entonces, eh, diga, bueno, la definición, esta estrategia consiste en usar el contexto para inferir el significado del vocabulario desconocido y le diría a los estudiantes algo así como cuando encuentras una palabra desconocida en el texto no siempre tienes que acudir al diccionario, a veces si continúas leyendo te vas a dar cuenta de que el contexto de tu conocimiento lingüístico te ayuda a inferir el significado de la palabra. Bueno, luego entrarías a explicarles el propósito, por qué, porque es importante usarla, si usas esa estrategia la lectura va a ser más ágil, vas a aumentar la velocidad de lectura, vas a comprender más, Um, vas a evitar el uso constante del diccionario. Y luego en la parte de modelar, lo que yo propongo es, bueno, hay que hacer el think aloud a todos los niveles, como ya mencioné, eh, que es un pensamiento en voz alta. Es como una actividad metacognitiva en la que el maestro va a reflexionar y a poner de manifiesto y, y en voz alta sobre sus procesos mentales a medida que lee. ¿no? Entonces la idea es seleccionar un texto breve eh, e ir leye, leyéndolo en voz alta y verbalizando al mismo tiempo sus pensamientos, ¿no? explicando cómo usa el contexto para deducir el significado de, de las palabras desconocidas. Lo siguiente sería crear como una actividad corta, por ejemplo, con un fragmento de corto, corto de un cuento infantil, eh, o de un cuento, perdón, no infantil, sino fácil, dependiendo del nivel, esto va a, a adaptarse, ¿no? si es en universidad o como sea. Pero pedir a los estudiantes que por pareja tomen turnos para demostrar el uso de la estrategia. Por supuesto que el maestro tendría que estar monitoreando y guiando a los estudiantes, fijándose de que sí estén utilizando la estrategia. Pero bueno, eh, como les dije, ya se me acabó el tiempo y eh, la idea era ponernos a trabajar con las estrategias, pero ya creo que no tengo tiempo. Así de que... Eso era lo que quería compartir con ustedes y no sé si haya preguntas, sé que Alana está encargada de las preguntas, no sé. Pero, eh, Edna, tienes hasta las 12 y 15, ¿verdad? Oh, ok. Oh, yo pensaba que ya estaba, ok. Entonces podemos hacer, pensaba que ya se me había acabado el tiempo. El almuerzo es a las 12 y 15. Ok, ok, uh -huh. pensaba que era hasta las 12. Entonces sí podemos hacerlo, ok, perfecto. Entonces, eh, Sara, can you help me, please? Yes. Ok. Okay, thank you. So, Sara, yeah, groups of four. All right. Okay, so, uh, so that's what, what I want you to do, one strategy at a time. So you are going to break out in rooms and uh, with your group, I want you to choose one of the strategies and start working on a lesson plan to teach, to teach that strategy. So maybe you're not going to be able to work on uh, everything, but if at least you work on the first two steps, um, and then we, when we come back, we will discuss, okay? Okay, okay. Entonces parece que ya eh, discutieron. Eh, me gustaría saber sus eh, eh, discusiones y eh, si alguien, algún grupo quiere compartir eh, algunas ideas sobre el, el lesson plan que, que diseñaron o que empezaron a crear porque me imagino que no hubo tiempo suficiente para terminarlo. Pero no sé si alguien quiere compartir qué idea, qué estrategia trabajaron y qué ideas tienen de cómo eh, explicarla. Yo voy a hablar, soy uh, Mayra Prats, trabajé con la señora Ibarra y con la doctora Boquich. Y una de las cosas que dijimos es que a veces uh, nosotros como maestros 
combinamos muchas de las estrategias. No nada más utilizamos una, no nada más explicamos o no nada más modelamos, pero para este ejercicio utilizamos a uh, inferencia y tratar de encontrar una unidad y un libro, pero finalmente nos decidimos por fiesta fatal, que yo creo que muchos de ustedes la han utilizado, que hay muchísimo material y que se relaciona tanto con la vida de los, de los estudiantes eh, que están a la edad de middle school y high school. Okay. Y sí, muy, eh, eh, la, la idea es poder combinar varias estrategias, no, no estar en, en una ocasión especial, puede decirse a los estudiantes, hoy, voy a, hoy vamos a aprender y son varias, eh, eh, varias estrategias, ¿no? no necesariamente uno se concentra en una, pero sí, muchas gracias Mayra por, por la participación. ¿Alguien más tiene, eh, quiere compartir lo que hicieron en el grupo? A compartir. En, mi, en nuestro grupo hablamos acerca, de, estábamos en diferentes niveles. Uh, una de las maestras enseña el noveno grado y yo enseño particularmente el onceavo en literatura española, pero hablamos de estrategias que se pueden usar para los dos y una de las que comentamos es acerca de inferencias, cómo ayudar a que los estudiantes puedan predecir lo que va a venir en el texto. Entonces, hablamos de cómo podemos presentar una parte del texto y después eh, hacer preguntas que les permitan que ellos eh, predigan qué es lo que va a decir el texto, lo que va a presentar el texto. Eh, yo me enfoqué en el texto de Lazario de Tormes porque es uno de los que tenemos que analizar obligatoriamente por el College Board. Y hablábamos acerca de cómo, eh, enseñando la definición de qué es un pícaro, ya que el estudiante entiende perfectamente que es un pícaro, puede comenzar a hacer inferencias acerca de lo que va a suceder en cada episodio y puede comenzar a ver los patrones de comportamiento del personaje principal y puede comenzar a, a crear eh, conexiones a través de cada uno de los episodios. Y decidimos combinar esta estrategia con Think, Pair and Share, en donde el estudiante primero individualmente piensa acerca del texto, después comparte con un compañero y después eh, comparte con la clase. Y esto le ayuda para sentirse pues, más eh, seguro, segura de sí mismo, porque a nadie le gusta compartir simplemente y ser juzgado. Ya que tuvieron esa oportunidad de hablar entre ellos, tienen más eh, capacidad o tienen más seguridad para poder compartir con el resto de la clase. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ok, excelente. Muy bien, gracias. ¿Alguien más? Una, ¿Un grupo más que quiera compartir? Bueno, ya creo Emma, que todos, nosotros ¿sí? nos ¿Sí? enfocamos también en la importancia de enseñarles directamente la estrategia sin asumir que los chicos ya la saben o que ya se les enseñaron en sus clases de language arts. Uh -huh. Así, sí. si ya la saben, pues perfecto, ¿no? Porque la practicaron y se acordaron de esa estrategia, pero si no la saben, se les está enseñando maneras de ser um, smart learners, uh -huh. independientes también. Uh -huh. Definitivamente sí. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, gracias a todos. Creo que eh, estamos sobre el tiempo, pero hay unas preguntas que Alana me pasó. Eh, una tiene que ver con si debemos concentrarnos, entonces eh, creo que algo así como que tanto debemos concentrarnos en la enseñanza del vocabulario. Eh, y definitivamente sí, o sea, eh, la enseñanza del vocabulario, enseñanza explícita del vocabulario no es algo que estemos haciendo lo suficiente en el salón de clases. Entonces, eh, debemos dedicarle gran parte del tiempo a la enseñanza explícita del vocabulario, bastantes ejercicios para aumentar la comprensión lectora, ejercicios de todo tipo, pero también, si, si queremos mejorar la lectura, enseñanza explícita de las estrategias de lectura. O sea, esto que estamos haciendo de crear planes para cómo voy a enseñarla, qué textos voy a utilizar, eh, qué oportunidades o qué actividades voy a crear para, eh, para que ellos las practiquen, esto definitivamente es algo que no hacemos lo suficiente en el salón de clase y deberíamos dedicarle gran parte y no pensar que porque están en high school o ya lo hicieron en primaria y no es necesario reforzarlo, sí hay que reforjar, reforzarlo. Tampoco porque estén en, en eh, universidad decir, no, es que lo hicieron en la escuela y es, es bastante tonto yo como maestro ponerme a leer enfrente del salón de clase y a modelar. Tal vez hay que reconsiderar eso porque 
los estudiantes están llegando sin las estrategias eh, de lectura necesarias a la universidad y ya eh, al enfrentarse con eh, el español lo necesitan para su vida laboral y no tienen la suficiente la competencia en lectura y en escritura eh, para, para, para desempeñarse y para aprovechar su lengua. ¿no? Eh, y otra cosa, creo, otra pregunta fue acerca de TPR eh, S-Books y yo digo que sí hay que utilizar eh, este material eh, de todo, ofrecer de todo lo que tengamos, sobre todo si tenemos clases mixtas, pues hay que ofrecer de todo y no sabemos en qué momento hasta un estudiante que se catalogue Heritage Language se puede benefici beneficiar también. Como dije, el objetivo son los libros auténticos, ¿cierto? Pero algunos estudiantes necesitan ese puente, algunos están en un nivel en que necesitan empezar a leer algo tan fácil y tan básico, digamos, para después ir dando saltitos y pasos más hasta acercarse a la, a la literatura o a, o a los libros auténticos, ¿no? Entonces, eso, espero que res, responder las preguntas. Alguien también estaba preguntando sobre Rodrigo, pero creo que le contestaron en el chat. El, el, el autor que es la autora que mencioné, está al final en la bibliografía. Eh, la, la, el PowerPoint lo van a encontrar en el folder eh, de mis materiales también. Y también descargué el... Eh, del Wakelet, las colecciones, eh, lo que ven es, descargué el, el PDF, pero si yo agrego más cosas, pues no van a tener acceso, así de que en el PowerPoint van a encontrar el enlace y creo que ustedes se pueden, eh, ahorita está público y creo que ustedes pueden agregar más cosas a la colección o, saca, o ver qué enlaces para crear su propia colección, qué enlaces les pueden servir. Entonces, eh, eso sería todo. Muchas gracias. Edna, muchísimas gracias. Gracias a todos. Un placer escuchar la presentación. Bien. Um... Vale, entonces tenemos Emily, María y profesora León. Ok. Bueno, son las una con quince. Este, espero que más personas se vayan conectando a cómo vayamos empezando. Este, estoy viendo aquí todo. Todos todavía creo que están deleitándose con su almuerzo. Este, pero espero que por lo menos me, me escuchen. Bueno, muy bien. Hola a todos, todas, todos, todexes. Este, bienvenidos a esta segunda ronda de Poster Presentations. Este, ayer tuvimos el placer de escuchar a 3.5 de los panelistas. Así que hoy vamos a empezar este, de nuevo con la doctora Bernate. Este, que por si hay preguntas este, que no se pudieron contestar ayer, este, nos dio un, un buen overview de su proyecto y nos dio a entender más o menos este, esta muy bella iniciativa que estoy seguro que muchos quieren oír un poquito más. Así que vamos a ver primero este, los comentarios. Este, creo que no hay comentarios. Creo que sí. Casi todos son de hace 23 horas. Um, y acabo de ver que había preguntas acerca de cómo había calificado todo. Creo que es sí. ahí. Ya puedo revisar y ver. Sí, entonces estoy viendo la, prim la primera pregunta nos dice, right, this seems like a great idea where all the interviewers related to bilingualism or where the students offer the option to create. I think we talked about that one yesterday. Um, what were some challenges the students encounter? How do you create the project? Is it time consuming? Um, and Gabriela todavía nos reitera lo, lo, lo bello de este proyecto. Así que si podrías, Emily, por favor. Bueno, empiezo con lo de si, if it's time consuming. Um, it is very time consuming. I kind of had to sacrifice the original syllabus that I had before. That was very traditional. Um, Vamos a hacer una lectura, una actividad focus on form, y vamos a hacer una práctica cultural y una conversación. And then next lesson, no, I really had to sacrifice that kind of syllabus. I think if, to kind of answer both of those at the same time, more than half of the grades in the class had something to do with the project. This was a semester long project, but it didn't mean that we were like only just doing a project. Um, the project was the basis for our writing um, grades, for our research grades, for our reading grades, for our conversation practices. Um, so 
Um, I'm happy to share the syllabus that I had, but I'll describe, I think I can answer all the questions by just describing the three phases of the project. And that way anybody, if they want to do it in their class, they could do that. Um, the first phase was really just a research phase. We had an archivist come and uh, we did a lot of reading in that phase. And so a lot of their grades were based on reading comprehension and selecting articles and comparing articles from past and present and what people thought about language maintenance in the past versus now. The second phase was the interview phase. Um, so we had to prepare the questions. If you're gonna do anything with people that are not in the class, you really have to practice a lot. So we even had grades for their practice interviews in class and a grade for the analysis of their practice interview in class. Like, was it long enough? Did you think you were asking really elaborated questions, but did you instead ask a bunch of yes or no questions and you only got 15 minutes when you were supposed to get 30? And we met with an ethics person and made sure that we were being ethical in our interviews and that we um, had the right kind of consent form. So there was a whole interview section where we did the interviews and we worked on posting them online and editing them and grabbing a 30 second clip. And then the final phase of the semester was um, preparing for the off campus event. And if you do have funds at all to have an off campus event, it really motivates the students a lot more. There were a lot of great conversations about register because it was an off campus event and they had to do a mini presentation of some part of their little film. And they also had to direct a round table with adults from the community. And so we had a lot of conversations about, okay, oral and written are not registers. This is oral and you have the district uh, um, for superintendent of bilingual education there. So you're gonna ask him this in a certain way and you're gonna lead the conversation in a certain way. So there were three different phases throughout uh, the semester and we had other activities as well, but I would say probably at least 60% of our grade had to do, our final grade had to do with a chunk of something that was going on during the semester to lead up to these final events. Muy bien. Este, hay otra pregunta también en el póster que nos dice que si fue calificación individual o grupal. Individual y miles y miles de calificaciones, because everything had to be its own step. Es que si no es su propio paso, uh, it feels overwhelming to the students. Ellos dicen, bueno, ah, no me fue tan bien en esta parte, entonces ya ni modo, we don't want them to give up. So every little component, even the practice, the analysis of the practice, your initial roundtable questions, your practice of your roundtable questions, your practice with the microphone and the fake microphone in class. Everything was una nota separada and everybody was graded individually. Uh, they had a couple of paired writing assignments where they would look at each other's interviews and they would discuss it and they would say, bueno, mi entrevistado dijo tal cosa y el tuyo, and then they would write a little paragraph together. Uh, that was the only thing I ever graded them in pairs, but I think since it's just so heterogeneous, it everything almost has to be graded individually. Wow. And as its own component, so that if they mess up on one thing, they don't like throw in the towel for the rest of the semester. Sí. Wow, muchísimas gracias. Emily, hay una pregunta del, de los presentes. Este, nomás vemos muchos personal comments. Entonces, we're very, very excited for this project. Any questions del colectivo? Alguien? Questions, comments, maybe? Anyone? Uh, somebody asked how to get access to the syllabus. I don't know. I have all of that. Where do you want it? <laughs> este, lo puedes mandar y lo podemos subir al website for Heritage. Este, nomás tendrías que escoger tu to sharing license, de lo que hablamos ayer, básicamente, ya de ya nomás lo subimos. Good opportunity to practice those, those little rules, <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. Hey, Emily. Will... Oh, sorry. Claro, Emily, una claro. pregunta, una pregunta cortita. Eh, hubo, ¿qué tipo de feedback from the community, from the people that were interviewed and participating in the table? They want to do it again. Y les digo, yeah, I only had funds for one semester because it took a lot of money, money to get people from the community to go, um, you know, because that requires food and an off-campus place that looks fancy. We got kind of like a wedding venue 
<laughs> so it looks like an old church in the back because it was like a an off-campus space uh, the community really liked it um the community said things like wow nunca tenemos la oportunidad de utilizar el español en nuestros trabajos y nunca tenemos la oportunidad de hacer de utilizar el español así so even the community was really appreciative the way we were dignifying Spanish as a language that's worthy of academic study and of preserving history. Um, the community was actually really grateful at the end of the event. They all took mm -hmm. pictures with the students, like little wedding cut pictures in front <laughs> of the screen. And uh, uh, part of it though, I think elevated it, like getting funds to decorate it and make it look like a nice fancy event, you know, putting- <laughs> I mean I wonder, I mean, if there will be any, I mean, we know uh, everybody is fighting for funding. I mean, it's, it's, it's our, our normal life, but I wonder if um, Chamber of Commerce, if any association that, that, that could also sponsor a Hispanic uh, center, I'm thinking the one in Houston, that they will receive some funding and scholarships and grants, maybe through that because it looks like an amazing project and I think That's that the, the, the community idea. component is, need, is fundamental. You do need money, you know, if you want to make it look nice and get things off campus. Um, that's where I think the real like lessons about register and getting the students to direct a round table with adults in Spanish, but you need money, but the grant really kind of wrote itself. Um, I, I've not been good at research grants, but this pedagogy grant, they said yes right away. They didn't ask for anything else um, because it was kind of obvious the impact is immediate in the community and then it's lasting if you also put it on a website and their name gets on the website. So those kinds of uh, grants, uh, people tend to say yes to that kind of stuff. So if you found a small organization that could give you $1,000 for an event, you could make something super elegant. Muy bien. Este, tengo las cuantas preguntas en el chat. Este, por ejemplo, uh, Paige Anderson pregunta, did the students pick who was, a, who was at the community event or did the professor in this case you? Uh, the students had to do all of the promoting their event and they had to make stuff to do that. They invited all of their um, interviewees and since we also worked at a bilingual high school, some of the high school kids knew that there was going to be something going on. And so we invited, a, we invited the principal and we invited um, bilingual administration in the Austin School District to come. We had the, the bilingual superintendent come, that was really cool. And the principal and vice principal. So we, yeah, they asked people. Um, and then from my school, I asked some of the professors to join as well that I knew also spoke Spanish. Wow. <laughs> That's all I can say right now. <laughs> este, este, Gabriela Bokik me, me dice que mencionaste consent forms en algún punto. That you had to get an IRB approval for this project. Yes. So um, I can help somebody. You don't, you don't need an IRB, but you need um, consent forms where I had worked with an oral history and ethics professor and she was the one that kind of helped us write our consent form. She came to class and did it. So if somebody wants to put stuff online now, um, the easiest way is that they still, the interviewee retains the right to their material, but gives you the right to put it online for educational purposes. And I'm sure I still have those and I'm willing to share that. I'm sure the journalism professor that helped us with it would be more than happy for other people to do oral histories and to make sure. But the, the most ethical way to do it is that they stay the owners of their material, but we are allowed to house it um, online. Este, Esma Delgado pregunta también, este, aparte del, de todo lo educativo y lo formal, were you able to make any other community condition, uh, connections, like community centers and stuff like that? So the hardest part was really getting the right interviewees. Um, that really was, was hard for the students. So uh, <clears throat> I know a lot of people in bilingual education, and so I had them go to schools and talk to the teachers and then find another teacher. And I was like, oh, you teach Canoe? Well, do you know anybody in first grade? Well, do you know it? And I just had them uh, talk one by one. And that's why um, 
this was like a semester long project because you know they needed to make the connections in September, schedule the interview for the first one for the beginning of October, schedule the other interview for like the end of October. So it was really spaced out, but yeah, they, they had to um, pelearse un poco to get enough interviews. And the reason why we have so few on the page is because some of the uh, consent forms were not perfectly clear. And I say, you know what, I'm not comfortable um, putting anything up there where they missed a spot on the consent form. Uh, so yeah, making con community connections, I think in like sociology, they call it something like snowball effect where you just start with one person and then yeah. you just keep trying. Yeah. Well, so did. yes, I was nervous the whole semester because I didn't know if the students would find enough people. So I was like in a constant state of um, anxiety the first time because I didn't know if they would all come through and find enough people, but they did. Um, you know, bilingual speakers are everywhere. If you can convince them that their bilingualism is exactly what we want to hear. Muy bien. Y creo que ahora sí la última pregunta que tengo aquí. Um, were there any connections made for the future or were there, will, will there be a follow-up plan for this project? So not with the high school, um, just because it's hard to work with the high school and that was the most rewarding part. But, you know, I need funds to get them on campus and uh, for issues of uh, making sure that I make it available to students that have, might have mobility issues, you know, I need a bus. So no high school. Um, this next fall, we are going to transcribe and do some work, uh, more like metalinguistic work with the interviews that we already have. If you look at that spin text page, that would be like the idle page that we're trying to get to. So um, we're going to work with the videos that we already have instead of making new ones and try to make them more pedagogically and research accessible for other people. Maybe some like grammar tags and things. Awesome. Well, thank you, Emily. Um, I think everybody can probably share like a little small clap on the side of the emoticon. emoticon. That'll be great. Thank you. Uh, bueno, ahora continuamos con la profesora Verónica León con su tema de cómo estimular la narrativa auto, autobiografía de herencia. Perdón. Este, entonces, si nos quieres comentar un poquito sobre el trabajo, de en qué consistió para los que no alcanzaron a ver el video o leer el póster, y de ahí empezamos con las preguntas. Mil gracias, Luis. Hola, Flavia, y el resto de los um, interesantísimos colegas que se han reunido en esta ocasión, y afortunadamente vía eh, Zoom, porque si no, 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 a ver, no hubiéramos podido estar ahí, y es algo muy positivo. Bueno, primero, eh, el, esta... esta idea de la, uh, auto, del texto autobiográfico viene directamente de la experiencia del salón de clase al enseñar un curso eh, de herencia para estudiantes avanzados, como lo mencionamos antes, eh, mi colega, la eh, profesora eh, eh, Gabriela Vokic y Michael Allred, que él estuvo, es, se está apenas promoviendo eh, la idea del, del eh, español e intermedio, que obviamente va a ser un curso no solo necesitado, pero como un curso de puente para los cursos más avanzados. Entonces, después de todo esto, eh, la universidad, eh, estamos en Southern Methodist University, tiene una misión de cumplir ciertos eh, eh, cierto currículo, el cual uno de ellos, que es muy difícil para muchos estudiantes, es la escritura. Entonces, esta clase para mí, cuando ya empezamos a poner las etiquetas de la clase con el currículum de la universidad, para mí era lógico que tenía que venir writing, escritura. Y ya al hacerlo más consciente, pues ya teníamos que tener más, más eh, formatos de cómo mejorar la escritura desde un inicio, cómo estimular el vocabulario, cómo mejorarlo por ellos mismos, sino el profesor siendo como el, el policía, ¿verdad? Del, del español. Todo comienza con un tema que yo lo encuentro natural. Todos somos escritores natos, no sé, pero a todos nos gusta hablar un poquito de nuestra vida. 
Y ahí comienza el texto autobiográfico. Eh, aunque tuviéramos eh, una familia, dos hermanos, eh, cada uno hablaría de su experiencia, como lo indica García Márquez, en forma diferente. Siendo los mismos padres, siendo el mismo ambiente, habiendo ido al mismo colegio, todos hablaríamos de, 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 de su historia en una forma muy diferente. Y ahí es donde comenzamos. La clase hace una mesa redonda. Yo los divido, primero hacemos redonda, todos participan, en eh, cómo sacar algunos temas, ¿verdad? Entonces yo me detengo en la pubertad, que yo creo que esa es una edad eh, así, por decir, eh, se puede mover en años, pero 12 o 13 años, porque si no el estudiante se pierde. Dice, bueno, yo nací en, um, no sé, en San Luis Potosí y luego me aceptaron a la universidad, ¿verdad? O sea, pues, y yo digo, bueno, ¿y qué pasó, verdad? En, en medio. Entonces, hay, lo mejor de su escritura viene de esos años, cuando ellos tienen que hacer un esfuerzo consciente de acordarse de lo bueno y lo malo. Ellos no dan conciencia a lo bueno hasta que se acuerdan de lo malo. Y para mí el, el efecto más grande viene en esta eh, resiliencia que viene de acordarte de esos pasos, de ese, ese gran sacrificio que hicieron al tener que integrarse a esta sociedad de hispanohablantes enorme y de ajustarse y de salir victoriosos y de estar sentados en, en la universidad. Entonces, eso es más o menos el cuadro. Eh, no puse mucho de cómo seguir los pasos de cómo hacerlo eh, ya en cuanto al, al formato, pero hacemos primero la mesa redonda, luego ellos tienen que hacer un eh, esquema, ellos tienen que escoger sus temas y ellos al hacer un esquema muy breve, 100 palabras les pido yo, ya en clase van a desarrollar y yo se los dejo con su con su compu, ¿verdad? Les digo, usted puede usar su compu si eso lo hace sentirse mejor. Me dice, puede escuchar música, puede escuchar música, lo que lo haga sentir como un autor libre. <ríe> y ahí empiezan a flotar las ideas. Entonces, lo único que les pido es que no me hagan un solo párrafo, que empiecen con una introducción donde hablan del ambiente. Eso es muy bonito porque... Cada uno tiene un, un, una preciosa manera de entrar a su vida. Luego ya empiezan a contar, eh, escogen ellos quién o qué o qué situación. Eh, casi siempre son uh, mudanzas, crisis, cambios fuertes. Y luego ellos eh, más adelante eh, ya hacen un, un cierre donde sacan el provecho. Este, para el curso que yo doy a nivel universitario, el, el primer borrador viene de 700 palabras, pero esto se puede ajustar, obviamente. Y acuérdense, ya el esquema tenía 100 palabras, así es que no es demasiado cuando les encanta hablar de su vida. Y bueno, este es más o menos, he tenido, ustedes se dan cuenta, ellos son artistas natos, ellos son escritores, y cuando yo me di cuenta que yo tengo una colección enorme, eh, pensé que esto es para más. Esta es la historia de los um, hispanoestadounidenses. Una, una mm. gran tradición y, y una, y una hermosa testimonio para nuestra historia. Gracias. Eh, y estoy uh, li lista para preguntas. Vale, muchísimas gracias por el, el meta resumen de su, de su trabajo. Este, tenemos una pregunta que nos dice, ¿a usted no le preocupa que los estudiantes se traumaticen de nuevo al tener que hablar de este tipo de momentos? Como yo les digo, yo no soy más que su guía. Ellos van a escoger lo que, de lo que quieran hablar. Hay un estudiante que me dice, yo no quisiera hablar de eso. Ah, le digo, no, claro que no, claro que no. O sea, yo no soy eh, psicóloga ni mucho menos. Yo les digo, ¿cómo quisieras contar de tu vida? Y... Eh, es como que le vamos a contar, le vamos a comentar a alguien lo que, lo que quier, queremos contar, nada más, ¿verdad? Lo otro lo vamos a dejar guardado para otra ocasión y para otro profesional. Aquí se trata de poner en palabras algunos aspectos de tu vida. 
Vale. Esta, la misma persona pregunta sobre el concepto de privacidad individual, si uno no quiere revivir estos momentos. Creo que ya lo, más o menos lo contestó. De Totalmente de acuerdo. Yo, como les digo, nadie va a poner, ah, me preguntan que si lo, a algunos estudiantes que si lo van a leer en voz alta, le digo, no. Yo soy lectora, pero obviamente yo jamás voy a usar ninguno de estos textos en forma abierta donde ellos tuvieran que poner algo en, en frente a todos eh, que, que de lo cual se sintieran incómodos. Pero ellos mismos saben qué escoger. Ellos son los que escogen qué es lo que quieren transmitir. Y siempre son efectos del idioma, de las circunstancias, de los padres, de los cambios que no entendieron. Es muy interesante el proceso. ¿Verdad? Así es que no, 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 definitivamente yo no les, les digo, si hay algo que le preocupa, no lo escriba, por favor. Punto. Bueno. No, queremos, eh, no queremos molestar a nadie. Muy bien. Tengo algunas preguntas en el chat, pero veo que alguien alzó la mano. Entonces, ah. voy, a voy a pedirle a Eric que por favor comparta su comentario slash pregunta. Este, de casualidad ha tratado de buscar fondos para hacer alguna revista un poco amateur, pero para que lo puedan compartir o escojan un cuento, ¿no? Una narración que puedan compartir, no solo con estudiantes futuros, ¿no? Pero, bueno, futuros estudiantes, pero también para, a lo mejor, con escuelas cercanas, con high schoolers, ¿no? Para que también este, animar a los demás, ¿no? Porque ya están en la universidad, ya son líderes, ¿no? Y pueden ser líderes en la comunidad. Mil gracias por tu comentario. Mira, algo que no dije fue que en el pasado, aquí mismo en Dallas, Texas, que es donde yo vivo, existe una institución que se llama The, The Mexico Institute, liderada por eh, 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 Clara, eh, eh, Clara Hinojosa. Y Clara Hinojosa eh, cada año tenía un concurso en el pasado para celebrar algo bellísimo que se llama el Día de la Lengua Española. Entonces, eh, se mandaban estas obras de arte, como les digo, a, a este concurso. Y voy a decirlo, que aunque eran eh, jurados que no sabíamos quiénes eran, los estudiantes en mis cursos siempre salían ganadores. Eran dos niveles, era nivel universitario y obviamente nivel de preparatoria. Uh, y, y siempre salían uh, victoriosos. Voy a, nada más para decirles, me acuerdo que uno de los títulos de, 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 del cuento era eh, ¿Quién dice que Superman no existe? Así para, les digo, estos son genios, genios, y yo los he guardado, ahí, ahí los tengo y obviamente tengo los nombres de los uh, estudiantes. Por otra parte, tiene razón, esto no se debería de quedar a nivel eh, trabajo de clase, esto debería compartirse y hay una colega en mi propio departamento, la profesora Pilar uh, Melgarejo, que está eh, creando una revista y yo le dije, ah, si tú me permites, mis estudiantes van a poder compartir y en eso estamos verdaderamente. Y esta revista eh, con lo del coronavirus, creo que tuvimos un retraso, pero estará por salir, me imagino, en este año. Muy bien, gracias a ambos. Este, Emily pregunta, how do they share these stories after they write them? So, un, menciona que hay un proceso creativo que se escribe en el salón y demás, pero ¿cómo los estudiantes lo comparten con el resto? Bueno, mira, eh, hasta ahora yo no he tenido esta, esta interés eh, de, de que ellos se lean unos a otros porque ahí sí creo que, que es, eh, hay quien dice, no, es que yo no, yo no, no lo hice, no, un buen trabajo. Tienen muchas inseguridades mayormente, pero son escritores, como te digo, eh, eh, geniales. Así es mi, eh, mi única palabra, fantásticos. Yo no les tengo que cambiar nada absolutamente. Yo les dejo su lenguaje coloquial, les dejo sus expresiones, sus dichos. Ellos escriben con el corazón y con emoción. Y nada más mejoro, eh, eh, les doy ideas para mejorar su escritura. Ahora, 
es verdad que algunos sí quieren compartir, pero no todos quieren compartir, fíjate. Entonces, yo le he dicho, este, esta, esta escritura sería un excelente regalo para tu papá o para tu mamá en alguna Navidad, en algún cumpleaños, ¿verdad? Si lo quieres compartir con ellos, ¿verdad? A ese nivel, pero si ellos no lo quieren compartir, yo siento que es algo todavía más a un nivel testimonial. Y claro, si le quitamos los nombres, es, son, son geniales, ¿verdad? Son escrituras geniales. Gracias. Muy bien. Este, tengo una pregunta de Nereida que dice, ¿en cuánto tiempo lo hacen, me imagino, la escritura y a qué altura del currículum o del semestre? Eh, esto lo hacemos mayormente eh, ya para el primer mes porque como se, se necesitan varias eh, versiones, en ese primer mes, ya que se conocen, están cómodos, hemos hecho varios ejercicios eh, orales, ya pueden dar sus comentarios en voz alta, ya no tienen tanta pena, como dicen ellos, de, de poder dar su opinión. Entonces ya empiezan a... a eh, los pongo a trabajar y los dejo que ellos escojan con quién quieren trabajar y qué quieren escoger. Esa es la primera parte. Eh, la segunda parte lo hacemos muy rápido para que no se les pierda el, el hilo y luego viene que yo lo reviso, les doy eh, por escrito eh, la revisión y ya hacen una segunda versión y hasta hay quien me dice, yo podría hacer una tercera para mejorar mi nota, podrías hacer una tercera. Entonces los que no caen en esta, en esta categoría de que son escritores muy fuertes, los dejo, eso es parte de su creatividad y parte de su proceso de mejorar el español. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Una pregunta muy interesante aquí en el chat también y que creo todos nos estamos preguntando ahora es si hay algún tipo de archive donde usted tiene estos cuentos. No lo he hecho, pero estoy leyendo aquí en algo del chat que hay quien ya lo hizo y necesitaría obviamente poner, eh, tener el permiso de los estudiantes, yo creo, y todo esto. Entonces sería un proceso un poquito más largo, pero sin duda se puede hacer. No lo, no lo he hecho porque siempre he respetado el, la, la privacidad, eh, lo que escriben, y eso es un muy delicado, muy, muy delicado. Hay quien me ha dicho, jamás, yo no me había acordado de esto desde que sucedió, hasta que lo puse por escrito. Entonces, imagínense la carga emocional que esto supone. ¿no? No, yo no puedo tomarlo y ponerlo así para nada, ¿verdad? aunque le quitara los nombres, para nada, a menos que ellos me permitieran y obviamente quizás en forma anónima sería la mejor manera. Muy bien. Este, creo que hay más que nada ahora comentarios. Este, muy, casi todos diciendo el buen trabajo que es esto. Así que para respetar el tiempo de todos, vamos a hacer lo mismo que hicimos con Emily. Clamps or emoticons are accepted. So gracias, gracias. Muy gracias. bien, muchísimas gracias. gracias. Este, y ahora continuamos con nuestro tercer, bueno, en este caso, sexto póster. Este, la radio como medio masivo para tender un puente entre la herencia hispana y él, y se me corta el título, y el, me imagino algo más, perdón. El español. Bueno, y el español. Oh, we should have done. Muy bien, con Ms. Chávez, este, o doctora Chávez, I'm sorry. ABD, este, ya casi. ABD. Ajá. Casi doctora Chávez, este, sí. nos podría dar un poquito, nos podría dar un poquito de background sobre su proyecto y ya de ahí empezamos con las preguntas. Sí, muchas gracias. Mira, este proyecto nació de la inquietud de dar a conocer la literatura hispana en Estados Unidos, en México, porque es una literatura que cubre mucha parte de la historia de los hispanos en el mundo, en particular en Estados Unidos. Y tenemos una conexión muy fuerte, todos los países de Hispanoamérica, con Estados Unidos. Simplemente aquí en México, estoy en México, cada familia tiene un amigo, primo, pariente, tío, tía, abuelo, abuela, vecino, alguien en Estados Unidos. Hay una conexión con Estados Unidos todo el tiempo. Nos llegan influencias a través del cine, a través de la cocina, la moda, la música. ¿Y por qué no de la literatura? Al fin y al cabo, compartimos el lenguaje, el español, hablamos español, hablamos inglés muchas veces. 
Es muy común ahora que en las escuelas también se incluya el idioma inglés, entonces podemos encontrar poblaciones que son bilingües en México y en Latinoamérica. Y uno de los medios masivos que tiene un gran alcance en las poblaciones y que ha perdurado a través de los años es la radio. No se ha ido, sigue con nosotros. A pesar de tanta tecnología, tantos avances, podemos hacer televisión, películas y lo que queramos en, con un teléfono, la radio está presente. Vamos manejando, podemos poner el radio, la radio, vamos a ver las noticias, qué pasa, el pronóstico del tiempo. Y ahí podemos insertar un poquito de lo que es la literatura. Como a mí me gusta mucho la literatura y yo quería traer algo nuevo a mi país, bueno, pues la literatura hispana en Estados Unidos. Entonces hicimos este proyecto, lo presentamos en la Universidad de Guadalajara que tuvo a bien acogernos y... Desde ahí empezamos, el año pasado, en octubre, con nuestra propuesta, empezamos a trabajar y hasta ahora continuamos, a pesar de todos los inconvenientes que ha generado esta situación de la pandemia, seguimos, continuamos. Muy bien, muchísimas gracias. Este, una de las preguntas en el póster nos, pregu nos dice, Sandy, ¿cómo, ¿cuál es el proceso de escoger libros para el podcast? ¿Cómo, cómo? Mira, inicialmente el proyecto se, o sea, venía todo muy bien organizado, el mapa y todo, pero trabajamos a base de ensayo y error. Y también a base de, nuestra, de nuestros recursos y nuestras necesidades. Inicialmente introducimos lo que es la literatura hispana en Estados Unidos, de acuerdo con la clasificación que propone el doctor Nicolás Canelo de la Universidad de Houston, Tres vertientes, la vertiente nativista, la vertiente de inmigrantes y la vertiente del exilio. Entonces, una vez explicada lo que era la, el concepto de la literatura hispana en Estados Unidos y estas vertientes, introducimos el primer texto de, que pertenecía a principios del siglo XX, que fue Las aventuras de Don Chipote, de Daniel Venegas. Y bueno, fue un éxito. Me atrevo a decir que fue un éxito por los comentarios que obtuvimos a través de los medios de comunicación y, y les gustó mucho, extendimos los episodios, pensábamos cortarlos a cierto punto, pero tuvimos que hacer más porque la gente los pidió. Entonces, después de este texto de inmigración, continuamos con un texto de esta misma época del exilio que fue eh, los de abajo de Mariano Azuela. Y también tuvo un cierto éxito porque era una, un texto muy diferente. Después continuamos con textos de Jovita y Dar, que eran artículos periodísticos, para introducir también a, eh, la voz de una mujer, la voz femenina. Y con eso cubrimos la, la primera parte de, del siglo XX. Entonces, quisimos continuar con otra época. Pero tuvimos eh, ciertos inconvenientes. Mi biblioteca de textos literarios de la literatura hispana aquí en México es muy limitada. Entonces, no hay los, no tenemos estos textos en las bibliotecas tampoco, en la universidad, no hay. Entonces, con lo que teníamos aquí, continuamos. Y nuestro siguiente texto fue, y no se lo tragó la tierra, que tiene lugar en la época de los 50. Entonces, ya avanzamos un poquito más. También un texto nativista. Y de ahí continuamos con los siguientes textos. Después seguimos con La Casa de Mango Street, que también es una, un texto nativista. Y ahora estamos con El Año Que Viene, Estamos en Cuba, que es del exilio. Entonces, es, estamos tratando de cubrir textos contemporáneos de las tres vertientes cuando hacemos eso. Pero ahora tenemos algo especial porque estamos ya tratando los textos de lo, que provienen de los discursos de los diferentes países de Hispanoamérica. En este caso, de Cuba. Los textos anteriores generalmente trataban de la cultura mexicoamericana y ahora ya estamos en Cuba. Entonces, así es como nos estamos guiando. Un poquito con los recursos que tenemos y un poquito con, con esta, eh, esta temporalidad. Muy bien, muchísimas gracias. Este, creo que lo mencionaste ya casi al final, pero ¿cubren algo de la historia con los estudiantes a la hora de hacer estos podcasts? La historia de, hablamos del autor, hablamos del autor, sus antecedentes, hablamos de la historia eh, en, para tener un contexto, el escenario, dónde sucede, en qué tiempo, y 
sobre eso comenzamos la lectura. Damos un antecedente, sí, del libro y del autor. Muy bien, muchísimas gracias. También tenemos varias preguntas aquí en el chat. Una de ellas es, ¿qué acogida ha tenido el proyecto con la comunidad? Este, que creo que se está relacionando un poquito con el rating. Ajá. ¿Nos puedes comentar un poquito de eso? Mira, esos parámetros no tengo yo mucho control y a veces tampoco tengo mucha información porque esta es una radio universidad, no es una radio comercial. Sin embargo, a través de nuestras redes sociales tenemos audiencias en Estados Unidos que era nuestro propósito de establecer un puente entre Estados Unidos y México y mandamos el podcast. Una vez que termine el programa, sale un podcast y lo enviamos a través de todas nuestras redes sociales. Recibimos los comentarios. Hubo una, un, un tiempo en que lo estábamos haciendo en FaceTime en vivo y teníamos muchísimos comentarios en, de, en ese formato. Lo tuvimos que suspender debido a, a las circunstancias que todos conocemos, pero no, no nos detuvimos, continuamos con el programa eh, como podemos desde casa. Y no tenemos ahorita una cierta medida. Además que ahorita la Universidad de Guadalajara está detenida, está completamente parada, cerrada todo. La radio sobrevive porque alguien está ahí tal vez y sigue. La radio, fíjate, fíjense, ¿cómo sobrevive la radio en esta época? Y lo mismo sucedió en los tiempos de guerra. En la posguerra española, después de la guerra civil española, era la manera en que se comunicaba en la radio. Es un medio sumamente eficaz y no se ha ido, no ha caducado. Entonces, es un medio muy poderoso en el que podemos llegar a mucha gente, muchas audiencias en cualquier, en cualquier horario. Muy bien, muchísimas gracias. Este, ¿sabe, ¿Sabe usted el impacto que ha tenido este programa con las escuelas secundarias de la región? ¿O también está, cae bajo el mismo, no sabemos qué está pasando, nomás sabemos que es bueno? Sí, mira, las escuelas de la región, no tengo la certeza, no tenemos la certeza de que lo estén escuchando. Uh -huh. Porque este proyecto, eh, más adelante yo espero poder hacer llegar estos textos, este tipo de textos, compartirlos con las escuelas secundarias de aquí, de tal manera que, un joven que esté cursando el, el sexto, séptimo grado, pueda también tener una conversación con un joven de Estados Unidos que esté cursando ese mismo grado de español y tenga que leer la casa en Mango Street. Entonces ya podemos establecer ahí un puente. Ese es mi, uno de mis propósitos con este programa. Muy bien. Este, otra pregunta que está aquí en el chat de Taft Boiler dice, ¿hablan de la historia de la radio comunitaria y su impacto político en Hispanoamérica? No tenemos nada político, que son puramente literatura. El propósito del programa inicialmente es promover la lectura y dar a conocer la literatura hispana en Estados Unidos. Vale, este creo que en el chat se está preguntando también dónde se puede escuchar este podcast. Creo que Sandy compartió un link. Literario, perdón. Ah, pero, ¿dónde podríamos escuchar los podcasts que están produciendo Ay, ustedes? Sí, mira, la, la doctora Viviana, Edna Viviana, hace ratito presentó una lista de los recursos. Entre esos sí. recursos está de aquí para allá y de allá para acá. Si te fijas en el póster, en el logotipo, el, logotipo, el logo del póster, de esa flechita naranja con la blanca, uh -huh. ese es el logotipo. Si tú vas a, a Radio Universidad de Guadalajara, el el enlace está abajo en el cuadrito, en el rectángulo naranja. En lo último es... Margarita, también en el chat acabo de poner el enlace. Para los ah, que no tienen el acceso gracias. en Wakelet, eh, está el enlace en el chat en estos momentos. Ah, muchas gracias, Viviana. Uh -huh. Ese es, ajá, es un episodio de Y no se lo tragó la tierra. Entonces, ese es un, 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 pues un ejemplo de lo que estamos haciendo. Y si entran ahí, pueden ver todos los otros episodios también. Están todos bajo ese, ese logotipo y tiene el título. Este, estoy viendo que hay otra pregunta en, lo, en el video. Los videos también tienen comentarios. Wow. Este, sí. Si has considerado tener guest speakers en tu, en tu podcast, aparte de leer literatura. Sí, gracias por hacer esa pregunta. Sí, al final del libro hemos tenido un, un web 
un invitado para que nos hable acerca de eh, la obra que terminamos desde un, pu un punto de vista académico, una apreciación literaria. Hemos tenido a la doctora Cristina Campos, también es egresada de la Universidad de Houston y ella nos ha hecho una cápsula más académica acerca del texto y la gente lo ha recibido muy bien. Esto, para decir esto, es por los comentarios que ellos nos comparten. Muy bien. Este, ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Última pregunta para... Sí. Sí, una pregunta para María. Eh, ¿han, han, ¿Han pensado o han tenido algún tipo de actividad también en conexión con los chicos de las secundarias y las preparatorias de la región como para también traer estos textos a, a, que, a que los chicos en las secundarias y preparatorias lo usen? Y o también, ¿qué impacto creen ustedes que tiene a nivel... Eh, programas académicos de licenciatura y maestría para que esta, esta nueva tendencia, bueno, esta tendencia de literatura de inmigración se traiga a, las, a los programas de literatura en México. Wait, I think I lost her. María, ¿aún estás aquí con nosotros? Digo en el chat. Aquí estoy. Oh, ¿Algo? Perdón. Oh. <risa> perdón. Algo pasó, no escuché la pregunta de, de, de Sandy. Sí, la pregunta era más bien como la incorporación, eh, si lo estoy recapitulando bien, en, de, los, de los chicos de la universidad en cuanto a cómo implementar esto ya en, las, en los programas de licenciatura y de maestría, creo. Sí, me imagino que sí, ¿verdad, Sandy? Sandy, sí, no, yo creo que <risa> sí, que, creo que esto puede ser un recurso que pueden, se puede utilizar para complementar alguna clase, porque como ves, son los textos que, que publicarte público, valga la redundancia, y también es, estamos dando cabida a otras editoriales. Y comprende, pues, precisamente la literatura hispana en Estados Unidos. Entonces, puede ser un recurso que vayan a utilizar. Y también, ¿por qué no contamos con lectores invitados? Quien guste, puede ser, quien se interese, puede ser un lector invitado. Solo que sí requerimos que, que tenga ese, no quiero llamarlo compromiso, pero ese entusiasmo de estar con nosotros hasta terminar el libro. Si eres el personaje principal, pues no nos vas a dejar a, a la mitad. Y eso no ha sucedido. La verdad es que quienes han colaborado con nosotros lo han hecho hasta el final. Vale, muy bien. Hay creo que varias personas que se quieren sumar al proyecto como lectores invitados, así que yo creo que contactando a, a María más tarde o de manera sí. privada, dejándole saber su información y que están interesados en leer, sería... Claro, Neiva y Marieva, por favor, mándenme sus datos a mi correo electrónico que está en el póster. Y si gustan, pueden enviar un audio con sus voces para tener un, un banco de voces. Estamos ahora trabajando con literatura de Hispanoamérica. Ahorita tenemos un invitado que es un señor cubano, porque el libro se trata del de año que viene, estamos en Cuba. Y este episodio es el segundo de este libro, va a salir hoy a las 3 de la tarde, hora central. Si hacen clic en el enlace que está ahí, ahí sale el programa, a las 3. No quiero distraerlos del, del seminario, pero es a las 3. El, lo, okay. Con los podcasts ahorita tenemos un poquito de, de espera, porque como les digo, está cerrada la universidad. Entonces no hay técnicos que estén trabajando en esa sección, pero lo pueden escuchar hoy a las 3. Entonces, Muy si bien. gustan, eh, quien quiera colaborar, perdón, en, puedes enviarme, pueden enviarme un audio. En, yo soy María Chávez, soy mexicana, hago esto para tener un banco de voces. Con mucho gusto, ahí lo, recurriremos a ustedes. La verdad que es un, es un placer trabajar con gente que aprecia y que ama la cultura hispanoamericana. Y especialmente estando en Estados Unidos. Porque esto es de aquí para allá y de allá para acá. Muy bien. Muchísimas gracias. Podemos darle un aplauso a María Chávez, casi doctora. <ríe> Muy bien. Este, Muchas gracias. Y más que nada, ya son las dos. Así que me gustaría primero que nada agradecer a, Emily, a la doctora Emily Bernate, a la profesora Verónica León, 
y a la casi doctora María Margarita Chávez por su tiempo y compartir sus experiencias, sus proyectos. Yo creo que todos estamos muy, muy agradecidos con el trabajo que están haciendo y con, con y más que nada que están compartiendo todo con nosotros. Esta, en este momento, no sé si Yoseli o, o Flavia quisieran chime sí. sí, este, Gracias Luis, muchísimas gracias a todos los presentadores, tanto ayer como hoy. Creo que el, el sistema del Padlet funcionó bastante bien. Habíamos, cuando empezamos la planificación, habíamos imaginado realmente usar el almuerzo comunitario y tener los pósters visibles en las paredes, pero bien, pudimos hacer que funcionase con los videos y la verdad que creo que han sido presentaciones todas muy interesantes y que tienen una, una aplicabilidad bastante concreta y sobre todo nos permite colaborar. Así que muchísimas gracias a todos. Entonces, vamos a continuar con nuestra um, agenda de trabajo. Ahora nos toca la presentación de, uh, de Jocel y Delia. Si me permiten, voy a um, justamente presentar a ambas, lo cual es un placer enorme. Uh, hemos estado trabajando juntas ya por varios años y, y realmente la, la, la manera en que, en que nos hemos organizado y la forma en que trabajan ellas ha, ha sido un, un aprendizaje para mí. Entonces, Jocely May native of San Jose, Costa Rica, so beautiful, <laughs> beautiful accent, and she uses both, which I loved. Uh, she's currently a lecturer in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of Texas at Austin, and specializes in teaching courses for heritage Spanish students. Her research interests include pragmatics, emotion in second language acquisition, heritage Spanish learners and pedagogy, as well as linguistic attitudes and language maintenance regarding Spanish in the U.S. Suseli so currently is the co-director of this uh, project, the Texas Coalition for Heritage Spanish, and again, it's a pleasure for me to, to introduce her. Uh, Delia Montesinos, also a very dear colleague, she was born in Mexico in the U.S.-Mexico border, and she received a BA with a major in Spanish from Trinity University at San Antonio. Then she lived for almost 16 years in Spain, in Valencia and Castellón. And then uh, when she came back, she taught Spanish in Roswell Independent School District for several years. Then she got her MA from the University of Texas at Pan American. And finally, in 2000, she received her PhD in Spanish literature from the University of uh, Texas at Austin. Um, she's currently a senior lecturer in this institution for all the heritage classes, and she's the author of two textbooks for teaching Spanish to this population. So please, both of you, welcome. And a wonderful presentation on promoting and advocating for your heritage language program. Muchas gracias, Flavia, que linda. Gracias por tus palabras. Y Delia, ¿estás ahí? ¿Está en mute, Delia? Sí, ya, ya okay, estoy. Ya. Pues, ya hablo. Si quieres, Delia. Ok, entonces hoy vamos a, a hablar de promoting and advocating for your heritage Spanish program, porque yo creo que este es un tema al cual nos enfrentamos todos. Yo sé que cuando llegué en el 95 a UT pregunté que por qué no había cursos de herencia y me dijo, no, los estudiantes de aquí no les interesa. Y me callé un poco, pero luego una colega sí habló más fuerte, empezó poquito a poquito y como digo, Gracias a las colegas, ahora tenemos un buen programa, pero hemos pasado por muchas cosas que les queremos ayudar un poco si están empezando a hacer su programa. Eh, ok, entonces para empezar, bueno, eh, un par de cositas. Vamos, tenemos mucho que compartir, mucho material, entonces vamos a ver, eh, ojalá que nos dé tiempo de cubrir todo. Entonces vamos eh, a tener algunos breakout rooms y los comentarios los vamos a ir poniendo en el chat. Eh, ¿Y qué más? Así que si tienen preguntas o comentarios durante la presentación, creo que Encarna está recolectando preguntas. Y además, ¿algo más iba a decir? Sí, sí. Vamos a llegar a un, este outline que les digo aquí, si todos pueden accesar el Google Drive. Um, donde tenemos todos nuestros documentos. Hay uno que dice Outline for Participants eh, y es un documento en el que pueden, este, pueden download y copiar y después ir eh, tomando apuntes si quieren durante la presentación. Entonces, bueno, 
Eh, nosotras somos del departamento de Spanish and Portuguese here at UT Austin y eh, tenemos un programa que ya tiene varios años y es bastante sólido, un programa muy fuerte para estudiantes de herencia y entonces básicamente decidimos compartir qué es lo que hemos hecho nosotros para pelear por nuestro programa, ¿verdad? Y este tema, al igual que casi todos los temas que hemos eh, hablado en este workshop, vienen de lo que ustedes pidieron el año pasado. En el survey que hacemos al final del, del programa, siempre preguntamos qué otros temas les interesan. Y el de reading fue uno, el de assessment, el de alignment, todos estos, ustedes los han pedido. Entonces, este también eh, nos pidieron que si, que si podíamos hablar un poquito de cómo ayudar a promocionar los programas. Entonces, primero que todo, tenemos que saber por qué se necesita el programa de español como lengua de herencia. Why do we need an SHL program? In order to promote and advocate for the programs, we need to be convinced of the reason ourselves. Nos lo tenemos que creer nosotros de verdad para poder primero eh, estar seguros y convencer a los demás. Pero para hacer eso, primero, we need to understand well the needs of our students. Yo creo que esto es lo más importante. ¿Qué es lo que necesitan nuestros estudiantes? Porque it's not about us, it's about them, ¿verdad? Entonces, bueno, aquí está, les digo lo del outline y ahora entonces, Delia. Sí. Yo se leí tú lo, sí. Este, the goal to the presentation. Bien. Este, hemos creado ya algunos documentos, algunos no los hemos inventado. ¿eh? Perdón. Yeah. Ok. Este, y estos son nuestras metas, ayudaros en lo que sea posible. ¿Quiénes van a ser, quienes van a escuchar nuestros ruegos? Se puede decir, pues los administradores, los consejeros que son clave y también nuestros colegas. Y si ya tienen el programa, a lo mejor algo de lo que nosotros tenemos aquí les puede ayudar para promocionarlo entre tanto el, el instituto, la escuela y también en el departamento y los estudiantes. Entonces, hemos preparado materiales tanto para estudiantes y también para los padres, porque muchas veces hay que convencer este, a los padres. Entonces, les quería mostrar aquí, este es el outline del que estoy hablando. Eh, también puedo poner esto en el chat, por si no lo han podido encontrar, que es el que pueden usar para ir siguiéndonos y tomar apuntes. Ok, eh, seguimos. Entonces, ay, ¿qué hice? Quería poner present. Eh, vamos a empezar con una pequeña self-reflection. Les vamos a dar tres minutitos, o tal vez solo dos, porque ya empezamos tarde, este, para que ustedes piensen en su propio programa, sus propias necesidades. What is my institution's uh, Spanish as a heritage language student population like? Porque todas las poblaciones de estudiantes son diferentes. What are these students' backgrounds? What are the students' needs? What are my goals for these students? And what challenges have I faced regarding this student population at my institution? Entonces, unos dos minuticos para que piensen y pueden anotar en su, en su outline o donde quieran eh, algunas ideas, tal vez. De Alía. Sí. Uh, tú escribiste los dos libros, el que se llama Conectando con mi herencia, lengua y cultura y Abazando lengua y cultura. Sí, y realmente he de decir que los escribí pensando en nuestros estudiantes en UT, porque sí. era material para ellos que eventualmente se convirtieron en libros. Sí. Gracias. Bueno, espero que hayan podido pensar un poquito.
Y entonces ahora, ok, vamos a empezar a compartir. Ahora, nos, eh, lo que vamos a hacer es, en el primer breakout room, vamos a compartir un poco lo que pensamos sobre nuestro propio programa, nuestras necesidades, eh, y vamos a hablar de cuál es la situación de ustedes ahora. Tienen que crear un programa nuevo y tienen que pelear para que les acepten crear un curso nuevo, un programa nuevo, o será que ya tienen un programa y lo quieren promover, ¿verdad? What challenges have you faced regarding this situation in your institution? Y empiecen a hacer un poquito de brainstorm entre ustedes en el grupo. What are some reasons or justifications we can use to promote or advocate for our programs? Tal vez los que ya lo han hecho pueden compartir um, cuál ha sido su experiencia y um, los que todavía no lo han hecho pueden ir pensando en qué, qué es lo que podrían decir. Para... Ok, great. Okay, so based on what you talked about in your um, groups, now we're going to do a little bit of a group brainstorm. So let's tell me why. Why do we need a Spanish for Heritage Language Learners program? What are, okay. why are the benefits? Let's, we're going to put them in the chat. If you just want to type, furiously type everything, because I know there's a million reasons. Okay, I'll start reading, yeah, some of them. I want to read it to you, what they say. Identity, confidence. Um, I think um, they want to, oh. To honor their culture. Or just, mm -hmm. honor their culture, yes. Language equality, sus necesidades lingüísticas. It's long overdue, oh, oh it's too fast. <laughs> confidence. Um, uh, reinforcement between L1 and L2, race awareness, learn about Latinx, history. Uh, ya, ya pueden hablar, ya tienen vocabulario. Preservar la cultura. Long maintenance. Creo que la lista es larga. Sí. <laughs> <laughs> ya no puedo ver. Identity, social justice. Connect with the community. Ok, perfecto. Entonces, Delia, ¿seguimos? Sí. Ok, then what can we say to convince our administrators and colleagues about why we should have this? This was one of the hardest things for us at the beginning. Like I said, I wasn't the one who did it. One of my colleagues did because they kept telling us no in the department. A student, a student needs are different. Yes. Uh, for equity, get on board advisors. <laughs> so, something that administrators and colleagues want to hear about, um, particular administrators, is numbers, right? So, what related to numbers? How does this help our program, our department? Well, for the department, one of our big arguments is that the more heritage learners you get prepared, the more students you'll probably have in upper divisions because we hook them, we prepare them, and then they move forward to upper division. Good argument. What else are people saying in the chat? Um, better student enrollment. Uh -huh. It goes along with what you just said. The student numbers, low numbers, no classes. So it really does go along because the heritage language learners students have very specific needs. Mm -hmm. uh, Spanish students will be prototypes ooh, sooner, right? Okay. Future donors, heritage language learner will be alumni, which will provide money, uh, inclusion, equity, uh, a need for different curriculum. Great. So there's a lot of things now. What about specifically to convince students and or parents that this class is better for them than a different class, than the Spanish one? What would you say? Because it's different things what we say to the admins versus what we would say to the students. How do we hook the students? You will understand me later. 
real world applications. Um, you already speak Spanish. They can preserve the language. Uh, ooh. Los padres latinos valoran la educación. Bridge for AP classes. Job opportunities. Uh, my student get high school credit or middle school, more money. Uh, retención de la lengua, créditos universitarios, cultura. Muy bien. Ok, muchas maneras de enganchar los estudiantes. Pero entonces en, en nuestra presentación lo que queremos hablar es del tipo de materiales que podemos crear para promover y abogar por nuestros programas, ¿verdad? Entonces, we have a list here of materials, different, I mean, this is not a finite list. We have letters, brochures, we can do presentations, make posters, videos, websites, etc. And then we have to think about who the audience is for each of these materials. Is it administrators? Is it colleagues? Is it academic advisors? Is it parents, students, etc. So, you can make any sort of combination, right? You can write letters for admins, letters for students, or posters for colleagues, posters for students, whatever different combination you need for your particular situation. We are going to show you four examples, okay, because we don't have uh, time for more. But that's what we're going to start with. And uh, Delia va a empezar con este, ¿verdad? Sí. Este, he de decir lo primero. Este es una carta mentiritas. No existe, yo creo, este pueblo en Texas ni existen estas personas, ¿eh? Pero es algo que pensamos que podíamos dar a los administradores para convencerlos un poco. Este, ¿puedes agrandar la pantalla un poquito para que la lean? Okay, voy a dejar que cada uno lo vaya leyendo. Y básicamente lo que hicimos al principio es lavarles un poco la cara a los administradores, dándole las gracias por todo lo que hacen, porque sí es verdad, hacen mucho por nosotros. ¿eh? Este, y luego tratar de ver por qué, empezar a ver por qué. Y entonces viendo una forma de seguir lavándoles la cara, pero a la misma vez diciendo para mantener todo lo que han hecho, esto sería bueno que hiciéramos también. Y reconocer que ya hay un programa fuerte. No les queremos decir que somos débiles porque no lo somos, la verdad. ¿eh? Pero decir, lo tienen aquí como para otros estudiantes, pero ahora miren para nosotros, para estos estudiantes que como muchos señalaban, tienen ciertas necesidades. Entonces les tenemos también que decir que no nada más se nos ha ocurrido la idea, sino que lo hemos investigado, hemos visto programas porque... Si se ponen a pensar realmente, eso es lo que estamos haciendo hoy aquí. Eso es lo que hacen continuamente. That's what we do as teachers. We kill ourselves doing things, but we do it. Okay? Y luego ya más específicamente, por si lo demás han leído muy rápidamente, es poner ideas que validen el tener un programa, que nos digan por esto y que les llegue rápido, porque a veces ven una carta larga y este... No la leen, pero si no la leen todo, por lo menos que lean esto. En, me están pidiendo el link para la carta. Todo está en ese Google Drive. Eh, con nuestros documentos, ahí pueden encontrar todo lo que estamos compartiendo. Sí. Y luego termina más o menos diciendo por qué va a ser de beneficio para nuestra escuela, para nuestro distrito, para nuestro programa, para nuestro departamento, lo que sea. Y siempre sacando una cosa que está muy que se considera mucho ahora que estamos viviendo una comunidad global y cada día más y entonces incorporar todas los, los, las razones, los motivos, este, por qué. Entonces vuelvo a decir, esto no es una carta para decir yo la voy a tomar y yo la voy a copiar y la voy a usar. No, es nada más para dar un poco de ideas porque cada uno tiene que escribir su propia carta para que se note que viene desde uno mismo. Les... Ay, una cosa, lo último, dinero. Sí. Diciendo que aunque sabemos que, que costará, el beneficio será mayor. Money is always a big key. Uh -huh. Les queremos compartir también este brochure que creó eh, el Center for Applied Linguistics. 
que se llama Why Start and Maintain an SNS Program. Esto ya es viejito, pero tiene muy buena información que lo pueden usar también cuando ustedes creen sus propias cartas, pueden usar datos también que se incluyen aquí. Um, les puede servir como ejemplo y tiene muchas buenas referencias también. Entonces, ok, vamos a seguir. El segundo ejemplo que tenemos es um, un PowerPoint presentation for academic advisors. ¿Qué es esto? Pues eh, el otro día mencionamos de que es importante que los advisors estén de nuestro lado, ¿verdad? Porque ellos muchas veces son los que les dicen a los estudiantes a qué clase deben ir. Y si los advisors no saben, pues, ¿cómo les van a aconsejar bien a los estudiantes? Entonces, nosotros hace unos años empezamos a hacer unas eh, reuniones con los advisors y vean que estamos en un campus enorme y, pues, no podemos alcanzar a todos, pero extendemos una invitación a todos los advisors que quieran venir y les ofrecemos algo de comer, porque así es como los enganchamos, eh, aprender un poco más sobre nuestro programa. Y lo que hacemos es hacer este PowerPoint, y ustedes también tienen acceso al PowerPoint. Eh, eh, y esto lo hemos creado entre el, el equipo eh, con Delia y María Luisa Chavarría, que también está aquí hoy, y ella trabaja muchísimo con nosotros también en el programa. Eh, así que María Luisa, si tienes algo que incluir también, Bienvenida. Eh, hicimos esta presentación como para básicamente darles a, a entender a los advisors qué es un heritage speaker, porque a veces ni siquiera saben. Si ellos no, no entienden la diferencia, no saben cómo mandar a los estudiantes a cuál clase. Hablamos sobre por qué es importante enfocarnos en estos hablantes con un poco de, de datos estadísticas. ¿Por qué son diferentes de los estudiantes de L2? Y aquí tenemos unas citas de, de una presentación que dio Kim Potowski hace unos años, eh, que lo hace muy claro para, para que los advisors entiendan las diferencias entre los hablantes de L2 y los hablantes de herencia, eh, cómo son diferentes emocionalmente, ac académicamente, cómo son diferentes eh, entre sí, ¿verdad? O sea, hay, es un grupo muy heterogéneo. Eh, y es lo que vemos todos en nuestros alumnos de clase. Nos llegan estudiantes de todo tipo. Eh, y luego, bueno, ¿por qué es mejor tenerlos juntos o tenerlos separados? ¿Y por qué? ¿Y qué pasa cuando no los podemos separar? Pues nos tenemos que poner más creativos. Pero si se puede, tener una clase especial para ellos es lo ideal, ¿verdad? Eh, entonces hablamos de todo esto. Les explicamos en detalle cómo funciona nuestro programa, cuáles son los cursos qué metodología usamos, todo eso se los dejamos, ustedes lo pueden leer con más detalle más adelante. Eh, y bueno, toda nuestra justificación de por qué es mejor para ellos, y al final les decimos, idealmente esos estudiantes deben empezar desde el principio, en el primer nivel que ofrecemos, y los tenemos que poner ahí desde el principio para luego ya encaminarlos bien. Eh, entonces, bueno, este es un ejemplo de cómo ayudamos para que los, los advisors estén de nuestro lado, ¿verdad? Con el... Eh. Sí, y también ayuda para los que no pueden venir a nuestras presentaciones porque se lo mandamos a todos y así lo pueden ver tranquilamente en casa si ellos quieren. Joseli, este, todo lo que estamos haciendo aquí es con Creative Commons, ¿verdad? Porque algunos todo tiene, preguntaban. Todo tiene eh, CC License, sí. correcto. Yeah. CC BY. Entonces, todo lo pueden accesar, eh, nada más es sí, sí, bye. Eh, Delia, estoy pensando que por el tiempo, ¿será que continuamos y hacemos el breakout solo al final? Sí. ¿Qué te parece? Sí. Estamos hablando de que es la primera vez que damos una presentación juntas sin vernos. Así que la comunicación aquí es un poquito <risa> diferente, pero, pero vamos bien, ¿sí? Entonces, en vez de hacer otro breakout para que nos dé tiempo de hacer todo, vamos a seguir con los ejemplos. Uh -huh. eh, el siguiente ejemplo. Eh, Delia, ¿quieres comentar este? Sí, esta es una carta que le pedimos a los instructores de primero, segundo nivel en the L2 classes. We ask them, please identify students who you think would be good students to, to go to the heritage program. And so, um, Our program director actually created this letter and she said we could use it. So it's a letter that we sent to prospective second line uh, heritage students. Um, it has to almost go out the first or the second day of classes because so that they can enroll or move around. 
but our department's really, really good. Our advisors help us a great deal doing this. So, and, and of course, all the instructors in sending these letters out. Una cosa que sí les decimos, nada más porque se llama Pepe Martínez o Janice Long. ¿Eh? No, el nombre no me va a decir nada, porque yo he tenido algunos estudiantes que los veo entrar a la clase y digo, pero ¿qué hace esta persona aquí? Y me empiezan y digo, aquí es donde tienes que estar. Y hay otros que tenemos que hablar con ellos y ser, hacerles sincero. Sí les voy a decir, nuestros cursos son un poco retadores. Este, y entonces nos gusta que entren todos, pero les tenemos también que dejar saber todo lo que esperamos de ellos. Pero sí, es una forma de que los estudiantes decidan venirse a las clases. Porque la carta viene directamente de el Language Program Director, eh, pero viene con nombre y apellido porque el instructor ya los identificó, ¿verdad? Entonces, este es un trabajo que... Eh, Es difícil, pero, pero funciona, ¿sí? Ok. Um, ahora pasemos al último ejemplo, que es nuestro website y el video que creamos um, para convencer a los estudiantes. Ok, ahorita estamos hablándole a los estudiantes uh, themselves. Entonces, bueno, esa es nuestra página del departamento y empezamos, aquí hay una, un, un pequeño párrafo. Are you a Spanish heritage learner? Entonces describimos, did you grow up here or speaking Spanish at home? Como para que ellos se identifiquen. Y entonces describimos las diferencias que hay. No todos son iguales. Eh, algunos pueden hablar bien, otros no. If you fit any of these descriptions, then these courses are for you. Entonces ellos como más o menos se pueden um, self-identify. Ese es otro tema para otro día. Nosotros tampoco tenemos un placement exam. Ellos eh, solitos se pueden inscribir en los cursos. Y aquí tenemos la lista de los cursos que damos, pero lo que más nos gusta que vean es este video. Eh, porque en el video, bueno, se los voy a poner, pero lo que van a ver es que María Luisa y yo hablamos un poco. Nosotras escribimos el script y trabajamos con el equipo de producción, pero lo que más queríamos es que hablaran los estudiantes themselves, que ellos son los que den el mensaje de por qué deben otros estudiantes tomar estas clases. Entonces el, el video dura unos cuatro minutos, pero eh, creo que vale la pena mirarlo. I'm from Cali, Texas, and I grew up speaking Spanish at home primarily, and I never learned it academically or formally. It was the first language I learned because my parents moved here from Guanajuato, Mexico. So that's what I learned first. My dad's from Mexico City and my family still lives there. So I had to learn Spanish growing up in order to communicate with them. Interacting with my grandma and my mom every single day throughout my just my career in academics and also just spending every weekend in Mexico to visit my father. I was born in Zacatecas, Mexico, and my family is also from Zacatecas, Mexico. The students you just heard are all Spanish heritage learners. Heritage learners grew up learning Spanish from their parents, extended family, or community, but their dominant language might now be English. Here at UT, we have a strong program specifically designed for heritage Spanish learners. Our courses are accelerated because we work with the students' linguistic strengths and focus on their specific needs. Therefore, heritage track students can advance more quickly in their linguistic proficiency and fulfill their language requirements faster than traditional Spanish track students. Through readings and activities that have cultural and practical relevance, students are able to further their understanding of their community's history, reflect on their personal role, and discover pride in their Hispanic identity. Through our courses, students gain a strong grasp of the Spanish language as well as the confidence to use their bilingual and bicultural skills in multiple contexts, including formal, academic, and professional settings, which will help them in their future careers. These classes have really helped me because in high school I took a uh, Spanish class for three semesters, but here is where I've really expanded and learned to value it a lot. And I would like to go back to my high school and give back and teach as many people as I can because I truly believe that being bilingual is something really important and special. I now have my Spanish that I can use at home, but I also have my Spanish where I can use in a professional environment. If you're thinking about taking these classes, I say that you absolutely should. They have taught me so much and they've influenced so much of my academic career here at UT. And not only that, but you'll like meet your best friends through it. These classes have helped me because 
I feel like being on big, a big, really big campus where it's kind of hard to find people like you, and you can come into a class like this where everybody has been exposed to your culture or a culture that's near yours, and it's just nice to be in that kind of environment. After taking my first Spanish class, I fell in love with it and I fell in love with my culture that it made me decide to change my major to Spanish and now I want to become a Spanish professor. When I finally got home and started speaking Spanish with my dad, I basically no longer kind of felt embarrassed about the way I talked. Um, this class really helped me with my confidence in speaking. If you are thinking on whether or not you should take a Spanish heritage speaking class, I would say go for it 100% it's for you just even knowing that you're thinking about it should get you excited simply because it's a whole new different experience and it's something that actually help you dive into more on your own culture and actually figure out more about yourself and find a safe space on campus that maybe you haven't found before. If you're thinking about taking this class, I would say that in reality you should do it because here you will learn a lot and as my experience here sentir más cómodo y aquí es donde hice muchas amistades que pienso que van a dar por uh, toda mi vida. Si tienen cualquier pregunta, por favor, escríbanos. Esperamos verlos en nuestros cursos muy pronto. Ok. Eh, muy bien, entonces, bueno, ese es el, el video que fue un Labor of Love, eh, crearlo, es, fue un gran trabajo y lograr que nos dieran los fondos también para pagar, porque que lo hicieran profesionalmente, eh, entonces estamos muy contentos de que pudimos lograr eso y, eh, ok, esos son nuestros cuatro ejemplos que les traemos hoy, entonces ahora lo que queremos hacer es, eh, Delia, ¿quieres comentar esto? Sí, entonces ahora es un breakout room un poco más extendido porque sé que nos quedamos cortos de tiempo antes, pero aquí es un momento que en grupos más pequeños podemos hablar de estas cartas. ¿Merecen la pena? ¿No merecen la pena? ¿Los videos merecen la pena? ¿Los PowerPoints? ¿Cómo pueden, puedo aplicar esto a mi programa y qué es lo que cambiaría? Y hablar de los ejemplos. Y nada más porque yo sé yo yo estemos dentro de vuestro grupo, no pensar que no podéis hablar de nada. Eh? Por favor, sed sincero. Come on, we're used to getting criticism left and right. So it just sort of slides off. The good things stay and the bad things disappear. Entonces, por favor, con toda confianza, hablar de ello. Ok, entonces, es, aquí dice solo es de los dos ejemplos, pero hablen sobre los cuatro ejemplos que les dimos, qué les parecen, strengths and weaknesses, etcétera, ¿verdad? Y luego, la idea es que lo más importante es cómo les puede ayudar en sus propios programas. Eh, Sarah, I think we can do the breakout rooms again now. Okay. Delia, no entres eh, right away para hablar contigo un segundo, ¿sí? Sí. All right, I'll do the same rooms as before. Thank you. I'm running now. Um, Delia. Espera, yo creo que todavía les falta algunos. Do, are there people who haven't been assigned or? Well, there's some people who haven't gone into their rooms. That everyone's assigned except Carl. I don't know if you want to be assigned to a room. Probably not. I no. I just arrived, so I'm catching, kind of catching up on things. Okay. <clears throat> And I'm watching the Somebody chat. else just, um, two other people just came into the uh, main room too. I don't know if they were previously assigned, but. Okay. <laughs> Looks like they're assigned. Yeah, so there's some people left, but they've all been assigned. Oh, there's another one. Que estoy viendo el tiempo y podemos darles un poquito más si quisiéramos. 
que lo que nos queda es básicamente las preguntas, ¿no? Sí. Y es que los cinco minutos se nos quedaron cortos, aunque nada más éramos cuatro realmente hablando. Entonces, sí, si claro. les podemos dar un poquito más de tiempo, 12 o 13 minutos, mejor. Sí, este, porque tenemos hasta las 3 y 15, y en realidad lo único que más vamos a hacer es ya comentarios y preguntas. Mm. Eh, entonces, las podemos dar hasta... ¿10 minutos más? ¿Sí? ¿Sí? Me parece bien. So, Sarah, like, 10 minutes starting now, maybe? Okay. So it, would, it, would, it would be a little bit more than 10 total, so. Yeah, so you, do you have extra time? Yeah, I think so. I think yeah, we went so one. fast. <laughs> we were oh. so we concerned about time. Because we were worried we weren't going to have time, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, and I think this will be a good breakout room. So, yeah, if we can give them the 10 minutes from now, I think it would be great. Sounds good. Okay, okay, I'm going to go to my room. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna join the room too. Oh, yeah. I, I'm ready to join a room if you can put me in. Oh yeah, sure. Oops. I'll find one that doesn't have as many people. Oh, they're all kind of equal. All right, you should have gotten an assignment, Carl. Yeah, got it.
Hey, Sarah, I like your collection of backpack. Sorry? Say, I like your collection of backpacks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I hung it in there. Yeah, I didn't realize that's what was behind me. <laughs> was everything going okay with the chat? It was really moving fast there. Yeah, it was moving really fast all at the same time. Even when I minimized, as you say, it was still coming down really fast. I think because they were all writing at the same time. Yeah. But now it's fine. I mean, it's slowed down. There's a couple of good quotes. No questions, more than a good comments. Yeah. Yeah, it's great that people are responding so much. Yeah. It really has been good. Everybody has been pretty involved. Yeah. just kind of weird the format yeah. is kind of I mean it's just a matter of getting used to it but yeah it's definitely not the same no it definitely is not it has I mean like everything else in life the plus and the minus just it's yeah. just a different experience but it is is the way the future is going to be Yep, I think so. So let's hope not. Let's let's try. I hope not that. either. Yes, I hope not either. But maybe a combination of. <laughs> yeah. So we can have the best of both. I can't believe it's almost three. It goes fast. I mean, even yeah. if it seems like it's a long day, it go it go fast. It goes fast, yeah. You're back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it looks like everyone's out of the rooms. Okay, are we all back? And Tan says, bueno, como les fue? Um, Supongo que muchos tenemos mucho que decir. Delia, ¿estás ahí? Sí, aquí estoy. Ya eh, voy, a micrófono. voy a compartir la pantalla de nuevo. Y no, eh, queríamos dejar eh, suficiente tiempo para que comentemos y respondamos preguntas que tengan. Entonces, no, Delia, ¿cómo quieres hacer esto? No, yo creo que, que pueden ir poniendo en el chat. Este, y en Carna si lo puedes ir viendo, pero también si hay alguien que quiere hacer algún comentario que no se sienta cohibido. Lo único que sí voy a pedir, no nos queda mucho tiempo, entonces los comentarios que sean cositas breves, por favor. Ok. ¿Quieres lo, ¿Queréis los comentarios uh, que hay de anterior o queréis los no. que o Mejor, o sea, si hay preguntas, dudas que hayan quedado para nosotras, hagamos eso primero. Ok. Si quieren que eh, hablemos más sobre alguno de los temas o de los ejemplos, etc. Um, ok. No, Lely, ¿por qué no les explicas un poquito todo lo que hicisteis para lograr el video? Que creo que le ha interesado a muchos poderlo hacer. Ha habido muchos comentarios que les ha gustado el video. Sí. Los comentarios han sido que les ha gustado el video. No ha habido preguntas específicas uh, sobre... Hay comentarios. Okay, so, pero si tú quieres explicar eso, yo salí de estar hacia adelante con el video. Pues sí, como les dije, primero tuvimos que, bueno, nosotros ya habíamos, nosotras habíamos creado Delia y este un video así como homemade, ¿verdad? Donde le pedimos a algunos estudiantes que nos mandaran un video explicando por qué ellos recomendarían los cursos. Pero llegó un punto en que dijimos, no, la verdad es que nuestro programa ya está bastante grande y necesitamos algo hecho profesionalmente y entonces... O sea, ya no recuerdo cómo fue, pero eh, tuvimos que convencer al departamento de que nos dieran dinero para eso, porque el, el, eh, es caro, ¿verdad? Tener el equipo que vaya a filmar, 
eh, a los estudiantes en el salón de clase y luego reservar el estudio con todo el equipo profesional. Eh, pero, con, pero pedirle a los estudiantes, eh, todos esos chicos estuvieron en mis clases y pedirles que, que compartieran no fue difícil. Eh, algunos más tímidos que otros, porque habla al final, el que habló en inglés y en español, él fue el más tímido de todos, o sea, cuando en mi lo tuve como dos, dos o tres semestres, y el primer semestre, el primer día que lo puse a hablar enfrente de la clase, casi se muere, eh, entonces haberle pedido eso ya al final fue mucho, pero lo hizo, y ellos como que de verdad se sienten que es, que es, it's worth sharing, ¿no? Eso fue lo lindo de... de del video es ver que los estudiantes de verdad querían compartir con los demás, como para, para convencer a otros estudiantes de que, de que lo hagan. El, María Luisa está por ahí también, no sé si María Luisa tiene algún comentario de, del video. No, es que exactamente como dijiste, los chicos tenían muchas, muchas uh, opiniones sobre lo positivo que había sido para ellos eh, participar en, estas, uh, en estos cursos que les sorprendieron a ellos mismos. Uh -huh. Ok, Jocely, también si tenemos un momentito, me gustaría que Luis Avilés hablara con nosotros porque él ha tenido la experiencia de estar trabajando con los dos grupos. Oh, sí, perdón. ¿Cuáles son los grupos? Lo siento mucho. Sí, your L2 and the Heritage Learners. Oh, yeah, they're very different. <laughs> este... I, I, I feel like, me siento como venado lampareado. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. I mean, they're very different in a, in a sense that um, the heritage learners have more of a craving for cultural, um, cultural content. Um, I feel that after teaching both of the classes, um, you can see that the students that are more engaged with their history and their culture ha go off for further, go further into the language, feel more motivated in the long run and really want to continue. I still get emails from them asking them, asking me what's the next class and asking if any, who's teaching the classes, what's the intel on the content. So mm -hmm. they're very engaged and they're very um, into the class, into the material and the curriculum. I don't know if I'm answering the question, to be quite honest. Yes, that's it. No, that's okay. It was great. Yeah. So, in Katna, are there more questions about the presentation? Uh, yes, there's a couple of comments, and there's a um, there's one question. Um, I think one of the questions has already been answered, but the question is, is there a database, a list of U.S. college, university with Heritage Spanish program? Um, someone answer uh, Jake Call, C-A-L. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. So there used to be a website where somebody was keeping track of all the programs, but the, it stopped being updated a few years ago. But on our web heritage website, the CORAL website um, that we've been sharing, we have a list of program profiles where whoever wants to submit their uh, university program profile will happily put it there. And we have some already. Okay. Uh, the other question I see uh, for you guys is, what do you say to students who are afraid to register? because they think their standard isn't strong enough. Well, we have, we really have some very good supportive advisors in our department. We have two advisors and generally they'll send them to talk to us. Mm -hmm. Y allí vienen y nos hablan y empezamos a hablar con ellos y vamos más o menos dándonos cuenta y tranquilizándolos. Ahora, no les vamos a decir, si sí, toma la clase porque te lo vas a pasar muy bien, todo eso. Somos sinceros porque es necesario que ellos sepan de qué se trata. Pero creo que eso a mí por lo menos me ha ayudado mucho que me manden lo, a los estudiantes para hablar con ellos. Yo sé. Sí, y hay que ex, ex, explicarles exactamente qué es lo que van a hacer y por qué es bueno para ellos. Y también lo comparamos con lo que harían en el otro curso para que se den cuenta de cuáles son las diferencias, pero ser muy honestos con ellos y decirles, vas a trabajar mucho, uh -huh. eh, pero les explicamos el tipo de estudiantes que va a haber en la clase con ellos eh, y luego ven el video y lo escuchan de otros estudiantes. Entonces, eh, no es difícil convencerlos una vez de que, de que los tenemos ahí. Sí, y lo otro que los invitamos a que vayan a nuestras clases, pero siempre diciéndoles de antemano, vas a entrar en una clase que ya se está desarrollando o está terminando. No pienses que ese es donde vas a empezar, uh -huh. para que no se asusten. Uh -huh. 
¿Alguien más quiere saber cómo le hacen para llegar a los estudiantes que no están en el Departamento de Lenguas Extranjeras? Bueno, nos llegan estudiantes de todo lado, eh, de todo el campus, de todos los majors posibles, eh, porque la mayoría tiene que tomar un foreign language requirement, ¿verdad? Y casi todos quieren tomar español. Entonces, eh, por eso es que queremos que todos los advisors sepan sobre nuestro programa, no solo los de nuestro departamento, sino los advisors de natural sciences, de ingeniería, bueno, ingeniería no porque no tiene foreign language, pero pues de los otros eh, majors del campus, que todos sepan la diferencia, porque casi todos los estudiantes tienen que tener eh, algún crédito de español. Entonces, así es como... Eh, les llegamos a, a ellos. Pero, sí, y yo creo que el video, Joseli, les, les hace entender a los estudiantes. Y, por ejemplo, María Luisa me estaba diciendo el semestre pasado de la gran variedad de majors que tenía en su clase y es increíble, si nos llega de todo. Ajá. Creo que la pregunta va más bien, ¿cómo los recruited? Porque uh, la persona dice, ellos tienen muchos estudiantes que son de herencia, pero no están interesados en tomar clases de español. So, ¿Qué hacen para provocarles que vayan? Bueno, ok, lo que pasa es que por el foreign language requirement, tienen que ellos quieren, o sea, tienen que tomar una lengua, ¿verdad? Mm -hmm. Entonces, ahí primero es el trabajo de los advisors, decirles no tomes Spanish one, toma Spanish for heritage learners. Una vez que ya los tenemos en nuestra clase, ahí es donde los enganchamos y les decimos, ok, si tomas un par de cursos más, puedes tener un certificate en Spanish for business o Spanish for the medical, medical. professions. Entonces, eh, y una vez que están en la clase se dan cuenta, oh, this is actually fun. I can do this. I like this class. I'll just take the next one and then a couple more classes and then I'll have it on my transcript that I have this certificate or this minor o lo que sea. Entonces, si lo primero es, el trabajo es de los advisors y de la, del website e informarlos para que, el, aunque sea solo un curso de español que tienen que tomar, que sea el de Heritage, si es que son Heritage students, para engancharlos de esa manera y que luego quieran seguir con nuestros cursos. Uh, creo, y eso es un comentario más que una pregunta, pero quizás podríais hablarlo. Dice, we do a lot of outreach presenting to freshman advisors about our classes, but the hardest people to convince are our Spanish speaking faculty that don't teach languages. Mm -hmm. Delia, ¿quieres hablar de eso? Porque eso es muy cierto. <laughs> ok. Este, hay un grupo en UT del cual este, este año Joseli es co-faculty chair, que se llama the Hispanic Faculty and Staff Association. Y es un sitio donde también podemos hablar con ellos y ellos nos apoyan. Y entonces no solamente tiene que ser faculty, sino muchas veces son los consejeros, las personas que sus estudiantes ven en el campus. Entonces es presentarle a todos los grupos que puedan tener contacto con estos estudiantes y hablarles de nuestro programa. Y es más, este, este año, yo sé, bueno, y otros años también, han preguntado, the, the staff, can you set up a class for us? Sí. Porque tienen Pero interés. yo creo que, Entonces, lo que lo que se refieren es a profesores, tal vez, que no enseñan lengua y que más bien, yo he hablado con profesores, eh, que dicen, ay no, cuando, cuando me, a mi clase de escritura, cuando me llega un heritage speaker, ay no, qué pereza, porque no entienden qué es lo que hacemos con ellos y el valor que tienen estos cursos para los estudiantes. Entonces yo creo que parte de eso es como decir, en uno de los slides pusimos, eh, how to convince your colleagues también, y mm -hmm. para ellos es similar la información que damos, la información que damos a, a los advisors de explicarles la diferencia, los beneficios y también que lo escuchen, que vean el video, que lo escuchen de los estudiantes y, y que hablen con los instructores. Por ejemplo, les mandaría yo a Luis para que Luis les diga su experiencia y cuánto le gustó dar el curso, porque muchas veces si no han estado en un salón de clase de Heritage Learners, es difícil que ellos entiendan eh, por qué es tan importante. Mm -hmm. um. Aparte, también quería saber, uh, hay otro comentario y dice, In my school, we have a lot of difficulties with parents that refuse to have their kids in advanced courses. They think that L2 classes will help kids GPS. How we can convince them? We generally, I find that very often it's just the opposite. Se nos aburren en las clases de L2. 
empiezan uh -huh. a dejar de hacer las tareas, la nota va de mal a peor. Y luego cuando van avanzando, lo más triste es que se van dando cuenta que estos estudiantes, yo ya estoy en un intermedio, pero este estudiante americano lo hace mucho mejor que yo, porque no se dan cuenta que ellos no han hecho el esfuerzo anterior. Y entonces cada vez se van sintiendo más cohibidos frente a una población que debería de hablar lo peor que ellos, que lo está mejorando. Y más que todo es en la escritura. Yo creo lo que a muchos de estos estudiantes este, les da un poco de miedo. Lectura y escritura, pero más en la escritura. Y yo creo que hay que hacerle ver a los, a los padres eh, que ya es una ventaja, que lo vean como algo positivo, que lo es, ¿verdad? Que lo vean desde el principio como algo positivo, lo que su hijo ya tiene de conocimiento de la lengua y de la cultura, le va a ayudar a avanzar más rápido. Eh, y entonces, la nota no va a ser mejor en la otra clase solo porque, bueno, depende, claro, de cada institución, ¿verdad? Pero en nuestra, en nuestra experiencia no les va mejor en las clases de L2. Más bien se aburren y terminan sacando nota más baja porque no estaban engaged, ¿verdad? Okay. Um, querían saber si podían utilizar los PowerPoints con, los, con sus administradores. Sí, todo está ahí para que lo usen. Todo tiene Creative Commons, CC BY, License. Um, así que ojalá les sirva. Uh, creo que si queréis preguntarles directamente a ellos, esas han sido las mayores preguntas um, que ha habido. Antes de seguir, eh, de terminar con más comentarios, eh, el trabajo que les dejamos on your own, y está el último slide. Eh, no, lo, no es que lo vamos a hacer ahora, pero es la tarea para, si, opcional si lo quieren hacer es pensar en todo lo que hemos hablado, what would be the most useful promotional materials for your program, and think about how you can create your own work. ¿Qué es lo que más le serviría a uh, una carta, un video, una presentación? Y who the audience will be for your materials. Y recuerden que para crear los materiales, primero hay que pensar en las necesidades de sus estudiantes, su población. What is your student population like? What are their needs? And what are your goals for those students? Y ya saben que nos pueden contactar si tienen alguna pregunta y los, los podemos apoyar de alguna manera. Pero quería dejarles la tarea y ahora tenemos como cinco minutos más si alguien quiere hacer comentarios o preguntas. Solamente quiero decir una cosa y, me, y luego lo dejo. Ah, Delia, varios te dan gracias por tus libros. Muchas gracias. Les voy a decir, esos libros nacieron porque yo estaba creando todo este material en Canvas. Este, y luego dije, no, no está bien, porque nuestros estudiantes van a tener un montón de papel y los otros estudiantes en L2 tienen un libro. Era como menospreciarlos un poquito y de allí salió el libro. Y he de darles las gracias también a María Luisa y a Jocely que me, me han ayudado mucho este, dándome ideas. Okay. So I would encourage, write your book for your own student population. Mm -hmm. And now you know how to write an um, open source textbook, too. Yes. Okay, Joseli, ellos tienen acceso en, allí en al PowerPoint también a todo, ¿verdad? Y allí está el enlace. Alguien preguntaba el, para el video verlo. If you just put you, Texas, Department of Spanish, Portuguese, Heritage Ahí Learners, it will take you straight to it. Más bien, si quieren les, les muestro cómo más fácil encontrarlo. Si ponen en Google Spanish and Portuguese UT, la primera página. Joseli, mientras tanto, Marta y Lucía, okay. las dos han pedido la palabra. Ok, nada más rápido. Aquí este está directamente el enlace que dice Heritage Language Program. Oh. Y ahí está. No sabía. ¿Quién quería hablar? Marta y Luciris tenían preguntas. No vi. Ok. Um, yo solamente quería hacer un comentario para aquellos que estén, creo que más secundaria, menos college. Um, 
Y él ha hecho ese comentario con mi grupo, si están comenzando un programa y tienen algún tipo de uh, problemas con la administración de aceptarlo, una de las cosas que yo vendo, desgraciadamente, uh, con este programa es unas mejoras en la disciplina, en los comportamientos disciplinarios de los estudiantes y en la asistencia. Y de nuevo, esto es una visión muy estereotípica, muy racista, muy discriminatoria, pero trabaja. Ah, lo, eh, yo cuando hablo con mis administradores, les explico la importancia de cuando los estudiantes están en un grupo donde se sienten, they, they belong, ah, tienden a tener menos problemas disciplinarios porque el hecho es que Muchos de mis estudiantes están en suspension, en detention constantemente. Y el trabajo de un maestro de herencia, uh, de nuevo, orgánicamente es de mentor, es de social worker, es de puente con la administración, es de puente con los padres. Entonces, eh, nos ponemos mucho trabajo encima y that's not ideal. I don't think it is, but it is what it is. Y, um, y es una buena manera para que los administradores que en el fondo están viendo cómo quitarse problemas de en medio, te digan, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Uh, sobre todo para comenzar el programa. Una vez que el programa empieza, mi experiencia es que it runs itself. Después del segundo año, cuando los estudiantes empiezan a hablar unos con otros y realmente they belong there. Ellos están felices allí porque lo que estamos haciendo no es que sea fácil y aburrido. Es que es challenging, pero a la vez es lo que ellos tienen que hacer, es relevante para sus vidas, um, aquello funciona solo. Gracias. Gracias, sí, es bueno tener esa perspectiva de, de los estudiantes más jóvenes. Y creo que Luciris también. Sí, eh, de hecho era sobre el mismo tema que acaba de discutir Marta. Eh, yo desafortunadamente tuve que aprender, aprender a golpes cómo comunicarme con la administración. Uh, la primera vez que hablé con la administración, llevé los trabajos de mis estudiantes, llevé testimonios del amor que habían desarrollado mis chicos en relación al español y la administración no quiere saber nada de eso. Entonces, mi sugerencia es el idioma de la administración son números, son estadísticas. Entonces, entre más uno pueda uh, medir learning outcomes, medir successes beyond high school y traer pie charts, graphs, et cetera, that's administrators love language. We are moved by the personal story and connections. Admins are thinking about central office that's saying, you're spending too much money, et cetera. So, uh, nosotros también tenemos que ser bilingües y saber el idioma de la administración. Um, y ellos están en otro mundo preocupados por cosas que, que a lo mejor no son las cosas que nos informan a nosotras como como docentes. Y es cierto, y, y es algo que estábamos hablando en mi grupo de que nosotros somos como instructores de estos cursos, tenemos dos trabajos, porque no es solo ir y dar las clases, sino como, como dice el título de la presentación, abogar por, o advocate for these programs. Es diferente el, el trabajo de enseñar un curso regular donde no tenemos que pelear por, por los cursos, ¿verdad? Entonces nos toca doble, pero, pero es como, it's a labor of love, la, por amor al arte, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. ¿Qué más? ¿Alguien más? Bueno, yo digo, si me permiten, eh, felicitarles por sus cuatro ejemplos. Me gustaron mucho. Eh, creo que algunas de estas cosas las vamos a adaptar a nuestro propio programa porque estamos reformulándolo. Eh, una dificultad que encontramos siempre es, nosotros tenemos un alto porcentaje de estudiantes hablantes por herencia en nuestro campus, pero eh, desorientados por los consejeros se van a los cursos regulares, a veces porque les hacen creer que no van a recibir créditos o que eh, no necesitan ese tipo de clases, eh, hay todo tipo de, de malos entendidos y ahí está nuestro trabajo de ir con estos consejeros y, y y hacerles ver, eh, orientarles, porque en vez de orientar a los estudiantes, a veces los desorientan de esa manera. Eh, tenemos un consejero particular nuestro en el departamento, Spanish Advisor, y, y generalmente vamos a encaminar a estos chicos que se han metido, estas chicas, a los cursos regulares. Eh, los uh, colegas los, uh, les encaminan a que hablen con la, uh, nuestra consejera, uh, 
el departamento. Y, y ahí es donde entra todo este trabajo de motivación que hemos estado comentando. Eh, aún así, el problema es que legalmente vemos que no los podemos obligar legalmente a que se salgan de los cursos regulares y se vengan a los nuestros. Entonces, es una labor de, de convencimiento, de, de que se sientan orgullosos o, o interesados por, por um, nuestra cultura, eh, lo que ofrece el, el aprender eh, el español, no nada más hablado, sino, eh, como les decimos, pasar de hacer la transición de, de ser bilingüe a ser, si queremos, biletrado a apreciar nuestras tradiciones culturales, nuestra herencia histórica. Eh, todo eso es el, el trabajo de convencimiento y eh, pues sí, hasta ahora estamos en, en un poco ese trabajo de, de lograr, eh, porque debemos tener eh, estudiantes para muchas secciones y sin embargo a veces estamos bajos en los números por esas razones. Pero gracias, gracias por gracias. todo lo que nos Gracias por su comentario. Eh, yo creo que se nos acabó el tiempo ya. Sí, ¿Verdad? Estamos sobre la hora ya, sí. Uh, so, Joseli, ¿qué okay. más? So, yeah, so for the last final roundtable, a couple of years ago for the workshop, we started um, finishing the workshop in this way where we have all the presenters and we can answer any questions and just kind of like a debrief at the end of the workshop to see if there are any leftover questions or comments. And I know um, there's a lot to think about and talk about, but what, what I'm gonna do is, oh, can you help me uh, be a host so I can share my screen, Sarah, please? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm gonna share the screen. There's a list of questions that some of you are already looking at, I see, because they're on the Google Drive. Um, and, It just says, what is your main takeaway from this two-day workshop? How can you apply some of what you learned into your own work? What is one thing you're definitely planning to do or incorporate in your own program or classes? There's probably more than one, but if there's one thing that you end up doing, then it was worth spending um, the time here, I hope. And then what other questions do you have about the topics covered in the workshop and what other topics would you like to learn more about? So think about all these questions and we're gonna have one final breakout group for the workshop to talk about this, kind of like your last um, um, final thoughts. And then when we come back from the breakout room, you'll have a chance to ask any questions or make comments. Okay, so um, Sarah, can we make some rooms? I don't know if you want to do the same ones or different ones. Doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, probably. Maybe, maybe maybe let's make different ones so we can meet new people. Oh yeah, that sounds fun. Okay. How many people do you want per room? Um, same five, five or so. It's good. Five yeah. or six. Yeah. Okay. And we're gonna have how long, Flavia? Did we say 20 minutes? Like 20 minutes, so everybody have about five minutes to, to talk and really we have a, a nice conversation. Otherwise it's too short, the, the time is too short. Yeah, okay, so 20 minutes. All right, I'm opening them now. Um, so I think we can either use the chat for questions, and I know Maria Luisa was gonna maybe monitor the questions or comments or if people want to, if you have a specific question for a specific presenter, you can do that. Or if you have a general question for um, anyone, that is welcome as well. And if you just want to also share, like what's the, your big takeaway or what you're going to apply for your own program or something you would like to learn more about. So this is kind of a, now the time to speak, so. Um, okay, I, I have a comment. Um, I, in my group, I ex expressed the thought that um, how important this is that the work that you guys are doing, not just for Spanish, and I, I know that I'm the only German here, but, um, and I was telling them when I came to the United States, I was 10, I was nine and a half, almost 10 years old, and I had to leave my German behind. I was not allowed to speak German once I got here. Um, it was forbidden at school. There were no classes for me. There were no ESL. There was nothing. It was sink or swim. And that was it. And um, 
I remember having to, um, the fight for me to be, have the right to speak German was obviously a, a lost cause because there was no one else to fight with me because there was nobody else that spoke German. And when I saw the Spanish fight for their language, I kept being, people used to say to me, they should just speak English. They, should, they live in America, they should just speak English. And I'm like, oh no, 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 let them fight, let them go. Because I saw the handwriting on the wall. I knew that the day would come if they won, that I would get to speak German as well. And that's something that even though you may not know you, 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 you guys did, but because of your fight, we, the rest of us, the Germans, the, Spanish, the, the, the Russians and all the rest of us get to speak our language and we don't have to hide anymore either. So this is extremely, the work is extremely important. It is not, it's not just for you, it's for everyone. No offense, but this will benefit everyone if you know what I'm talking about. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for being here too. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing as, as an outsider, as somebody who is eavesdropping on the conversation and enjoying, it, you know, working on my Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, I think about a lot of the things that are translate to my area of language instruction. So the, the, what I like about this particular group, even though I'm peripheral and an outsider, is there's a lot that I can take back. There's a lot that's immediately relevant. But um, you're right, we are all kind of connected. And, and the heritage language teachers and the heritage language students are much more woke as a group, we'll use that word, because they do think about it in terms of their rights. And speaking a language is fundamentally a right. You have the right to speak your own language. And more and more, we're talking about developing identities in the language classroom. So yeah, you guys are on the cutting edge. You really are. Thank you, Carl. And Joseli and Flavia, just what, because in the group where I was, there were two people uh, who had very good ideas that I think would be excellent presentations for next year. Uh, where do they sign up or where can we convince them to sign up? <laughs> <laughs> I like the convince part. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We will be sending an email probably on Monday. Uh, okay. Just with general information, we'll repeat the links, uh, the survey again, and also a sign up sheet for anyone that is interested in participating as a presenter or just with the posters or creating a full session if you feel like you would like to have like with other people ideas that you have shared and have a round table round table that, exactly we can do that so but, so the, email, yeah. but most important is for you to join our newsletter but actually i think if you registered you automatically get added to our newsletter so mm -hmm. like it or not i think you're going to be on there <laughs> but that's where we send so right now luis is our uh, community moderator and he sends out updates about once a month i think um and important information and once we get started planning next year then we send updates and then when, once we have a call for posters, we'll send it out in the newsletter and a call for presenters as well. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, so that's exciting that we have potential new people. Right. Roseli, there's a question about accessing posters through Padlet and do people have to sign up for Padlet in order to get no. access to the posters? No, no, they can, they can just follow the link and it, it opens in your, in your screen. Okay. Um, yeah. Any more comments, questions? I think there were several you. comments, obviously, on Gabriel, uh, Gabriel's comment. I, oh, language ideology is being such a big thing in this country, English-speaking country, right, Carl? <laughs> so um, I think all of us foreign born and foreign speaking peoples feel that all the time, but perhaps things are changing. Mm -hmm. I, I, have a, I have a, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. I asked a question in the chat. I guess it was for more for Carl. 
is it going to be hard for me to learn to do the CC publishing thing? Because I want to learn how to do that over this. So um, I think my this came up in my talk and how do I get involved? <clears throat> there are lots of ways to get involved, but sto start small, right? And start with what you're already doing because I think people have these big ideas, but they're producing content, you're producing documents. Look at all the different kinds of documents that were shared with you in the last presentation on not even uh, pedagogical documents, but pr promotional documents, how to promote your, your, so letters that you write or syllabi or anything that you produce that is cre uh, that you've created is, is of value. And that's the main thing to think about um, because oftentimes teachers say, I'm not a textbook writer, I don't do, but if they would share with each other what they do produce, it is great, is a, it, it is of value. So start small. Some of the documents that, and, and I think the other thing that we found in research on, on open education is people can often be very intimidated to share. They feel like, oh, this isn't professional and people are going to find a missing accent or something ridiculous like that. But most of the time, people are very happy to see what another teacher does and then to adapt it. So start small and start with what you're already doing. And then as you, you can go to the CC website, creativecommons.org. I just there, said it the, right Great. There. And there is a page that will help you to, uh, yeah, she got, uh, thank you, Joseli. She, Joseli put down the, the link that will help you choose the correct um, open, open license. And then they, they even tell you how, where to put the license on the page and so forth. So once you go through it, the steps of, of doing that, you really have it down and then you can share it with us and we'll post it in, in our website, um, the Heritage Spanish website, the text website. So it's doable. Lower the bar, lower your own bar, your mental bar. And then once you do it a couple of times, you will start kind of seeing yourself as I'm an open educator. I mean, I, I must admit, I look at Joseli now and Delia and they're starting to talk about CC licenses. I'm like, yay. <laughs> Because four years ago that they weren't doing that, right? And so, yeah, they've learned a lot too. Everybody is, and I'm the same way. I'm like, when somebody told me that I could put a CC license on my PowerPoint, I thought, of course, why not? So it, it's a mind shift. It, it takes time. It's gradual, but start small and work your way up. I have a kind of in between comment and question for Alana and Edna. Um, I was wondering about the book clubs, which is a very nice way to get uh, extensive reading. And all the, all the things that you talk about were inside or related to the classes itself. And I was wondering how difficult could be to create a um, book club when we have not only students, but also their families involved. Well, um, I tried to give some online options as well because I had to do that at the end of the year. Is that what you're talking about? When it's not in person or outside no, of class? No, 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 no. I'm talking like about involving class. students and their families or friends, maybe their parents, because I cannot imagine a best way to connect with a book that having maybe your, your big brother reading with you. I think it just is, for me anyway, and I don't know, Edna can give her opinion too, for me, I think the biggest obstacle that, that I would face in my schools is um, access to materials. Mm -hmm. So it would be getting the book to the families. I have lots of families. We do um, family education nights at my, um, you know, yeah. in our area and stuff. And so uh, we've been trying to get them at our school where we bring the parents in. But mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, they have a lot, um, and they want to participate. So I feel like they want to do that. But okay. I, I, I maybe, um, you know, maybe it would be great to, that's a great idea to maybe write a grant to help purchase the books for the family to be able to read together and then participate in some way. I wonder if through the, the libraries, the public libraries, you can get some, I, mean, I don't know, really, I don't know, but it would just the be where there are enough or, copies of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I agree. I agree with Alana. And I was going to say that, Flavia, that I have noticed that recently with the coronavirus emergency, 
uh, we have seen that they are digitalizing everything, especially libraries. So I think, I, I think that things are gonna change mm -hmm. because of this tragedy, mm -hmm. <laughs> but something positive is gonna come out. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think it's difficult, but in the future we might be able to see like more resources uh, that are available, and especially for uh, our population of heritage Spanish speakers. So I am hopeful that's all I can do so far. I, what I'm thinking right now, it's a, when I mentioned the, the book club is, my idea is that it starts in a classroom, mm -hmm. in that class that I teach and then get motivated my students so that we can continue for continue next semester. After, yeah. mm -hmm. But it has to be like, I have to, tengo que sembrar la semilla sí. en una clase. I have to start in a class and then, yeah. But we have to consider that it, it can also it, it might also be digital with a digital library. So that's my idea to start building our digital libraries because I think that's going to be the future too. <laughs> no, but I mean I think that yes. I mean, and, and there are big repositories outside that we can we can tap into. I mean, but it's something that I've been thinking about mm -hmm. to get the the the. the Hispanic community around our university more involved with our our work. So yeah, thank you. I think it would be That's great. Way. I just I mm -hmm. think there are some some barriers too with some parents. No, um, of course, yeah, who, who aren't literate themselves, and so sometimes that's not you know I have mm -hmm. I have noticed when I've asked them to help their children with something at home that sometimes they're a little hesitant, and then I realize it's not because they don't want to; it's because they can't, which is why we started the parent education nights so mm -hmm, kind mm -hmm. of teach them in advance what their kids were going to be learning so that they felt like they had sure. that knowledge to give their children so maybe something like that having like a parent reading kind of thing that you talk to them about before but I think Edna's right it would be really great to use this platform of you know having zoom and things like that where you could like maybe have a zoom parent meeting before and talk mm -hmm. about it it's just that getting the materials I guess getting the books in the hands of the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that will be the first step of course yeah thank you i just want to say too thank you all for um including me in this wonderful thing I, it's been amazing and a really great experience i've learned a lot too so well we're so glad you participated alan and we all learned a bunch from you i was oh, good. I'm glad. in the all the technology too that's really cool awesome i'm so glad i'm so glad I was worried that we were, I was going to be presenting to all uh, university people and I thought it probably wouldn't be so I, I asked Sarah about it before, but I'm glad that I was able to present some things that'll be useful, but I learned so much from all of you too. So no, but you. Alana, really, I mean, we are, we are the one that we're thankful because I mean, for us, I think there was a very big discussion with all the text um, participants and I know text is mostly faculty, uh, university professors but we wanted to do this i mean we agree we need to create a stronger connection with the whole educational system and the fact that you decided to come over i think that you break down the the ice for many people so Good, the rest I'm of glad. you that they're still here we have 72 people still <laughs> strong friday <laughs> afternoon uh think about this okay start thinking about it and the east coast people it's like way past happy hour now right yeah. <laughs> there was a question about how to save the chat if you all want to save all the chats from today you can just click on the button at the bottom where you where the chat is it has three little dots you click on that save chat and you immediately get it on your desktop a copy of all the chats for the session mm -hmm. I just want to say, to, kind of to respond to Alana um, about feeling like maybe you're an outsider coming into the group. I would say that open education, first of all, it's that's the whole point is to open it up and come into a group that you may not you're not sure about. Um, and I want to say that uh, the leaders in open education are not the people at the most prestigious institutions. It's not folks like UT. The place that's really innovating are community colleges. Community colleges are teaching everybody else what's going on. They are the center of innovation right now. And also high school teachers. And the reason because high school teachers and, and community colleges are now our leaders 
is because it's just necessity. They have to, it is, um, you know, the mother of all invention, they have to figure out how to do this. And so it's a, um, we have a lot here at UT to learn from you. So um, I think you'll find that open education in general is a really friendly kind of space because people are ha ha open. So yeah, welcome. Thank you. I'm looking forward to sharing some more things with you all. Great. Any more comments, questions? I, I did put it in the chat. Um, thank you for teaching me how to save the chat, but I didn't know that yesterday. So if somebody saved the chat from yesterday, can we possibly get that? I just downloaded them actually. So I can, I think I can share them. Can right you put now. them on the Google Drive? Oh, that's oh, a good fantastic. idea. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I'll add them here in the chat too, because I think. Thank you. Can do attachments. There was, a, there was also a comment on how to involve families now that we've gone online and there were some suggestions. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to add on that issue of how to involve families and participating more with the use of technology. Maria Lisa and Joseli, this might be a little bit just out of the blue for you all. But if you all could talk to us a little bit about the course that you all have developed that you'll start teaching in the spring just briefly, because I think it would be very interesting to a lot of people what and you have designed for the spring. I was thinking we should talk to Emily Mernate, who has been- Yes, I was just project. thinking and we could involve Emily in the conversation because she's been working with her students at her university in the, uh, Ours have been going, but not formally with the course, because the course will only begin in spring. Emily, what was it, how has it been for you and your students, tutoring students in the middle school, your university students tutoring in the middle school? Um, good, chill. A little bit like a, a circus sometimes, uh, because nonprofit is always like whack-a-mole, you know. Um, the middle school has a lot of challenges uh, with the building. Uh, so there were some days that they could not show up to the building because there would be plumbing problems and they were working with a tutoring company. Um, but I would say if they're going to do any kind of community work, the thing that made it um, worthwhile for them is that they already had the linguistics class. And so they understood a lot of sociolinguistic elements about how to work with somebody um, from a different culture, um, how to help them uh, with sound differences that they weren't hearing, uh, how to approach vocabulary. So um, it really helped that it wasn't just go and tutor, but that there was also some reflection and applying sociolinguistic knowledge as well. But uh, yeah, working with uh, any kind of nonprofit off campus is is wild <laughs> because um, it's it's a rodeo out there. Sometimes you know they ask them to do other things, and you have to train the students to say no. Me trajeron para esto. Bye. I'm gonna go do this instead. And sometimes it was um, you know schedule changes, and you know one day oh lo hace bastante bien. Talk with that guy too. And then it was like no no no. I'm working with this one. So uh, I would say that. Also, if it is for college credit, I think keeping uh, the course hours to a minimum is good because then you feel that you have to fill in with uh, other hours to make them really earn it if uh, things start getting canceled. So I was glad that I only had it as a one hour course and part of the time their reflection was to come back and meet with me and discuss things uh, so that it wasn't all of our eggs in one basket, digamos. But Maria Luisa, can you share what they've told you about the Zoom option now? Yes, so uh, in speaking to Victory Tutoring, uh, Victory Tutoring is a program that Austin ISD has um, where, where they um, recruit uh, students from the universities uh, to tutor at all the different public schools, especially the at-risk students that need help with their English because they're new immigrants. 
And so this uh, second half of the semester, because of the pandemic, they went online. And surprisingly enough, for Victory Tutoring, this has worked really well because it cut down on the traveling on the part of the students, which was very complicated anyway. And they were able through Canvas and through the school, the, the public school authorizing the sharing of materials, somebody from the school is there to open the breakout rooms. It was surprisingly seamless for them. And they found that they were in addition to helping them with their English, where they were helping with the digital gap uh, mm. that these students were experiencing. So they really do not intend to go back to, you know, face to face. So there was a surprising positive outcome to COVID. So um, it, it's, it's a tryout, but it was successful. Uh-huh. And there's, we've been talking about the positive uh, outcomes. And one of them, we were talking my breakout room is a lot of you who are here would not be able to have attended the workshop if it would have been in Austin face to face. A lot of people were saying they're far away, their districts can't afford to send them and they're really happy that this worked out. And so yeah, we gotta, I guess, look at the positive side. We're reaching a lot more people and people were suggesting for next year, maybe even if we do it face-to-face to do some sort of simultaneous stream or something so other people can participate. So we're learning a lot from this and I think good things will come out of it. Yeah. Mas comentarios, preguntas. I was surprised in my breakout groups, most of the uh, teachers are going to be new at heritage language and are really happy to know that there are so many open uh, resources available through CORAL. Uh, so they, they, they really were delighted to hear that they're not gonna be alone in this journey and adventure. One comment that I have, if, if you guys don't mind, um, and you know that I teach high school, but is to a, a college level when in the education, school of education, that we also have to do a, a good job there by training future teachers of languages to know how to teach our heritage students because it's painful. And that's the, that's kind of the, uh, the point of my, uh, dissertation is painful to see how teachers who have just not been trained in teaching heritage students. I mean, um, how they put students down, they humiliate students who speak the language, they, um, they humiliate their identity, they, they tell them that it's, it's incredible you don't know how to do this. And, oh, okay. It's incredible that you write so, so poorly. So those I mean, we have to do, we have to work in so many areas, but if we start teaching future teachers and of course current teachers on how to address our heritage students as resourceful and powerful and not as lacking and limited, I think we'll be doing our, our students, our community a great favor because these students start becoming <laughs> traumatized since they're little and I not only speaking from a professional point of view a researcher point of view I have three kiddos who went through the system and will come home to me saying mamá mi, mi maestra dice que no hablo español mi maestra dice in Spanish you know like I'm like oh yeah sure que no se dice así mi maestra dice and that's uh, that's that you know you can do a lot of harm on on kids who've already been harmed by society telling them that they don't belong. You don't want that to be our, our uh, place of education. So good job for all of you who teach uh, heritage, you know, heritage education courses in the School of Education, because I think it's a need. Gracias, Marta, por el comentario. Este, it's, it's a concern of mine as well, and I think that most people that run programs and have contact with the school of education and the programs that they have is an issue. And um, as everything, it has to change. And of course, you know how difficult it is to modify institutions. So we start with how many credits do you need extra? You cannot have more classes. You cannot change that. Then you have the push from faculty. They don't want to change their, I mean, already made up classes where they 
are teaching the same content of literature and culture from 20 years ago. So it's like a battle in, in several ways, at least in, 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 my, in my experience. And I think that, I mean, we need to start with the BA programs, started to change and modify the, the whole curricula and start introducing at least more sociolinguistic classes, more classes on the culture of the Hispanic United States, what everybody was saying about the, the oral history and the background of, of Hispanics here. But it's a change that it needs to happen. I don't know when. <laughs> so please, more comments. I think Gabriela's raising gonna... her hand. Oh. Yeah, hi, thank you, Jocely. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, comment on what uh, Marta mentioned a second ago and what Flavia uh, just commented as well. Um, so I think that, yes, we the, the change is going to happen through, you know, implementing more of these uh, things into our curricula. But I think that, and also going back to open educational resources, I think that those of us who do research and who publish, we really need to also rethink that and maybe, you know, think about what is the impact of our publications because i think that you know when we do research and we publish in the heritage language journal or you know similar publications we are already you know uh, preaching to the converted and it would be really optimal especially in this field in you know bilingualism heritage language it would be really important that this knowledge you know be you know widely available rather than just um, in, in these you know, journals. So I think that's also going to, to, to contribute to, to a, larger, a larger change. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. And I agree. I think that, I mean, uh, this is for, for all of us that there are faculty members and you have this research area and then your service area, your teaching area. Sometimes it's difficult to balance and we have this, I mean, idea you have to publish in certain places, present in certain conferences. And I think that we need to think service as an uh, integrated research and uh, we use open open sources and open open platforms like this one and others to, to share. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'd like, like to say um, I think that that comment is, is very important that research is one of those areas that's very closed and it's closed it's not as open to teachers right and we know there are a lot of reasons for that um, we use as researchers a different kind of language, but also the the venue itself, the journals are often closed and, and uh, people don't have access to them. So there is this thing called open journals now. So, um, you know, uh, Flavia was just mentioning institutions make you jump through different hoops and they want you to publish in different kinds of journals. But I would say that you should be committed to trying to publish in open journal, open access journals as much as possible. Um, so if you don't, uh, language learning and technology, for example, is one, uh, L, L2 journal is another. Um, there's a new one that's just out um, that is going to be appearing in November. I'm very excited about that. This, it's called uh, uh, SLURP, which is a crazy acronym, Second Language Research and Practice. And it's the practice that's important because people can talk about their classroom practices which is what people really want, right? How do you do, how do you run the, all the kinds of things that we've been talking about in this workshop, but it's gonna be considered as scholarly. So I think things are changing, but again, we need to, um, to you know, make it our job to change, not just wait for change to happen. And so you can do that by, um, you know, getting your voice heard by publishing in open access journals, yay. And there's another one that's not open access, but the new um, Spanish as a Heritage Language journal that Diego is running um, in yeah, yeah. University of Florida. Right. And they are going to have, it's a brand new journal. Uh, um, Diego Pascual is the editor. And they're going to have a section devoted to teaching pedagogy. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, it'd be great if you know, anyone can submit um, yeah. their work. Oh, Sally, if I could uh, say something, is that okay? Yeah. I was just going to add to what everybody was saying earlier about the attitudes of heritage language teachers. I think it's easy to identify those people that are like very obviously mistreating our students, but I think it's a good practice for us to look internally in the microaggressions that we might put on our students when we still use terms like correct, 
professional versus informal. I mean, I think the, the, the more obvious folks are easy to identify. I think we have a harder time looking at the ways that we ourselves, even if we feel that we're very educated with the cause, that we're still speaking in terms of the pure native speaker when we know that that means that native speaker doesn't really exist. Native speaker is usually the person from the capital of a Spanish speaking country. And so I think it's a good exercise to be reflective on the ways that we even still incorporate some out of date traditional ways of thinking about heritage speakers, despite being so involved in research and, and being knowledgeable. Because I think it's easy to point to the person who tells us, oh, your Spanish is horrible. That's an easy person to identify. I think it's harder to look at the nuanced ways in which we're still following these old um, models in our teaching and, and me being a person that saying I need to do that often and a lot. Of Thank you. In the chat, they're asking you, Lucidis, if you could create an infographic. See that now there's a challenge. <laughs> Um, yeah, it'd be great. Yeah. yeah, I would, I think that we need to be more transparent. We need to say there's a term called native speaker that's been around. What does that usually mean? It means the people in power. It means people in the capital city. But we understand that, for example, the New York variety of English is not the English of the U.S. So if we were more transparent with our kids and we didn't um, think that they wouldn't be able to understand these social linguistic concepts, they can. If we give them examples in real life, I mean, in the US, right, British English versus US English, I think we're not being, we're not being transparent with them because we don't think that they'll understand. Um, and that's something I have to work on. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I do world language teacher education and um, this is just the end of my second year. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about this and I was, um, I had to redesign the program last year. So I really am trying to bring in more heritage focus to the program because my students will, the most of them will teach Spanish, but the others will teach Portuguese and French, which are also um, in our area, especially with Portuguese, a, a heritage language. Um, so I start, I try to start with that kind of the politics of, of languages in the US um, and whose languages are we teaching in that like the colonial colonizer um, piece um, as a starting point and like how do we learn our languages and, and all of that piece like the, the personal story first, um, then get into um, really the methods of teaching languages. So that, that is always in the, the first thing that students are thinking about when they're planning. But I, I mean, I still have a lot to learn um, and a lot I can improve on. But um, for me, that's important for, yeah, for our teacher candidates. And I, I try to find, as Eric mentioned, that they need to go observe heritage teachers, but we need more of them too. <laughs> so it's so kind of like this chicken and the egg. Um, still and this is a great topic for a workshop next year, right? Mm -hmm. So keep it in mind, somebody wants to present. Yeah.